बस यही फर्क है मेरे में और कविता में मैं बोलूंगी नहीं नली हम तुम आधा मेरे पे एक्स्ट्रा नहीं दे पाएंगे बिकॉज हम बिल्कुल जैम पैट में आज हमारे लिए हम एक एक्सक्लूसिवली टॉक रखेंगे अलग से ज्योति दीदी ज्योति दीदी दिस गर्ल विल नॉट टेक वन मिनट शी विल डू इट फास्ट इन ऑल द प्लेस आप देखना आई हैव लिसन टू सो मेनी टाइम्स अच्छा बोलती है चलो कब शुरू करते हैं अपन इस टाइम की प्राइवेट अनदर 2 मिनट्स या अनदर बट स्टे स्टे ऑन डोंट डिस्कनेक्ट क्योंकि गाड़ी में है ना कोई और काम तो है नहीं हमें सुनने के अलावा नहीं नहीं मैं डिस्कनेक्ट नहीं करूंगी मैं वीडियो ऑफ करके आपको सुनूंगी मेरे पास ही बैठी अर्चना जी भी तो उनको भी एंजॉय करना ही है थोड़ी देर बाद कौन बैठे हैं टेंट पे डॉक्टर अर्चना वर्मा भी है मेरे साथ ओह माय हां शी सेड आपको हाय बोल रही हाय अर्चना हाय अर्चना गुड हाय डॉक्टर नोदा ज्योति मैडम ये बहुत सुंदर मैडम हाय हाय नमस्ते अर्चना मैम नमस्ते टाइली हाउ आर यू अच्छी हूं मैम रोजा रोजा आपकी एक अलग मीटिंग है तेरी मेरी हम लॉन्ग ड्यू है आई कान हियर यू एक्चुअली दिस बैकग्राउंड म्यूजिक वर एंड माय बहुत ये आई एम डॉक्टर बेंडल वाज अपडेटिंग मी अबाउट सर्टेन थिंग्स दैट इज शेयर सो आई एम लुकिंग फॉरवर्ड फॉर मोर डिटेल्स फ्रॉम यू सो सो लॉन्ग काम करना है डॉक्टर यू नो वी रियली हैव टू वर्क वेयर दैट्स राइट By this <laughs> Rosa, I need to uh, update this photograph of yours, which we put in, which you send every time. I don't. I want a better photograph. So sure, I'll give you. <laughs> I know when I saw, I said doesn't matter. You know, it's also good enough. But I'll give you because now short hair. I'm back to my normal hair. Amari, I'm. The old day, madam, the old day, about five star lagati. I'm sure you all have heard people like um, I don't know if you all heard Dr. Manju Puri before or Dr. Hemant Deshpande. मतलब really worth hearing people हैं यार. Yes, ma'am. Manju Puri ma'am speaks so nice on these complications and analysis. Yeah, ventilatory so, support, everything. And and I you know so this young times. girl Manisha Shivastav, endoscopic surgeon है बिल्कुल. If you see her endoscopic surgery, मतलब मैं इतने ब्लाइंड इतने देखे मैंने मैं ये कह सकती हूँ कि अगर मुझे कभी जिंदगी में कराने की जरूरत पड़ी तो शी इज द वन यू हर यू नो ऑल मोमेंट्स आर सो क्या हो रहा है क्या हो रहा है क्या हो रहा है ज्योति दीदी आपको कुछ नहीं कराना पड़ रहा है और आपके शहर में वेजाइनल सर्जन है क्या लेप्रोस्कोपी एंडोस्कोपी लगा रखा है हमने कविता अभी तो क्लिनिकल वर्क पे मैं तुम्हारे नई कॉन्सेंट्रेट करने वाली हूँ मुझे तुम्हारी लीडरशिप चाहिए और सिर्फ लीडरशिप चाहिए एब्सोल्युटली आई 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 लव यू फॉर जस्ट वांट यू टू लीड फॉक्सी इन अ वेरी वेरी रिवॉल्यूशनरी मैनर वी नीड इट मैडम लाइक यू आर देयर मेरे को तब से आई एम सो मच ब्लेस्ड अभी बहुत मैं देख रही हूँ उत्तर प्रदेश में भी उन लोगों के लोग झंडे लेके खड़े हैं महाराष्ट्र में उनके लोग झंडे लेके खड़े हैं I don't know who is joining, Mayuri. So, uh, ma'am, people are joining directly from the panelists. So, that, we, are so we will. Yeah, now you now are we are able. Not... Yeah, you will be able Kavita to join the panelists. Uh, Kavita, we already have more than six fifty registrations. Can you believe? This is yeah, that's a really great. This is really, really I mean, you know, everybody wants to look at you <laughs> and look at Rosa and hear everybody, all the great speakers. Great speakers. Uh, shall That's we start nice now dr bindar same is yes yeah, it's 2 o'clock uh, yes i think we should start the first okay so with your due permission good afternoon everyone this is dr mayuri from medical learning hub and we welcome you to the gynecological conference on clinical innovations in obstetrics and gynecology co-hosted with ampogs apollo hospitals navi mumbai and medical learning hub our chairpersons for today our organizing chairperson for the conference is dr jyoti bindal ma'am who is vice chancellor at shri aurobindo university our chief guest for today is dr kavita papat ma'am and guest of honor is dr rosa olia ma'am we welcome you all ma'am uh, the moderator for the panel discussion okay. is dr pankaj desai we have very experienced chair persons with us and 
very eminent speakers and panelists with us. With this, before we move ahead, I would just like to share a few general instructions for all the participants. All the participants will be muted during the event. And if you have any comments, we request you to kindly type in the chat sections. We will be recording this session and the recording will be available on Medical Learning Hub platform in a few days. And we will be notifying you via emailers. We will be sharing participation certificates with all the participants in a week time. We request you to kindly take the survey and please share your valuable feedback with us. If you need detailed information about the agenda for the Gynecon or about MLH, we request you to kindly download the brochures from the hand, uh, handout tab. Time is very precious and we have uh, 12 uh, minute uh, speakers time for all the speakers. So we just uh, to update that we will give a reminder uh, to like five minutes before to all the speakers and one minute before to all the speakers, just so that we will be uh, maintaining punctuality and we will finish the sessions in time. And with this, I would like now, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome our organizing chairperson, Dr. Jyoti Bindal, ma'am, for uh, uh, in this conference. Dr. Jyoti Bindal, ma'am, as we all know uh, her, sorry, as we all know, Dr. Jyoti Bindal, ma'am, is vice chancellor at Sri Aurobindo University, Indore. She is also president for Madhya Pradesh of Scanic Society and is member of various medical associations and very active and academic uh, a physician. Ma'am has received various uh, awards in her uh, academic uh, career, like Dr. J. G. Jolly Oriation Award, Foxy Shiromani Award, and many more. Uh, Ma'am has served as ex-dean and CEO at MAMGM Medical College Indore, ex-director at Gwalior Mansik Arogya Shala, ex-dean and CEO of Government Medical College Shipuri, and ex-member core committee National Human Rights Association. With this, I will now hand over the stage to Dr. Jyoti Bindal, ma'am, to kindly share her kind words with all of us. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to thank all the esteemed faculty members, speakers, chairpersons, panelists, who had genuinely done a very big personal favor to me by agreeing to my one simple message, my one simple phone call, and I mean, there was not one single person out of you all who did not, uh, who said no. Everybody came forward so enthusiastically. The concept and the idea was, of course, Dr. Mayuri's and a Medical Learning Hub, for which, on behalf of Association of Madhya Pradesh OBGY Societies, mm -hmm. I'm very thankful. I have no words to describe my chief okay. guest of the day and guest of honor. Kavita Bapat and Rosa Olay, two people very close to my heart, two glittering stars of Madhya Pradesh horizon. And I'm really, really insisting Kavita that she should take now the leadership because she has the qualities. All the obstetricians and gynecologists of this country to a new horizon, a revolutionary change is needed in Foxy and Kavita. I think you are the only one who can give it to us you are so open to everybody's ideas. You are so receptive. You are so approachable and you are so warm. And you are honestly so sincere. I mean, I know Mayuri is going to cut me half because I'm going to take that extra time. But I have to tell you, friends, yesterday somebody called me and said, ma'am, you know, you what? You should plan a reunion of your badge like Kavita Madam did. I said, what was that? She said at her expense, she took everybody to Nakhrali Dhani and treated them for a, a batch meet. I said, no worry, we are expecting that she'll do that to 20,000 Foxians now. And that is what where we are looking at you, Kavita. So thank you once again for being with us. Rosa, again, the first vice president this state had ever given to Foxy and you showed us the way and be behind you, Kavita, Asha and... Um, uh, Archana Basir came. But having said that, you led the path and we would like you to continue very actively in our societies as well as at the National Front. Thank you so much for joining us today. When I thought of this conference, I only, I could, the speakers, I could really, really think of Dr. Manju Puri, Dr. Nalini Mishra, Dr. Heman Deshpande, Dr. Chamila. Dr. Lakshmi Shrikande, 
डॉक्टर अर्चना वर्मा डॉक्टर शिल्पा भंडारी पारुल डॉक्टर मनीषा श्रीवास्तव डॉक्टर गिरजा वाघ एंड ऑफकोर्स नॉन अदर देन माई फेवरेट ऑरेटर डॉक्टर पंकज देसाई हूम आई रियली लुक अप ऑन एंड ऑफकोर्स डॉक्टर मिनी डॉक्टर दीप्ति एंड डॉक्टर बिंदु वर एडेड बाय मयूरी फ्रॉम अपोलो हॉस्पिटल आई एम श्योर वील लव टू हियर देम ऑल्सो by all the chair persons are the office bearers of my madhya pradesh societies each of them very active in their own fields the panelists are young bubbling foxians from their societies and i've tried to make a good match of all the societies we have 13 societies in madhya pradesh who come under mpog and it's great to have all of you with us once again thank you medical learning hub mayuri especially for thinking about this and from and also meri dant wagera beech mein jo khate ho uske liye no worries so once again it's a it's a pleasure to welcome all our esteemed people over to you mayuri thank you ma'am thank you it was really wonderful listening to you you have really helped us out to you know make this conference like make it live so it was just a plan but you helped to make it success so now i would like to take the opportunity to welcome dr kavita bapat a very well known figure in medical world and uh, she is vice president foxy she is uh, also serving as a director at bapat hospital indore we know that she uh, performs various courses certificate courses and surgical courses she is also an academic uh, very actively academic uh, physician and uh, also working in various medical associations like foxy iage isar ampogs and many more we are blessed to have you here ma'am and with this i stop sharing my screen and would request to ma'am kindly please share your uh, blessings फियर change is dead and fear factor should not be there that's the big problem so love you jyoti didi in the heart core of my heart by putting your ideas and putting the things in a such a natural manner the way you put always and so you are the person who, you are the person who are going to make us leaders i am 100% sure for that this basic things uh, which we should be known about and nice to see roza along with me as a guest of honor but the innovation and the latest thing i tell you right from the patches to the transmer dermal patches to the menopausal females to the adolescent contraception is another important thing for the this of the country for the population right from the population stabilization to <laughs> violence against women to what not so many things to have the simple pandemic of anemia we are not going to finish it off so many things in a pipeline and all the new innovations should be for the best for the women self that's the whatever innovation being done either the bakri balloon or the something like a nalini and everything the dr manju puri is going to speak dr pankaj is either all are going to speak but at the end of the day we all want to serve our own females so that's the basic point and a core of heart thank you this platform is being given by mayuri this is really the medical app platform it's good that you brought and the jyoti didi did the best job by doing this conference so thank you once again each and every one sorry for the disturbances in between my volume goes up down and thank you so see everyone over there thank you so much and all the speakers are excellent today right from mahiman deshpande to my own pankaj desai sir and the manju puri is also there lalili is going to speak it's going to be a very 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 right innovative program so thank you so much once again and i am always there though my video will be off but i am there thank you so much thank you so much dr kavita ma'am and with this i would like i am uh, i'm delighted to invite our guest of honor for today 
and tissue instruments. I will invite the guest of honor for today, Dr. Rosa Oliay, ma'am. Dr. Rosa is director at Oliay Hospital and Research Center. She has been served as a vice president Foxy in 2014. She is board of members, uh, board of membership committee, family planning associations of India, and representative for board of trustee at South Asia Fellow and Member Board of Governing Council Indian College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Rosa Ma'am is also WHO consultant and expert panel meet for making global guidelines on adolescent sexual reproductive health at Geneva. She has been awarded the prestigious Dr. D.C. Gdatta Prize by Foxy Best uh, Publication 2011 and the uh, for the book titled Recent Advances in Adolescent Health uh, and Mehru Dara uh, Hanostia Prize by Foxy Best Committee Chairpersons Active Activist Award for the year 2010-11. Pam has published various uh, books into uh, for in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. And uh, with this, I hand over the stage to Dr. Rosa Ma'am to kindly share her words of wisdom with us. Over Thank you, dear Dr. Mayuri, for the kind words. Well, at the outset, uh, I really want to congratulate uh, the organizing chairperson, Dr. Jyoti Bindal, who has been the person behind me going into Foxy. Until now, she's been encouraging me to go further on. And I think in Madhya Pradesh, we are really lucky to have a person like her, whose, whose program and organizational capacity is par excellence and classy. It is clear from what she has put together, together with such beautiful speakers that we have. And uh, I would like to also say that as a president of AMPOC, she has brought Madhya Pradesh at the national level. I think she has made the benchmark for all the next societies who will take up and learn from what she has done. So congratulations, Dr. Bindal, and thank you so much for involving me to be part of your team and program here. And I do agree with you that we need now leaders in Madhya Pradesh to come up. And who else like our very own Dr. Kavita Bapat, who's right now the president of Foxy. And I wish her all the best for her future endeavors. And I think Madhya Pradesh can team up all the societies and help her out for her endeavors because she has been coming up with a lot of innovations in one day hysterectomy and you know, encouraging young people to come up with this. We have a galaxy of speakers which Dr. Bindal has selectively chosen. I can see Dr. Manju Puri here, Dr. Nalini, Dr. Deshpande, and uh, you know I've been always with you all in Zoom meetings, and you know I've really heard you all beautiful speakers, and of course our very own Dr. Pandaj Desai. So congratulations, uh, Dr. Jyoti Bindal, again for the beautiful you know get together of this uh, beautiful CME, which is clinical. Innovations in Oxford Gynecology are going to cover up a lot of topics which is good for the common gynecologist. We always come up with where, you know, issues related with infertility and things that, you know, not much of the common gynecologists do. So thank you so much for this opportunity and I wish all the speakers and the chairpersons all the best. And I hope the audience can learn and take a home, uh, take home message with them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosanna. It was really wonderful listening to you. And now with this, we move to our scientific session one. So, so now with this, we move to our uh, start our scientific session one on managing labor and its complications. The chairpersons for this session are Dr. Brijbala Tiwari and Dr. Anjali Kanhiri, ma'am. The, uh, the topics which will be covered are labor analgesia and unmet right of laboring women in India by Dr. Manjit Puri, ma'am. Postpartum hemorrhage, managing it with limited resources, bundle approach by Dr. Nalini Mishra, ma'am. PPROM, new management for protocols by Dr. Mini, ma'am. And C-section in unusual situations, exploring variations in the performance of planned birth by Dr. Hemant Deshpande, sir. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Brijbala Tiwari, ma'am, who is president of Indoor Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. Ma'am is also vice president of Indian Medical Association and Indoor BR Indoor Menopause Chapter. She has also uh, she's also serving as joint secretary for MPISAR uh, chapter and served as past, sec uh, past secretary for IOGS uh, Medical Association. She ha has been organizing secretary and jo organizing joint secretary for AMPOG and AICOG. Our next chairperson is Dr. Anjali Kanhere, ma'am. 
She, Dr. Anjali Kanheri, ma'am, is president of Bhopal Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. She is currently working as professor and head of department at uh, Bhopal Medical College. She has been national corresponding editor at Joki and life member of Foxy Bhopal Life Member, IMS Bhopal. Ma'am ma has received several awards in her academic career and her special interest is in high-risk pregnancies and medical education. With this, I hand over the stage to our esteemed chairpersons to kindly invite our speakers for the session and kindly introduce them. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Anjali Kanhere, and it gives me an immense pleasure to be on this platform where all MP societies have been brought under one webinar by Dr. Jyoti Bindal, Madam. Madam is really a pioneer in doing newer things, and I think this is one of her initiative. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce none other than Dr. Manjupuri. I'm a big fan of her. She's a wonderful teacher. And uh, that is why probably um, I'm taking this opportunity to introduce Madam. She's coordinator of Practical Obstetrics Committee of FOXI. Madam is director, professor, and formal head of Department of uh, Lady Harding Medical College. She's chairperson of Safe Motherhood Committee. She's a national coordinator, practical obstetrics committee. She's president, National Association of Reproductive and Child Health uh, in India. She's subject expert on committee central drug standard central organization. Madam has edited multiple books. And I guess, Madam, uh, the first time I heard her was on uh, pregnancy and COVID patients. So, Madam, the platform is all yours. And Madam is going to speak on labor analgesia and unmet need. Thank you so much for a very kind in, uh, introduction. I'll uh, just share my screen. And please let me know if my screen is visible and- Yes, madam, it is visible. And I am audible, yeah. Yes, ma'am, you so, are audible. Yeah, so thank you once again for having me here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Jyoti, for inviting me to speak on this very important subject, which is labor analgesia, an unmet right uh, of laboring women in India. We uh, have somehow failed to do justice as far as the pain management in labor is concerned to our pregnant women. And I think it is a good platform to address this uh, issue. Uh, now we know that the experience of childbirth is subjective and uh, it is a multi-dimensional issue. And each woman passes through it in a different way. Uh, it is one of the most beautiful episodes in the mother's life uh, associated with joy, happiness, and celebration. But childbirth is also related to negative emotions, that is fear, anxiety, low sense of security, and the expectation of pain. Uh, pain, we all know, is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And now because of their anxiety, women prefer a cesarean section rather than a natural birth. And we all know uh, what havoc is the uh, epidemic of cesarean section causing to our women. Now, let's look at uh, where does uh, labor pain uh, rate or score uh, on the McGill pain index. So uh, this is a the pain index, uh, which, uh, uh, which is used to assess pain uh, after various events. So the score is from zero to 78. And if we look at uh, the pain, which the primary uh, 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 gravida women would have without any previous uh, training, they have not been prepared for any childbirth. And these are the ones who uh, would have a pain, which is, uh, you know, uh, which rates much above 30, uh, it would be at about 38, just below uh, what the pain would be with amputation of a digit. Uh, if we talk about primary paras who have been prepared for childbirth, uh, uh, you know, they would have much lower, uh, say, at about 32, 33, right? If we talk about multi paras women who have been trained or who have been untrained because they've already experienced that, it would uh, be there at 30, the... Uh, the uh, intensity of pain would be at 30. So now what do we compare it with? We compare it with toothache and art arthritis. We know how bad the toothache can be. That is only 20. And if we look at the fractures, that's again at about 20. 
So I think it gives us a fair idea as to the pains which our mothers have uh, is uh, not something which can be ignored. It is something which we need to address. Why have we been silent for such a long time? Why have we allowed our mothers to suffer so much uh, is difficult to explain and to justify. Now, uh, let's look at it. Uh, is it that the women don't feel any pain? So this is a uh, elegant study, which is uh, from Ghana, which I think uh, would actually reflect uh, what happens to other women all over the world. And uh, especially in the low and middle income countries where the labor analgesia is very sparingly available. So women in the study described having pain of varying intensities in the waist region, vagina and back. They express pain by shouting, crying and screaming. Uh, some prayed to God to help reduce severe pain. Others cried inwardly. Some felt lonely and some talked about bad behavior of the health professionals. So this is what uh, most of our women would undergo, uh, especially the underprivileged ones, especially those in the government sector. Uh, now, uh, let's look at uh, the awareness of labor, uh, labor analgesia among antenatal women. Uh, so why is it that the women don't demand any uh, pain relief? Uh, and even if they demand any pain relief, no, nothing is provided to them. So uh, let's understand how many of actually are aware that uh, there is something which can relieve their pain. So of the 256 women which were included in this study, 89.8% had absolutely no idea about any kind of pain relief, uh, you know, anything which can actually relieve them of that pain. And 10.25% had some idea of pain relief measures in uh, labor. And when they were interviewed and asked as to what was, uh, this was a study which was conducted in antenatal women. And when they were asked about the uh, experience of their experience of pain in their previous pregnancy, 30, 40%, 39% said that they had severe pain and 59% had moderate pain and 2.7% had mild pain meaning thereby the pain is there. So there is definitely uh, an unmet need uh, for our patients for pain relief. Now, looking at the practice of labor analgesia among anesthesiologists across India, so this was a, a survey which was uh, carried out uh, on online internet website and questionnaires were mailed to 11,986 anesthesiologists and there were only 1,351 responses. So the Results showed that labor analgesia was practiced mainly by anesthesiologists. Uh, that means 71.34% uh, 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 was in those uh, you know, who were actually giving labor analgesia, it was anesthesiologists, followed by uh, both obstetrician and anesthesiologists combined, it was 27.27%, and it was leased by obstetricians. So obstetricians standalone were giving only uh, analgesia, any kind of labor analgesia in 1.39%. So what were obstetricians using? They were mainly using tramadol, fentanyl, pendazosine, whereas anesthesiologists were using epidural analgesia. And most respondents were from corporate hospitals, uh, that is 31.16%, private nursing homes, private medical colleges, and the least were from government medical colleges and government hospitals. So uh, it is clear as to why were the remaining uh, you know, 10,000 anesthesiologists not responding because no one is addressing this problem. So the reasons why uh, this problem is not being addressed is because the mothers and their families lack the awareness of availability, they don't demand it. And uh, there are lots of myths related to the use of uh, labor analgesia and there's so much of social pressure that women have been brought up this way that you know uh, this is something which they have to bear with and this is something which is normal. And uh, those who are now from the elite group uh, now offer cesarean section as an option. Uh, and at the level of service providers, we have lack of resources. Uh, there's a skewed uh, healthcare provider to birthing women ratio. Uh, there is lack of knowledge of neurophysiology of labor and evidence-based non-pharmacological interventions for reducing pain. So these are the various reasons uh, why uh, uh, we are not, we, uh, we justify that, you know, why ca we can't provide labor uh, analgesia to our patients. Now, what are the adverse consequences of labor pains on uh, labor? It produces emotional distress and physiological changes. It gives rise to hyperventilation with resultant alkalosis and impaired oxygen transfer to the fetus. It results in release of catecholamines and uteroplacental vasoconstriction affecting placental perfusion. It has psychological effects in the form of anxiety and dysfunctional labor and fear and anxiety results in higher cesarean section rates. 
Now, if we look at this vicious circle of fear of labor, which leads on to release of adrenaline, results in ineffective contractions, uh, it results in mental tension and stress to the patient, and this would reduce the oxytocin and endorphins and reduce the blood supply to the uterus. Will, because there is reduced blood flow to the uterus, there will be ischemia and more pain, and this will further reduce the pain threshold of the patient and will give rise to fear. So this is a vicious circle. So hormones and labor pain are very intimately related. So whenever the woman is tense, she is uh, fearful, you know, and there is uh, she has lack of control, uh, she is feeling judged, it will uh, give rise to a rise in adrenaline, and which is a fight or flight hormone. So we know that once adrenaline is released, it increases the sensitivity to pain and it uh, tightens the muscles, it makes the labor dysfunctional. On the other hand, if a woman is feeling loved, she's safe, supported, she has skin to skin contract, she has privacy, it will lead on to release of oxytocins and endorphins. And these are the hormones which will help the general body muscles relax, send energy to the uterus, will decrease the sensitivity and awareness to pain and will uh, give rise to uh, a relaxed woman uh, who's getting rhythmic contractions and is not you know, uh, out of control. So this is the difference between uh, uh, you know, patients where we use non-pharmacological methods and where we do not use non-pharmacological methods. So there is a wide gap, gap in knowledge of healthcare providers uh, of the physiology of labor pains and effectiveness of non-pharmacological methods and gap in awareness of the women and their families uh, of the available methods. So let's understand what exactly uh, labor pains is all about. It is a multidimensional uh, you know, etiology. Whereas we know that the, re the most important component we would normally consider is nociceptive component, wherein uh, the pain is because of real or potential injury. And we know that in first stage, patient has referred pain uh, because of stretching of cervix and ligaments. And in second stage, she has pain because of the pelvic floor stretching and the perineal uh, stretching, and then pressure on the sacral nerve roots, right? Then it also has a, a you know, second component, which is sensory discriminative component, Wherein, if you, uh, you know, if you use certain uh, physical methods like massaging and, you know, uh, 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 you know, the sensation of pain which the patient perceives can be modulated by a pleasant uh, sensation, uh, the painful stimulus at other sites, you know, there's something which is known as, uh, uh, if you give painful stimulation, say use of tents or use of, uh, you know, ice packs, if you give, and even sterile injections at other sites will kind of uh, shift the patient's focus from a uterine contraction. So this is what is uh, changing the, the pain is there, but the patient does not perceive it as severe as she would otherwise. Then you have the motivational or the affective component. This is a psychological and emotional component, a very, very important component. And here, if the patient has got emotional support, she's got good ambience and she's got a very good relationship with the staff, you know, she does not feel her problem is so much. So this definitely has a very soothing effect on the patient and she will feel the pain lesser. Then we have the cognitive behavioral component wherein it is a woman's expression of pain. You know, if she's not in control of herself, she will kind of shout and more adrenaline and more, uh, you know, uh, catecholamines would be released. And uh, in case she's calm, she's quiet because everyone around her is very supportive. Then, uh, you know, she will uh, have lesser release of these harmful hormones. And this is influenced by the cultural, motivational, social, and cognitive factors. So we have a whole lot of things which we can do for the patients and which actually we are not doing. We, our focus is only on opiates, inhalational uh, uh, you know, drugs, anesthesia, and uh, analgesia, and regional analgesia. Well, that is not the only thing. That is one of the things. But what we can do is something which is here in the list. So we have a gate control theory techniques non-painful stimulus on painful site, like the patient uh, is allowed to take warm shower or she's immersed in the, uh, you know, she take, it is a uh, hydrotherapy or water birth, then warm and cold packs if they applied, if she's gently, she gets gentle massage and she's allowed to be mobile and changes a position, then the sacral, the pressure on the sacral nerve roots is released. So, you know, all these can be done. Uh, then we have a, a you know uh, some techniques where we put in the uh, uh, you know we call them diffuse noxious uh, uh, you know methods where the 
a painful stimulus is given during a painful contraction say acupuncture or acupressure or sterile water injections or ice packs or painful things so these also deviate the patient's attention from the actual pains then you have central nervous system control techniques wherein yoga relaxation and visualization breathing hypnosis self hypnosis hypnotherapy aroma therapy music prenatal education so all this is uh, you know uh, these are very very effective tools and we have ample evidence to prove that these are actually effective so what do we need to do to bridge the gap so it has to be a combination uh, of efforts both from the side of obstetricians as well as from the side of anesthesiologists so these are uh, i found these guidelines which are very useful and they are very very uh, you know clear guidelines which give us the physiological basis of pain in labor and delivery and evidence based approach to its management so uh, my next few slides are from these guidelines the first and foremost is as far as what should the healthcare providers be doing so it is important that all the healthcare providers are familiar with the neurophysiological and hormonal mechanisms and related methods in physiological labor and birth it, uh, it the guideline also says that we need to help women to cope with normal labor by use of non pharmacological approaches as the first uh, safe first line method of pain relief and continued whether or not pharmacological method is used okay so it is not that all our women would need and people have seen that if they use non pharmacological methods the requirement for liver analgesia reduces tremendously even by 60 70% so healthcare providers should promote and support physiological process of labor delivery and postpartum period how do we reduce pain in labor uh, the guide say that we address the sorry the guidelines say that we address the emotional component of pain with support and non pharmacological approach to prevent suffering it is a level a uh, you know level 1 recommendation uh, you know level a recommendation then healthcare providers should reduce a woman's stress level by encouraging her and having a positive attitude and creating a calm stress free environment uh, you know which is not there in most of the places continuous labor support as part of non pharmacological approaches to pain management during childbirth for women should be promoted and provided for all women in labor this is a very high recommendation so what should we be doing the women should be prepared uh, you know antenatally they don't even know what is going to happen they just land up in the labor room amongst all uh, you know strangers and if they ask someone what is going to happen no one answers them they tell them they ask how long will it take for me to be uh, delivering they say abhi se puch rahe ho abhi to aap aaye ho labor room mein so this is the kind of Uh, things which happen in labor room so it is important that we should uh, healthcare provider should encourage parents and their people assisting them to prepare uh, the uh, mothers for birth by learning both about birth physiology and gaining skills in working uh, with pain i often tell my uh, you know explain it in this way that if you are going through a dark tunnel if you know how long it is you don't find it so hard uh because uh, you know you know that it is only this much time but if you don't know how long will it uh, you know be there uh, you will have to stay in that then your anxiety and everything makes you more fearful and you find it very difficult so it is basically sensitizing them what they are supposed to expect then in labor it is important to provide them support uh, uh provide them with a birth companion who can be with them who can do all those little little things about giving them hot and uh, you know warm and cold compresses do some back massage you know help them so that is what is required so that they don't feel lonely when they are in labor that's the worst time in their lives and imagine most of them would labor alone so she should be allowed to move around you know if we ask them to lie down, down on the bed we ask them not to move around because there is so many there are so many patients there uh, it's okay but they should be allowed to move around and drop any posture in which they find relief okay so we would say why are you squatting why are you you know uh, lying like this it is not like that they should be let alone and they should be asked to do whatever they feel comfortable with there are lots of advantages of non pharmacological methods for women who birth without medical interventions there may be many benefits like less pain after birth faster recovery from birth lesser chances of cesarean birth increase in self esteem more bonding with the baby a calmer more settled baby less likelihood of postnatal depression and blues and potential for easier breastfeeding so what is the way forward antenatal birth preparedness classes i always tell that no one can run a marathon without any preparation so labor is like a marathon so i think we need to prepare our women mothers better to run that race 
we must ensure a birth companion Hello. provides full care to mother uh, in i think we are stuck yeah so integrated mother and child health and midwifery led units we say we are short staffed so i think we should have extra hands and we should have more midwives now and that's a program which is coming up and which will go a big way which will encourage natural mm-hmm. birth and integrate with anesthesiologists to build capacity for provision of pharmacological labor analgesia so to conclude there is a huge unmet need for pain relief during labor there are gaps in both the supply and demand we need to reeducate obstetricians on the importance of non medicalization of childbirth mm-hmm. and effectiveness of, of non pharmacological methods of pain relief we need to introduce midwives to take forward the concept of natural birth have provision for epidural in government setups sensitize the public on the importance of normal birth and the availability of pain relief measures in labor and empower our mothers to birth vaginally and enjoy their motherhood with a positive birth experience uh, thank you so much for patient hearing thank you madam it was as usual a wonderful presentation covering each and everything a very lucid presentation uh, two things probably the take home will make a difference is as respectful maternity care and antenatal preparedness which i think we are lacking in lot of our institutes even many times we fall short in telling the patient what to expect what you have rightly said it's a dark tunnel and we should make the patient ready to face that bravely and take care of it thank you so much madam it was a wonderful presentation now i would request uh, brishbala madam to introduce our next speaker thank you um, mindal madam for very uh, important webinar and uh, to move it forward our next speaker is dr nalini mishra madam and she is very well known uh, figure in foxy as a pph um, person and madam has developed pph balloon madam is uh, dean allen medical college and research center bhopal she is ex professor and hod at uh, medical college raipur and ambikapur madam was past president raipur in 2014 she is master trainer amok and she is national faculty pph and she has many publications uh, in many journals and books so uh, we are moving to uh, listen you ma'am on pph which is very important complication and it can be prevented uh, and it can prevent a lot many uh, thank you chairperson and uh, hello good afternoon everyone uh, can you can you hear me can yes, you hear me yes, we can hear okay. we can see you okay so first of all my huge thanks to jyoti pindal madam uh, you have always been so generous uh, to me madam and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity and should i share my screen now can i share the screen yes please go ahead ma'am please go ahead okay ye screen nahi aa raha idhar aao uh may you can we help us sharing this yes ma'am so ma'am as we did can, can you see now uh, can you yes it is visible can you see the screen now Yes, yes, ma'am. it is visible, okay. ma'am. Just make it. Uh, can you okay. please make so it the slide? Okay. So now, yeah. now is it is it okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So, so, madam, uh, thanks for giving me the topic which I love most is how to manage the postpartum hemorrhage in limited resources. So, ma'am, uh, there is so much to do about the prevention and preparation of uh, PPH, but we all know that it remains unpredictable. and timely diagnosis is the key and we all know uh, what is the definition of uh, pph and i uh, want to discuss about this uh, very low cost uh, method of and it is prepared uh, from a clear plastic apron already published in two or three uh, good journals we require very basic things a clear plastic apron which is uh, available in our delivery kit and it is folded lengthwise longitudinally it is folded and uh, now i'll show the video then there is a, a plastic sealing device which is there in uh, malls and all and only we have to seal the lower portion of the folded plastic apron that is clear blue plastic apron and now this lower edge is folded and now we unfold it in a manner that it prepares a cone at the lower portion of this plastic apron so this cone 
next the blood will be collected and now we just mark it with a pre measured scale to whatever volumes you want i mark it 350 501 liter and uh, then the uh, neck piece is cut vertically uh, so as to prepare it into the uh, strip which we, which i'll show how to tie and woman who is laboring Uh, is not yet delivered the cg drape is folded under her buttocks it's a very soft drape so we can fold it under her uh, uh, buttocks and the uh, strap which we tie on our back is tied on the front of the abdomen just above the pubic symphysis so that is the lower strap and the neck piece which we have cut in the beginning is uh, it performs as or it acts as a upper strap so that the whole the blood, all of the blood is siphoned into that cone and does not go here and there once the woman delivers and the liquor is uh, all gone then we open this uh, cg drip just ask the uh, woman to lift her buttocks a little and all the bleed which occurs they are in the third stage is collected in this plastic cone and uh, here we can measure and along with that we have to do gravimetric uh, measurement also so that is the uh, cg drape and uh, what we need is one time investment for this uh, sealing device the upper device is available for rupees 200 on amazon and rest can be ordered so once the pph is diagnosed we have to do so many things but to the pph care bundle is there to help us all and uh, it has been uh, developed following an international technical consultation based upon who's pph recommendations so basically there are two care bundles for facility implementation the first response bundle and the refractory pph bundle so uh, the it is it is meant for the management of pph primarily due to uterine atony and to be uh, practiced by skilled birth attendant and uh, from primary health center onwards uh, i just want to emphasize that it does not include any surgical intervention or any arterial embolization so the first response bundle i remember it as moti m o t i moti pearl m is for uterine massage o is for oxytocin agent t is for tranexamic acid and i is for isotonic crystalloids then the second bundle is the refractory bundle or uh, when the uh, the woman is not responding to first uh, bundle then we go for the bundle 2 and there are two compressions and two devices so two compressions are one first aortic compression manual aortic compression which we all know and bimanual uterine compression we have been doing since ages and then the first device is uterine balloon tamponade and second is non pneumatic anti shock garment so when do we use the uh, balloon tamponade whenever the obstetric shock index crosses 1 but has not yet progressed to 1.5 so what is osi obstetric shock index is the pulse divided by the systolic blood pressure so suppose the pulse of the woman is 120 and her systolic bp is 90 or 100 so osi is more than 1 and uh, you have uh, given the first uh, bundle go for the tamponade device so which tamponade device there is wide variety available commercial ones uh, with drainage port without drainage port but we cannot afford that so conventional uh, condom balloon tamponade there are so many problems as we tie the thread over uh, the uh, catheter and the knot may be loose or tight and they cutting through no drainage port so i uh, have come up with chatisgarh balloon the well published by figo house by jogi and i am very happy to share that this it has found a place in the latest figo recommendation of the management of pph 2022 so very uh, easy to make uh, steps are a b c d e and f so i'll be uh, showing a video so a is introducing the air so fill through the bulb inflation port of uh, at least 20 or 22 french police catheter inflate 10 ml uh, air into the bulb of the police catheter then this is a bound it around your finger so that the bulb comes to one side then simply perforate with the help of any sharp scissors and extend this perforation all around the circumference of the foley's catheter we don't have to cut the shaft of the catheter only just uh, uh, extend that incision the upper flap is uh, retracted upwards and the lower flap is retracted downwards so it exposes the bulb uh, inflation hole 
Now we B is for making the balloon, and for that we roll the condom over the proximal one third of the Foley's catheter, and for that with one hand we hold the tip of the catheter inside the condom. Now C is for cutting two rings. So patli rings cut nahi hai one millimeter. ये सबसे बट ज्यादा गलती करते हैं वर्कशॉप्स में मैं देखती हूँ मोटी रिंग्स काटते हैं नहीं वी हैव टू कट वेरी थिन रिंग्स नाउ डी इज डबल एप्लीकेशन ऑफ द रिंग्स सो फर्स्ट रिंग इज अप्लाइड ऑन द नेक यू कैन सी द नेक ऑन द एक्सपोज्ड पोर्शन ऑफ द बल्ब सो फर्स्ट इज फर्स्ट रिंग इज अप्लाइड देयर एंड इट फिट्स स्नगली so there is no chance of it getting slipped into the uterine cavity and now you take the uh, second ring and second ring is applied 1.5 or 1 cm away from the distal end or the rim of the uh, this uh, condom so that is double application of both the rings only apply it twice jaise ponytail bandte twice rubber band so that is done it has to be it should be straight it should there should be no buckling then excision jo drainage hole hai uske beecho beech mein se tip of the condom and uh, catheter together we will cut so it makes a hole at the uh, top of this thing you can make it you can get, uh, keep it prepared and keep it etiod now how to use this so if you have recently prepared it in the labor room only put it in betadine for 3 uh, minutes cut a bottle of uh, warm uh, normal saline so it acts like a mug and uh, then you retract you see the blood loss is more than 1000 ml and now uh, always keep two big speculums retract the vaginal wall keep two sponge holding forceps so keep the upper uh, hook catch hold of the upper lip of the cervix and the lower lip of the cervix so it is easier to uh, introduce the cg balloon now take it between your two fingers in a cigarette holding fashion and just uh, because it has a very straight uh, this thing so it goes inside uh, insert it till the rim is there at the internal os and then we have to just pack it so you because we don't need to look at the cervix to observe the ongoing blood loss that we are going to do at the drainage port so packing of the vagina takes care of the biggest problem with conventional condom balloon tamponade that uh, expulsion occurs whenever we try to inflate the bulb so here you uh, connect it with the urosec the urine drainage port now it will drain the blood which is ongoing bleeding then you alternate syringes and just inflate the bulb of the catheter and you inflate it either it is up to 500 ml otherwise till the column of the blood stops progressing in the drainage hope drainage port and you feel resistance when the uterus starts contracting over the uh, balloon you start feeling resistance so we can see that the column uh, will be the column is stopped moving so put her on oxytocin and uh, catheterize and give antibiotic do deflate 6 to 24 hours later and uh, there are many advantages in ready made versus home made and uh, this you can prepare you you are self reliant kisi ke upar bharose pe nahi baithe hue and uh, this is very very cheap kyunki humko isme dhaga bhi vicral bhi nahi chahiye baadne ke liye so cost effective study was done and uh, cg balloon was one of the lowest costing device so but uh, again i want to say there is nothing commercial about it i am not selling this device only uh, promoting so that it is used and the another device is non pneumatic anti shock garment with this with that we have to shift the patient now a word if i am having one minute then a word about rationalizing transfusions so why uh, because one is to one is to one uh, rbcs ffp and platelets cannot be justified there is increasing evidence about that because pph is different from adult non obstetric major hemorrhages because fibrinogen levels are high in pregnancy and the underlying etiology of pph also uh, changes the fibrinogen level it is more in cases of congenital coagulopathy and uh, other uh, problems so when do we replenish fibrinogen when the level goes below 200 mg percent so we must know when do we reach this uh, fibrinogen level for that there are point of care testing we cannot afford all these machines costing in costing lakhs so we do jo bedside ko coagulation test we have been doing since ages only that we did and we correlated it with the fibrinogen and my nine page uh, study is published by figo house last year i request all of you to just go through it and it because it is a no cost in no cost uh, method to 
rationalize the transfusion we generated evidence and we found a very strong negative correlation in the pph non pph group the mean fibrinogen level was around 600 in the pph group it was around 350 and in the ffp which we bring from uh, so preciously we bring from blood bank it had a mean uh, fibrinogen level of nearly 250 so we may we might be doing more harm than good so we must think about it so when the uh, bedside coagulation test was less than 7 minutes the mean fibrinogen level was around 450 when it was 7 to 11 minutes the mean fibrinogen level was 3 around 350 when it went beyond 11 minutes then it came down to less than 200 but we have to be uh, aware of the etiology also if there is any fibrinogen consumption uh, problem then we must keep uh, this ffp and cryo uh, and fibrinogen ready so we can formulate our own algorithm and we can do uh, rationalizing of the blood transfusions so take home message is Uh, this uh, uh, first re first response bundle moti moti and compression uh, balloon and nasg so i remember it like a moti coin so a mnemonic i made for myself and maybe helpful to someone 5 minutes to go all these and uh, uh, cg balloon and cg drip and point of care testing thank you uh, so much i think no one should die of postpartum hemorrhage because simply because they are at a low resource setting if you think uh, in a positive manner we can manage them as well thank you so much thank you uh, once again dindal madam all the chairperson all the dignitaries who are present here thank you so much i am so proud to be indian jai hind thank you nalini madam it's always pleasure to listen you and you have covered very nicely uh, making the pps drip then balloon then po cct and uh, all about the massive blood transfusion it's really so helpful for uh, any person sitting in any remote area it is very cost effective and it prevents a lot of maternal mortality so i must congratulate you on all your inventions and your uh, literature we are always looking forward you thank you ma'am thank you so much now i hand over uh, dr anjali ma'am dr anjali ma'am okay i think she is busy so our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, dr mini uh, madam and ma'am will be speaking on uh, i think Pre-term pro, yeah, pre-term pre-error, yeah. So it is also very important uh, topic for our day-to-day -day practice because uh, many of our uh, neonatal morbidity and mortality can be prevented if we uh, go into um, uh, this topic. So Dr. Mini is a uh, vice president of Navi Mumbai OBG by Society. Madam is past secretary Indian Menopause Society Navi Mumbai, and she has organized many conferences like All Maharast OBG by in two thousand fourteen, U of Oxy, and many more. So now platform is over to you, Mini Ma'am. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Chairpersons. I would really like to thank the Medical Learning Hub and Bindal Madam for. Uh, having me here and that would be very nice and thank you so much uh, i is my this thing uh, visible share can you see this now yes ma'am uh, can you please make it in yeah, your it yeah so i will be talking to you today about preterm pre labor rupture of maintenance so uh, the, i'll start off with the definition it means that any rupture of membranes before 37 weeks of gestation and this is the leading cause of preterm births it causes about 1/3 of preterm births and this is the single most identifiable factor associated with preterm delivery and uh, so uh, according to this uh, particular study which was done in usa they have found out that this ppro occurs in about 3% of pregnancies approximately 0.5% of pregnancies which are less than 27 weeks and 1% of pregnancies 27 to 34 weeks and 1% of pregnancies between 34 to 37 weeks and this is also supported by other uh, studies from canada etc where you know they have studied so many uh, ladies and their pro and pproms and they have it's come to about 2.3% now why is it why are we talking about preterm proms because they, there are lots of risks associated with pproms 
50% of patients will deliver within one week. And this risk for premature babies include respiratory distress syndrome, sepsis, intraventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis. That is why we want to prevent all this. And PPRM and intrauterine infections are associated with increased risk of neurological injury. Intraamniotic infection which is bad for the mother as well when there is chorioamnitis. There can be postpartum infections. There can be abruptions. And infection umbilical cord accidents are not too less, you know, one to two percent, and there's a chance for fetal demise as well. Now, this particular study where uh, they have seen, we are trying to find out why it happens. So the term fetal membranes develop a paracervical weak zone. It is characterized by collagen, remodeling, and apoptosis within which the fetal membrane rupture is thought to be initiated. Now, they have discovered that the preterm fetal membranes are stronger than the term membranes, but any infection or inflammation or decidual bleeding or abruption can trigger reactions which cause prom, a preterm prom, this tumor necrosis factor and thrombin, which come up with infection as well as the next one thrombin is with uh, abruption or any kind of bleeding. They are concomitant with upregulation of MMP9 protein and a cellular ap uh, ap apoptosis. And this colony stimulating factor production is there in both these cycles. And that is how uh, the PROM happens. Then dietary supplement of alpha lipoic acid and progesterogens are supposed to help. And progesterogens act at multiple points by inhibiting both these, uh, uh, both these cycles. Now, a zone of altered morphology characterized by thickening of the connective tissue components of the membranes. There's a thinning of the cytotrophoblastic layer and decidua and disruption of connections between the amnion and chorion. This happens more so in case of infections. And at a cellular level, these changes result with release of phospholipases, prostaglandins, cytokines, elastase, and all these proteases, and that results in PRM. So what are the risk factors for PPRM? Coming to the maternal factors, if there's any kind of antipartum vaginal bleeding, as I said earlier, it leads to a trigger of all these factors. This chronic steroid therapy, collagen vascular disorders, direct abdominal trauma, preterm labor, cigarette smoking and illicit drugs like cocaine, anemia, extremely thin patients, nutritional deficiencies, low socioeconomic status. And I found it very interesting to find an unmarried status coming in the risk factor. And coming to the uteroplastical factors, all kinds of uterine anomalies can lead to preterm PROM. If there's an abruption, again, the trigger factor, it, that is a trigger factor. Advanced cervical dilatation, where there is cervical insufficiency. Prior cervical conization, when there is a uh, there's altered shape and the function of the cervix. Cervical shortening in the second trimester, especially to say less than 2.5 centimeters. Uterine overdistension, we all know because of polyhydramnios, multiple pregnancies. If there's any kind of uh, infection and repeated per vaginal examinations, but not sterile speculum or ultrasound. And in the fetal factors, we know that multiple pregnancy can produce preterm PROM. Now, management of PPROM is the big thing here. So we have all these things. We have to diagnose. We have to think about whether we should give tocolysis, whether we should give antibiotic, whether we should give steroids, whether we should deliver immediately or wait. How do you know when to deliver and all that? I'll come to this one by one. So how do you diagnose? Accurate di diagnosis, that is very important, you know. So diagnosis is mostly based on history and physical examination. You avoid digital examination due to the infection risk unless delivery appears to be immediate. If the patient is having contractions, then you know that she's going to deliver. Speculum examination is what we should be doing. We can see the, many times we can see the amniotic fluid coming through the cervix. We can see the vaginal pooling. We can test the pH. We can uh, put this on a slide and uh, dry it and see under the microscope. Then pH testing also is not very accurate because there can be many confounding factors. The next one would be an ultrasound evaluation of the uh, like a volume, but that may be helpful, but not very diagnostic because we may not, I mean, it is not very diagnostic. We may not always be able to correlate. So fetal fibronectin is sensitive with very high predictive value, but positive result is not diagnostic. Amniotic protein results have high sensitivity, but false positive rates may be there. So this is this insulin-like growth factor binding protein 1 or placental alpha uh, microglobulin 1 test in the vaginal fluid. That is supposed to be quite diagnostic. Alpha fetoproteins, fetal proteinectins, all these can be checked in the uh, liker. 
So conclusive test would be putting in dye and ultrasound guidance into the uh, into the uterine cavity, into the amniotic fluid, and detecting it, detecting it in the vagina on putting a tampon or a pad stain. So this is how uh, this is an emerging test for diagnosis of preterm PROM. I'm not sure. This is because we this PAMG that is placental alpha macroglobulin one. This is uh, around ten around ten thousand times more in the amniotic fluid than in the vaginal secretion. So this is how we do this test. We insert the swab into the vagina, keep it for a minute, elute it for one minute in the medium, and then you put the dipstick. And I'm sorry, this is a little bit cut off, but if there are no lines, it means the test is not con conducted properly, just like how we do in the pregnancy kit. If there's only one line, it means that is not a, that is not liker. And if there are two lines, it means that is a positive test and this is liker. So that is how we diagnose it. Now, once we diagnose, what do you do with this patient? Should we keep her or should we deliver her immediately? So this particular uh, case study shows that they, they evaluated the maternal and fetal outcomes of expectantly managed PPROM cases from 24 weeks to 35 weeks. Let me put this 34 and 6 by 7 weeks of gestation. 206 patients were there and their gestational ages were divided into three, the very early, early and the late preterm. And the latency, that means the period from membrane rupture to delivery, that is called the latency period. That was also divided into three groups, three to seven days, eight to 13 days and more than 14 days. And they found out that clinical chorioamnonitis was this, uh, observed in 17% of cases and lowest chorioamnonitis rate was in the three to seven day latency group. Total complications were significantly lower when the latency was more than 14 days. That means we should wait longer. And there was no significant difference between latency period and total complications after 32 weeks. And uh, late, long latency period did not increase the neonatal morbidity when it was less than 32 weeks. And this test, uh, this uh, study, sorry, this also, this was done to find out the effect of planned early birth versus expectant management for women. And this is what they have found out. They did it in 3,617 women. That means they have searched the literature. There was no clear difference between early birth and expectant management in neonatal sepsis or proven neonatal infection with positive blood culture. Early birth increased the incidence of respiratory distress syndrome. Early birth was also associated with an increased rate of cesareans. There was no clear difference in overall perinatal mortality or intrauterine death when comparing early birth with expectant management. Early birth had a higher incidence of neonatal death and need for ventilation. So babies of women randomized on early birth were delivered at a gestational age lower than those randomized to the expectant management. So they had all the complications of early preterm babies. So there was more admission to neonatal intensive care unit, early birth, but the advantage is that there was a decreased rate of chorioamnonitis, but an increased rate of endometritis. Mothers randomized to early birth had a decreased total length of hospitalization. There was improved maternal and fetal outcomes in expectant management of pregnancies greater than 34 weeks. And the use of prophylactic antibiotics was supposed to be, was shown to be very good. So they have concluded that in women with PPROM before 37 weeks of gestation and with no contraindication to continuing the pregnancy, a policy of expectant management with careful monitoring was associated with better outcomes for the mother and baby. So um, I think we should conclude that we should wait if there is no contra if there is no contraindication to wait. If there's no immediate necessity to deliver, we should wait. That is what the consensus is, I think. Now, use of tocolytics. This has always been a controversial topic. So in this particular uh, study, they have uh, taken 544 participants. They have used all kinds of progesterones as a tocolytic or to in, a, in a plan to in a hope to continue the pregnancy. And they found out that it does not prolong pregnancy in single-time gestations with preterm premature rupture of membranes. And tocolysis is a relative contraindication in a preterm PROI. It should be used only to uh, cover up the uh, corticosteroid time, that means for 48 to 72 hours, or during transfer to a tertiary care center. Otherwise, tocolysis has no role. How long would you tocolyze a patient? No, so, so that is not very useful. Now, the next would be duration of administration of prophylactic antibiotics. 
So all the, the literatures that have gone through said very clearly that antibiotic prophylaxis is useful. Antibiotics have been shown to prolong pregnancy and reduce maternal and neonatal infections. A seven-day course is recommended by the American College and a 10-day course by the Royal College. Here, it would be IV, ampicillin, and erythromycin initially uh, intravenous and then followed by oral tablets. And of course, we all know that am amoxicillin clavulonic acid is not recommended. And if the patient is a candidate for GBS prophylaxis, then we should give. But I think in India, we do not have too much of GBS. I don't know whether we, I mean, I don't routinely check for GBS. And uh, according to RCOG, they give uh, erythromycin for 10 days. There is substantial evidence to suggest that adjuvant prophylactic broad spectrum antibiotics prolong the latency period so that the pregnancy can continue for much longer. And there's an improvement in maternal and neonatal infections morbidity and chorioamnonitis, neonatal infection and blood culture proven neonatal sepsis. Other benefits include, of course, when the pregnancy is prolonged then less oxygen requirement, less surfactant therapy, less RDS and uh, less of everything else. Now, how about timing of administration of antenatal corticosteroids? This is also a very controversial. I mean, they, we are always confused about when to give and all that. So a single course of corticosteroids is recommended for all pregnant women between 24 weeks and 34 weeks, 34 and uh, 34 weeks, yes. If there is a risk of delivery in the next seven days. Now here, I would like to say that a uh, little bit can be modified according to the capacity of your NICU. I feel if your NICU is... Uh, are much are capable of taking care of babies much younger. Maybe you could give the steroids a little earlier. The administration of magnesium sulfate should not be used when delivery is anticipated beyond before 32 weeks. So, uh, sorry, uh, magnesium sulfate should be given if the pregnancy, if, if you are planning delivery before 32 weeks so that the neurological protection is there. So, corticosteroid is offered between 24 and 26 weeks between 26 and 34 weeks. And it is considered between 34 and 37 weeks because it is a gray area, 34 to 36 weeks. How is it given? Betamethasone, 12 milligram, two hour, uh, uh, 24, in two doses in 24 hours apart or dexamethasone, six milligram, 12 hours apart for four doses. It decreases the incidence of RHT, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage and NEC. And 32 to 34 weeks is a gray zone. There is no proven benefit to routine antenatal corticosteroids after 34 weeks of gestation. Multiple courses are not to be given because that's, that does not give any additional protection and in fact, it is harmful. But you could give a repeat dose if you have given your initial dose prior to 28 or 32 weeks of gestation and the interval between that dose and the delivery is very long. In women who have PPROM and in established labor, or having a planned preterm birth within 24 hours, IV Maxel should be offered from 24 weeks to 30 weeks. In PPROM, amnio infusion is not recommended as part of our clinical routine practice. Now, how do you know whether there is maternal infection or fetal infection? Here, a combination of clinical assessment, maternal blood test, C-reactive protein and WBC count, and heart rate. There is nothing which can tell you exactly whether there is a problem or not. All these have to be taken together, taken uh, to be considered together and individualized and tailored to each patient. Women should be advised of and observed for symptoms of clinical chorioamnitis if you are sending them home. There is a school of thought which says that they can be sent home. The women should be taught on how to look for all this. And if there is any trouble, they should report back. Now coming to the timing of delivery. When do you deliver them? Again, fetal surveillance, no clear consensus about the type and frequency of fetal surveillance. Reasonable options include NST and uh, biophysical profile Dopplers, but none of them have found to be have been found to be superior to fetal kick chart alone. Placental abruption, cord accidents, infections, all that cannot be predicted by lab tests. And uh, so we just have to be continuously monitoring them. Timing of elective delivery, induction of labor in pregnancy is complicated by PROM, preterm PROM is recommended once a favorable gestational age is re reached, at least, uh, which is actually more than 34 weeks or at least more than 32 weeks would be ideal. 
if there is a non reassuring fetal status and chorioamnitis they are indications for delivery if the patient has any kind of vaginal bleeding it is better to deliver them and the decision for delivery should be made based on fetal status amount of bleeding the stability of the mother and gestational age and i would like to add the wish of the parents also now suppose there is a cervical encephalage already should it be removed or should you leave it this is also controversial we have to really tailor according to the individual person retention of cervicalage may prolong latency we feel or retained cervicalage may provide a nidus for infection we don't know but in general i think the practice would be that uh, if there is no intrauterine infection you can leave the uh, encephalage in place in an attempt to prolong the latency at least till 34 weeks if possible so this is what the royal college has said about the diagnosis antibiotics assessment and ex expectant management what are the differential diagnosis if somebody comes with uh, leaking we should always think of crohn's disease lower urinary tract infection and rbf urinary incontinence urogenital trauma or surgery vaginal douches vaginitis vaginal mesical vaginal fistula we have to rule out if there After is a many uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt we are running over yeah just two more slides and uh, here you know according to gestation age if the if it is a preterm prom then the uh, latency is more and towards term the latency will be less and uh, let me see if there's more oligohydramnios the latency period is less if there are more number of fetuses again the latency period is less and the pregnancy complications also the preg it is always inversely proportional and here i have seen all this in conclusion late preterm delivery management would be the same for early term and term and if it is really preterm that means 30, 24 to 33 expectant management latency antibiotics uh, and single course of corticosteroids if it is less than 24 weeks then some people opt for termination some people want to conserve it's a teamwork always and uh, future pregnancies always these people are at increased risk again thank you so much yeah ma'am you are on mute ma'am you are on mute kindly unmute yourself bridgewala ma'am uh, thank you many ma'am it was very elaborated talk on pretem prom and you have covered all pathophysiology diagnosis doubts and expected management all the controversial role of tocolytics corticosteroids magnesium sulfate and antibiotics and it was really wonderful talk thank you very much and um, we should move ahead on our next uh, talk of this session that is on cesarean section and that is by none other than professor and hod dr um uh, deshpande sir from uh, dean and dy patel medical college and sir is uh, dean faculty of medicine dp and uh, dy patel university he is chairperson medical education committee foxy 2016 to 2018 he had written many books and edited many books textbook on on high risk pregnancy pcos male infertility and sir is examiner for pg so sir the platform is over to you for very important topic that is cesarean section in various situations very good afternoon thank you vindal madam for involving me in this academic session i really congratulate to you and entire team And please let me share the screen. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir it is visible. visible. Thank you. So it's something like a serious in unusual situations. So we obstetricians are always fond of cesarean section. Starting from our first posting, we always wait. My turn will come. So first six months, me him, my turn will come. Cesarean will come. That's what. That's where we start. And obviously, we we proceed. till today doing i don't remember even the figures every month so there is a beautiful uh, two pictures you can see the pernanant adolf kerr the one who is the modern cesarean section he performed with german gynecologist and obviously our own arya chanakya arya chanakya is the one who performed the first perimortem cesarean section on the wife of chandragupta maurya durdhara is her name chandragupta was given routinely regularly a little poison by arya chanakya to make him more strong And accidentally, his wife she consumed one, 
And obviously, she was sinking. Just to save the baby growing in her uterus, Arya Chanakya was having some knowledge about the Ayurveda. He cut open the uterus and delivered the baby. It's a beautiful story of Durdhara and Arya Chanakya. So we say the father of the caesarean section has to be Arya Chanakya and not the carer. I always say caesarean section might be your last chance to perform a laparotomy. Because today, most abdominal operations have endoscopic alternatives. Except caesarean section. CS you can't do with laparoscopy. But yes, all other operations. We are all worried about the rising rates of the CS. What earlier we used to describe as a caesarean birth epidemic, today I consider it as a true caesarean pandemic. Because WHO, we know, recommended only 15% CS rates. And today, what we can see worldwide scenario. Especially in India, 15%, 30%, 40%, 65%, somewhere in Andhra Pradesh, 85%, 90%. And in some hospitals, practically 100%. You can make out, not a single patient delivers vaginally. Only she delivers when doctors are not present in the hospital because sisters in India are not permitted to do the sections. Teaching hospital, even our rates are 50, 60%, you can make out. It's a beautiful experience, Brazilian experience by Dr. Anibal. What he said, there were 85% CS in private hospital and 45% in public. So new rule they impose on doctors. Inform to government, justify your sections, record and submit it to the hospital, to the authorities and explain their actions. Probably with this, we may have little curbing of the CS rates. The largest variation we see in a primary gravida with a singleton pregnancy, context presentation, without any complication. We call so it as a primary CS. And high risk patients do not show much variation in caesarean section. They already are high risk. We ought to do that. Are we observation playing safe because of CPA? Do the monitoring gadgets they play a role in increasing risk or number of the caesarean section? Or we have modified the indication. The beautiful article was there in the British Journal of OBGY, June 1998. The rise in C-section rate, some indications, but the lower threshold. Women no. have not changed nearly. But the patient's perception and practice pattern have changed. That's what I always say. If you see, if you see earlier, when Sunil Gavaskar used to play the cricket, the five days test match, 200 ball he used to play and just have 20 runs. And we used to say, what a defense. Then come the master blaster, Tendulkar. One day match, 100 balls, 100 runs. We say, yes, Sachin, well done. A century and one. And today, we are having Punjab the Putta. Obviously, Virat Kohli, 20, 20 balls and 100 runs. And that is what is patience or impatient. Patient or impatient. And this impatientness is globally there, even with the doctors, even with the patients. And probably that might have been increasing the CS rate. Even article by our own FIGO president, Dr. C.N. Purandare, September 2011, overlooking rates of C-section. Out of 10 previous LSCS patients, only one opted for VBAC. And nine opted for elective repeat C section. That's what that's what CN Purandar sir has mentioned. Some indications are definitely changing. Probably FHR changes, early detection, educated elderly primary patient from IT, early incidence of preeclampsias, oligoadramnias, iatrogenic one. Basically, I always say where the water has gone. Induction of labor. Sir, please, Kumar and put your presentation on slideshow, sir. Pardon? Sir, can you put your presentation on slideshow? It's not moving, sir. We are able to see your first screen. It's still on the first screen. Sorry. Can you see it now? So we can. Yes. So it is Arya Chanakya. Now third slide. Now it is moving. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me let me keep it like this only because I I don't think. There is some problem with the, with the PC probably because even the illumination is also having some problem. So induction of labor, Arul Kumar and sir has told twofold rise. Obviously, no more threat babies, then ICU backup is available, IUGR breach, and most important thing, CRL, the cord round the neck. The moment the sonologist told there is a cord round the neck, patient rushed to the doctor and said, the way the patient, they are educated by all these things, that obviously I will. So rarely we give chance for them for vaginal delivery and we, we give them only section. So many difficult situations we face. Difficult abdominal access, difficult with uterine incision and closure, difficult baby delivery, difficult placental delivery, and difficulty in at times controlling the hemorrhage. 
So surgical techniques they vary as per the surgeon's preference, as per the preference of the operator, as per the situation, whatever is there. And obviously, we all use either Joel Cohen or Fahrenstein instead. I always say both are good. Because JC will cause less pain, less blood loss, less operative time, less incident to birth, less analgesics and less post-operative, say, obviously. And when the uterus is adhered to the abdominal wall, previous two sections, previous three sections, obviously, you have to open the abdomen very, very much carefully, open the peritoneum as high as possible. And obviously, the bladder, which has been pulled up, obviously, you have to take care that the bladder is not going to be injured. Dissection of the bladder is again a tricky job. You have to be with sharp dissection. You have to dissect it. If bladder is absolutely adhered there to the lower uterine segment, we may have to opt sometimes by even lateral dissection or a lateral window operate, uh, approach. Be close to the uterus, do sharp dissection. Keep the catheter for minimum 24 to 48 hours is the story here. Whenever you face a floating head, you have to anticipate and obviously, lower uterine segment is not that much firm. You have to give a steadily lateral support, rupture the membrane smooth, gently, drain the liquor slowly, allow the head to descend, and deliver either by your hands or use force or mechanisms. Obviously, the use of instruments at the time of CS delivery is a not new phenomenon. Since 1938, Acosta Sisan used force and from 62 onwards, we use vacuum. You can make out today, we use small kidney cup, absolutely fabulous one when you use. And in Forsyth, we are having a vectis by Dr. Venkatesh, a very dear friend of mine, gynecologist from Bangalore. And he, he always used this particular, his vectis. I will show you it in a later stage. For a deeply engaged head, again, we face difficulty, probably extension. And obviously, at times, very difficult to deliver that head, which is called deeply engaged down in the pelvis. So either pushing from below, using pillow, we don't use all these pillows at all, which the feature head pillows are available to push in Western countries, but yes, either push or pull. These are the technique, or obviously we use the technique, and that is the whatever runs technique. There is a beautiful instrument I told you. That's the vectis, a beautiful vectis designed by Dr. N. Venkatesh, Nagaraj Venkatesh, the 2003 president of Bangalore OBJO Society and very dear friend of mine. So it is having three hinges. You can make out or two hinges here. You can make out the hinge. The blade will go down behind the head and just, just taking this particular the practice, you can deliver that particular head without causing much more problem to the mother and without causing much more problem to the uterus. Patwardhan's technique, either modified or the regular patwardhan's for delivering the anterior shoulder first. We all know we have performed this particular technique. Dr. Patwardhan, a famous gynecologist from Bombay, has devised this particular technique. Modified patwardhans, if the back is posterior, we know how to deliver the baby with the help of the modified patwardhans technique. So whether back is anterior and back is posterior, that will decide whether you use the patwardhans original technique or a modified patwardhans technique to deliver the baby. So low incision, <coughs> push from below or pull from above holding the bridge. Fetal pillow available wherever you can use it. Forceps, you can use it. And patwardhans method, you can use it. Evaluated Patwardhan method in Indian Journal of OBGY in 2005, you can make out it works absolutely fabulous without any problem to the baby and no complications to the mother, no need of blood transfusions and obviously no inspector. Is there any section delivery when the placenta is up? <coughs> Anterior placenta, low line, obviously low uterine segment, vascular low uterine segment, you can see large veins the moment you open the abdomen. Placenta is at the level of incision sites. Either you have to cut the placenta and deliver the rupture of the membranes and deliver the baby out, or you have to you have to separate the placenta, rupture the membrane, and deliver the baby out. But both the times you have to be quick in and quick out. Otherwise, the blood loss which will be there. That's obvious. Five but, minutes to go. Yeah, the delivery complicated by floating head and obstructed placenta. You have to tackle by this. So this is the delivery of baby with placenta previa, highly vascular low uterine segment. Either cut or separate. Or obviously, when there is a placenta, accreta or percreta, again, you have to take the incision above. And as per the need of the case, you have to take a decision of cesarean hysterectomy. So difficult baby deliveries at time you face when there are abnormal presentations, transverse lie or breach, deflex head, prematurity, and obviously multiple pregnancies, <coughs> which may create some problem. Externalization of the uterus, you have to avoid until unless the uterus is involved the uterines, there you need to tackle the bleeders, catch them.
then only you exteriorize. Otherwise, it is only in situ repair of uh, preferred closure versus non closure of the utero-vesicle fold of peritoneum at the time of caesarean section. Yes, the pain will be less. Actually, the need of analgesic is less. Don't suture them, give them, they will automatically close on their own within 24 to 48 hours. Start early feeding after uncomplicated caesarean section, just within six hours. Either liquids, definitely they will work, or you give them a chewing gum after four hours after uncomplicated CS, which produce saliva, pancreatic secretions, and increase the bowel motility, and that will help to the patient. I don't know how much it will help to the patient, but the chewing gum thrown by the patient has spoiled many doctors' shoes, and they have to buy new. We had a beautiful study on this effect of sugar free chewing gum on peristalsis activity in post caesarean patient, which was published in Indian Journal of Research in 2017. <coughs> section on demand. Again, a new thing. I want caesarean section on uh, the Shera. I want caesarean section on Diwali. I want C section on somewhere on the Eid. Obviously, all these things we are not going to support because no trial helped to assess the risk and benefit of CCL sections, which we call it as section on demand. So Indian experience is definitely there. We call them Muharat Caesar in section, that's in Hindi language, or a auspicious Caesar in section, where the timing is also decided when the baby should come out. No, no, we don't support all these things, but yes, you have to do it in practice sometimes. CS myomectomy. we routinely do it. Whenever we find myoma very close to the incision, very close to the incision, same incision users can put and take, take out the myoma, no bleeding usually many times. The uterus retracts very well after the uterotonic given to them. And hardly any of my patients had problem in caesarean in my background. Those which are away from the incision, yes, don't do it. Call the patient after four months or five months and then do it. <coughs> but which are very close, you can very well perform. Trends of CS in healthcare providers, another more important thing, the spouses of the gynecologist. And the obstetrician themselves, the lady obstetrician, the study that was carried out, published in Lancet in 1996 by Al Mufti. 69% CS they had in 1996, two parts to push. That's what we always say. Yes, today it's practically 100%. Mandatory for hospitals to display the rates of caesarean section and deliveries if you wanted to curb. So, curbing rates is a big challenge in front of us. Educate for vaginal delivery, prepare the body and mind. Educate them for Garbha Sanskara, build patients in both patient as well as junior resident doctors, group practice with neonatologists, NICU care, HDU, anesthetist and operation definitely will help to curb the C-section rate, wait for spontaneous onset of labor. Program labor definitely helps in some condition. Be in labor room when you have induced the patient, be in labor room when you started a program labor, have patients. Let patient decide what she wants rather than what we are imposing C-section on them. So regular standardized audits of C-section in private and public hospital is mandatory. Adequate trials of labor will reduce and curb the C-section rate. Joint decision by patient and doctor on best mode of delivery is really important one. And you can make out the what William Benson Harrer has told, ACOG chairman 2012. Perhaps the time has come when the risk, benefit and cost are so balanced between the C-section and vaginal delivery that the deciding factor should simply be the mother's preference, how her baby is to be delivered. We must respect, but at the same time, we must keep in mind that what our skill, our knowledge, our science tell for that particular, particular patient's delivery. As early as 1960, Munroker has told, I fear that today more than even before, there is a danger of abdominal delivery being regarded as the legitimate method of delivery with each and every obstetrical abnormality. After 56 years, when he, what he told, how true it is today. Yes, we need to curb the C-section rates and we need to control the C-section rates in the need of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deshpande, sir. It was a wonderful talk and really you have taken care of all the aspects. And very rightly, you have focused on a couple of newer things which are there, like section on demand and uh, um, increasing cesarean section rate. But yes, I think uh, the whole nitty gritty is uh, we need to teach the patient what to expect as Madam Puri has rightly said. And as you have said, we need to have more classes on something like Garb Sanskar or Lamas classes, breathing techniques. And we need to tell the patient that this is a physiological way. Nowadays, even the patient are not very keen to 
undergo that much of pain and uh, are creating a lot of problems in having normal delivery. So definitely, uh, I think uh, complete teamwork from every one of us will only help in reducing the cesarean section rate. Thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful talk. And it was a wonderful session. Thank you, Bindal Madam. And thank you, everyone, for giving us the platform to be a part of this wonderful webinar. Mayuri, the mic is handed over to you. Thank you, ma'am. So now I would like to thank the chairpersons and the speakers for session one. I'm sure the audience have enjoyed it and have learned a lot today from them. And with this, I will move towards to our second session now, which is on panel discussion. So the panel discussion is on nearby situations in obstetrics. And the moderator for this session is Dr. Pankaj Desai, sir, who is former uh, dean uh, and associate professor and unit head at Medical College, Baroda. Uh, Baroda. Sir is now working as a consultant obstetric gynecologist at Janani Maternity Hospital, Baroda. Sir has received so many gold medals in his uh, career and has served as an academician and has participated as a guest lecturer, moderator and panelist in many events. Sir has more than 107 publications and received research paper awards at best paper, uh, best paper prizes. Sir has contributed in the chapters to different textbooks and visiting professor fellow at Liverpool Hospital, Sydney. Sir has received many awards in his life, uh, in his academic career. As you can see, Tam uh, Tamaskar Award for Best Work in Infertility, International Fellowship Awards, Best Publication Prize. Uh, and he has also served as a past president of Foxy. We welcome you, sir, for this session. And with this, I will just take a few more minutes to introduce our panelists for the panel discussion. Our first panelist is Dr. Neha Saraf, ma'am, who is secretary at Ratlam Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. Dr. Neha is obstetrician and a laparoscopic surgeon. Our next panelist is Dr. Preeti Gupta, who is Secretary of Bollier Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. She is uh, has also uh, worked. She has also worked as a faculty in ALCOG and state conferences. She has published more than ten papers and past executive member at, at joint joint secretary at Bollier Obstetrics Society. Ma'am is life member of IMA ISAR. And she has received awards on, like Youth Doctor Award, Nari Shakti Alankan Award, and Anandi Bai Josh Award. Our next panelist for the Our next panelist for the panel discussion is Dr. Garima Gandhi, ma'am. Dr. Garima Gandhi is presently working in Medical College Baroda since six years. She has more than 18 years of experience as a gynecologist, and she has worked in reputed institutes like Manipal University, Maulana Azad Medical College, Max, and Fortis Group of Hospitals. She has been author of several books, chapters, and origin research publications in various national and international journals. She has presented multiple papers and posters in national and international conferences and received awards for paper presentation in national conferences. We will move to our next panelist for the day, who is Dr. Jyoti Karande, ma'am. She is secretary of IOGS Association. She is also serving as a joint secretary of AICOG 2022, joint secretary for BreastCon 2016. She is life member of different medical associations like IFS, IMS, ISAR. Ma'am has uh, uh, ma'am is a vaginal surgery uh, coordinator for vaginal surgery workshop. Our next panelist is Dr. Mudita. Ma'am, Dr. Mudita is secretary at Bhopal Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. She is working as a professor of obstetrics and gynecology. She has served as past treasurer and past joint secretary <laughs> of Bhopal Manipur Society and Obstetric Gynec Societies. She has been faculty for four PG update, executive member of AMPOGS, Foxy recognized infertility training, and many more. She has several publications and has been invited as a faculty to many CMEs and conferences. 
Our next panelist is Dr. Yamini Manikar. Dr. Yamini Manikar, ma'am, is from Harda and she is secretary of Hoshangabad Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. She is working as a private practitioner in Harda and tackling high risk of uh, obstetrics in small places. She served as a Jila Panchayat Adhyaksh for a tenure of five years from 2010. Presently, she is secretary of Hoshangabad Society and executive member of IMA branch Harda. Our next panelist is Dr. Deepa Pitre, ma'am. Dr. Deepa Pitre is Associate Professor at GMER SMC Medical College, Vadodara. She has served as past secretary at BOGS and vice president of BOGS. With this, I stop myself here and share the stage with our esteemed moderator and panelists to kindly take the panel discussion ahead. Over to you, Pankaj, sir. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, my family can hear me. Yes, yes. Yes, I hope sir, I can hear, hear you. you. Absolutely, yes, sir. yes. One of my family members is here, Dr. Pitre. Uh, okay, I'll share the screen now. Can you see the screen, the shared screen? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, you can see Dr. two Dr. Pankaj Desai windows. One is the parallel line which is running. I have kept it in case this goes wrong. Only once it has happened because I use LAN and I don't use Wi-Fi. Uh, I will, you might have to bear for two minutes. I will switch over to the parallel line. Uh, it has happened only once uh, while I was addressing Bangladesh. Uh, once again, I have to address uh, uh, that week to follow. Uh, so I am rehearsing also. Uh, as usual, uh, we will start with a prayer. We reverently pray for eternal harmony in the universe. May the weathers be seasonable, may the harvest be fruitful, may countries exist in harmony, and may all people enjoy happiness. Friends, such a nice program. Am I surprised? I should not be. Dr. Jyoti Bindal is behind it. She will silently create history. She will silently create miracles and will not be seen anywhere. But she will do her job. And the second very important thing is that the way she creates the teamwork, maybe it be as a professor in, uh, in uh, Gwalior, or then head in Gwalior, or dean in Gwalior, or dean in Indore, or maybe now vice chancellor. I have seen her from very close quarters, both of them and their children. And I'm very proud to say that I consider and that I consider that she also feels that I am his friend. And that is a matter of pride for me. Thank you, Dr. Bindal. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 our Keskar and uh, the entire Subuddhi yesterday, all of you who have been uh, helping me. Uh, we have a wonderful teachers this afternoon. Young teachers, teachers who are going to take us in the battlefield. We don't want theoretical talks, lest we can get, we can flounder. We, have, we saw a small floundering, not, no, no criticism, please. But in the previous session, somebody was talking about Garbha Sanska. There is nothing more unscientific and irrational than Garbha Sanska. Okay, uh, so we will not flounder. We will, I know to many of you, it will be a shock. And you can't talk like this. Yes, I can, because I am a scientist. And because I am a scientist, I have evidence and I can prove that Garbha Sanska is absolute nonsense. I'm not talking of Garbha Sanskar to Abhimanyu. He was a Devta. Don't talk of gods. But for we ordinary human beings, and I can prove it as to why it is a complete nonsense. But we have wonderful teachers today. Dr. Neha Sarab, Dr. Preeti Gupta, Dr. Garima Gandhi, Dr. Jyoti, Dr. Mudita, Dr. Yamini, and Dr. Deepa. I'm sure they are going to teach us. And I represent all the students who are listening to them and we'll be listening to them on the recording when it is 
uh, replayed. I have a timer here in front of me. I have been given 40 for 45 minutes and I will finish in time. That is my promise. Um, the organizers can relax. You have all heard, seen, experienced that classic film Shole. And why I am bringing this Shole not irrelevantly. I am bringing it for its very famous dialogue or by this gentleman. And that is Baj Gaya Sala. Now that became very famous. And that Baj Gaya Sala is what death does in every near miss situation. And that is what we have to do to, thanks to our teachers to save, save our people like solid hands there. And that is what this whole 45 minute session will be. Near death situations or near miss situations, analyzing and learning from that analysis. What's maternal nearness? Those of you who don't know teachers in the medical college will be knowing, the students will be knowing. I will quickly define it as what WHO has defined as a woman who nearly died but survived a complication that occurred during pregnancy, childbirth, or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy. We are straightway, with this background in mind, jumping into the battlefield. And we are coming to the first tricky clinical situation. This situation is actually an intriguing situation like this, which is there on your screen. This is not a picture which has been taken of people who are actually jumping. This is a statue. This is a sculpture, actually. It's a very intriguing sculpture. And that type of situation is now going to come up for the consideration of people like Deepa and Neha and Yamini and Dr. Gupta and all. Let us see this. For 23 years, G4, P1, L1, A2 was admitted from casualty with four months of amenorrhea and pain in abdomen since morning. She was very pale, had tachycardia, a BP of 90 by 60. There was abdominal tenderness and guarding. There was also suprapubic transfer scar of a previous surgeon. The uterine size could not be assessed due to extreme tenderness and guard. At the time of previous vaginal delivery, the patient had atonic PPH for which B lynch suturing was done. The suture material used for B lynch was poly polyglactin number one. You know, you are routinely using it, not going into the trade name, on a round body needle. The ultrasound showed moderate free fluid now in the abdomen, the fetus lying outside the uterine cavity, and a quite a big so called retroplacental hemorrhage. To all my seven teachers, I am not going to direct the question to anybody because I don't want the audience to, in any way, uh, I have a disadvantage of only one teacher. Anyone can put a feed in and I, will, I know how to take it further. So my question to you is, what may have happened and how to handle this? Any teacher can answer. So but it's a case of rupture it? uterus, yeah. Okay, it's a rupture. Yeah. Oh, and handle, it's definitely the patient is in shock. In the stage one of the shock, he, she's having tachycardia, she's having hypertension. Once you have get this case, we have to start our drill. We have to like secure the IV line. We have to start crystalloids. We have to uh, take the consents. We have to send blood for cross matching and the scans are already done. And my, have question the is, my question is, the Lynch saves lives. The yes. Lynch is so popular. I know in some years before, before Corona, in one of the uh, Andhra, Andhra Pradesh state or probably Telangana, no, Andhra Pradesh state conferences, he was invited as a speaker and two ladies walked up to him and touched him and said, we actually want to fit you, sir, because you, your stitch has saved lives. Now, when this is there, I want your maturity to come in as a comment as to whether billing is safe and how safe. 
sir uh, as such villain just said but i think uh, user of uh, who is user speaking of future sir neha neha yes yeah I, I, you are not coming on my screen that's the reason okay go ahead please the villain i think the use of suture material uh, matters we use catgut 20 okay so that catgut 20 oh, sir uh, number 2 sorry sorry sir number 2 catgut number 2 catgut okay yeah. okay uh, everyone okay. agrees to this sir for me i think yes billion is safe for atonic pph and we have to uh, use to the material which absorbs fastly but Thank as you. far as my clinical experience is concerned i have never used billion because we have got so much of oxytocin in our hand and we I, barely have no, to not, go with that don't try to explain don't try to explain because the next tomorrow it, this this uh, confidence will be shattered pph is a great leveler pph is like like god as soon as it sees that somebody is cocky oh i have oxytocin and i have this and i have that it has never happened to me my blessings that it <laughs> never happened to you but it can <laughs> happen <laughs> so let us not be cocky let us be humble and up till now it has not happened i am not worried if it happens again but <laughs> the message is not this not personal the message is that is what i am getting from you teachers the recently please recently no, just a minute deepa yes. coming to you yes. please don't run down be only because of that don't get scared it has saved many lives we know we know it is it is a speech of distress no problem but take it and save life later on this is a rare situation i hope you will agree with this Yes sir. Yes sir. Yes sir. Yes sir. Yes, 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 sir.
we were focusing on healing and its possible hazards that's all that's all we have to test the patient's need if there is any special technique ho to fir aap aake dikha sakte i request some people to please switch off their mics or uh, their uh, uh, my mobiles it is disturbing and unfair to hundreds of people who are listening this program live the moment we see the part we have the moment entire program is stopped because of this one mobile it repeats sonography i think it is dr manish ये डॉक्टर अंकिता विजय वर्गीय के पास या मीन यू विल हैव टू बी ऑन दैट इज ओके गरिमा यू हैव टू बी ऑन इट्स नॉट योर देखिए कि यहां पे आपने पहले डॉक्टर मनीषा श्रीवास्तव डॉक्टर मनीषा श्रीवास्तव विल यू प्लीज स्विच योर माइक ऑफ डॉक्टर हॉस्पिटल के पीछे द होस्ट कैन डू दैट आई हैव आस्क सॉरी टू डू इट मैम जस्ट थैंक यू वी कम टू द नेक्स्ट सिचुएशन एंड देयर दैट इज वेयर दिस हैपेंड A 26 years old G1 P1 was referred from a peripheral hospital to the teaching hospital. She had persistent bearing down efforts after a spontaneous vaginal delivery. Live neonate was the birth rate of three four zero zero six hours apart was born, and she came in this condition. She was bearing down <coughs> after she had delivered. Okay, there was no twins, please, young lady. was pale dehydrated intermittent is straining in response to the irresistible urge to push her pulse was 102 regular moderate volume and blood pressure of 120 over 70 the uterus was about 20 weeks size in pregnancy and was well contracted what is happening So it could so, be so once you have said that uterus is already well contracted, so the next yeah. thing which we have to think of is vulvovaginal hematomas. Vulvovaginal hematoma. Okay, okay. A smeared vulva with a tender swelling involving the right labia minus and the majus, measuring about four to four centimeters. I'll show you the photograph. This was the condition. Okay. Soon she collapsed with tachycardia and hypotension. Catheterized and anesthetized, like this. Now, what should we do? So we definitely will She have to train the lumen. Okay, so follow the rupture of uterus along with the lateral wall hematoma can be there. Pardon? Obstructed labor followed by ruptured uterus along with lateral wall hematoma, which may be reaching up to vulva vaginal area, can be there. But there is no, uh, the no sign of uh, 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 the uterus is well formed. I, I I told you I just Except told you the uterus is firm, well contracted. So there can be just a vulvo vaginal hematoma because of the hysterectomy, <laughs> or just otherwise also because yes, of the yes, yes, yes. Three point four kg. So it could be a, just a simple case of vulvo vaginal okay. hematoma. Agree, agree. Okay. After so a normal that, time, that, that, that rupture uterus is uh, is uh, categorically out. Uh, I always used to teach. in medical college when you think of rare things you are rarely correct how to handle this how to handle this we so have to train the hematoma where do you put the incision please hold in operation theater where do you put the operation yeah yeah that is okay where do you put the incision on the most dominant part point on the most prominent part prominent part or on the mucocutaneous junction mucocutaneous junction sir mucocutaneous junction that is the physiological the surgical anatomical site to drain the incision thank you thank you very much hematomas hematoma was drained hemostasis was achieved with figure of eight stitches the space was obliterated with deep sutures and overlying skin approximated carefully avoiding injury to the urethra sometimes you don't have to put a finger there below the vagina was packed to further assist the hemostasis so this was the picture post training anything else needs to be done Sir, I would like to palpate above the hematoma. Just to rule out the possibility. I am not seeing who is answering this. Sir, Neha, sir, Raf Ratlam. Yeah, Neha. I know Neha. I know. I know. I know Neha. I know Neha. Neha Sasuji. I know Neha Sasuji. I know Neha Sasman. Uh, fine. Uh, yes. Yes. That is very important. Please. Thank you very much. That is what the teacher has spoken. Clinical examination and USG rule out internal extension above the levator. Now, finger must not 
finger must be able to go above above the head above the side yes lest you are extending beyond thank you very much let then it will require internal ejaculation <laughs> excellent results three units of blood was required and she went home now we come to the actual crisis the managing the crisis let us see. <coughs> there are two patients who have vaginally delivered in quick succession at your hospital both are having pph which of these will get a priority to shift to the icu uh, dr karande would you like to answer this dr karande sir for uh, triaging <coughs> patients to icu a very sensitive index would be uh, shock index simply calculated oh, by shock index shift. suppose somebody doesn't know in that team they don't know about shock index so any other like signs can help you Do those patient who are hello sir? Yes, yes, I can see you, Doctor Karanda. Yes, yeah. those patient who are having the high risk factor associated with the pregnancy, uh, after the uh, covering the PPH uh, or co uh, covering the PPH, we shift to the ICU. Do what is PPH? Is... What is PPH? PPH, PPH. PPH. Okay, go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, who is hemodynamically unstable? So what? What we have to see? We are, we are not either a tachycardia, we are miles uh, miles blood pressure, urine. We are not checking for the patient. One at a time, one at a time, please. One at a time. Go ahead. Urine output of the patient, respiration, peripheral sinuses, low blood pressure, weak pulse, cold temperature, and activity. Oxygen saturation and all. Yeah. Okay. Sir, if there is a chest pain, we would like to shift her first. Hypothermia or hyperthermia. Okay. Even hyperapnea. The chest yes. pain also. Okay. So any of the things which are not, you are not making you comfortable. Okay. Any of these things which are not letting you be comfortable. And now we come to the objective part of it, because subjectives are random, synthesizing, holistic, intuitive, and objective things are logical, sequential, analytical, and therefore comes in. A relatively new thing uh, came after I left the medical college formal teaching, uh, but still continue to teach uh, every every week nearly, and that is shock index. And I, I'm going to discuss shock index a little later, uh, I means more in detail with the teachers. But this is an introduction. It is the heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. Am I right? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. Now you now one after the other. Say, uh, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Pitre, would you like to tell it your comments on this, Doctor Pitre, and then Doctor yes. Gandhi? Sir, shock index could be a very good parameter to judge whether it's an early shock or a delayed shock, and then decide what whether the patient has to be shifted for ICU care, whether she needs ionotropes. Uh, in a low resource setting, sir, this would be a good parameter for us. Low uh, resource. Because, Yeah, low resource setting, sir. Okay. So if uh, there is like an in a non-pregnant state, it is between point seven to point nine. So we can just say that if it is less, if it is point nine to one, we can still manage her. We have to have a subjective uh this assessment also, of the cause. Go slow, go slow, go slow, go slow. Speak again. Sir, so, yeah. So if you are having a shock index of around point nine to one, we can still manage her, manage with the initial uh, basic resuscitative measures which we are following for uh the PPH like. The, we can follow the steps of PPH. Know, know if it is rising, then uh, if it is more than one, if it is between one to one point one or one point three, then there is a need to shift her to the ICU, and she may require ionotrope support, sir. Thank so you. That Excellent. is how we can, and then a surgical intervention. Definitely, if it is more than three, one point three. Um, a lot of multicentric studies have shown that if it is more than one point six to one point seven, then eminent uh, serious uh, like. as uh, the, the catastrophic uh, effects of pph like death uh, death is imminent if the shock index is more than 1.7 when Thank the patient so it's so helpful in counseling and management both ways. so higher shock patient. index we can we have to counsel with the patient is critical okay. and also blood massive uh, transfusion protocols if it is going beyond 1.2 then the very yes, high chance that it will require very massive transfusion so that is also we do you it. now now to all of you do you in your setup Regularly, may work out this shock index. Not regular. No sir. No sir. Not regular. No, sir. In people. Not, Not regular. regular. Okay. Not so regular. So, would you like to tell the audience that yes, now start this, please? Yes. Any yes. any patient yes. reading, you might think it is very less, or any other patient whom you feel everything is not well, just get a shock index done. Yes. And the guidelines which Dr. Pitre has excellently given us. 
should be in front of you. Thank you so much. The accepted value is 0.5 to 0.7, you will agree. And the shock index greater than 1.1 should start making you, making you dance. For example, a pulse of 80 and a systolic blood pressure of say 90 will bring a shock index of 0.89. That's fine. But a pulse of 140 and a systolic blood pressure of 60 are 2.33. And that what Dr. Pitre told us that this is disaster in waiting. Thank you so much. We will not go further into shock index. We are going further into other ideas of uh, crisis management. I was giving trial of labor to a previous Caesar sky attempting a VBAC. Very big, big things have been told about VBSC, but we know how much scary it can be. So many obstetricians are, are throughout the world are feeling safe with cesarean section. We will not go into that debate. But labor did not progress and patient's general condition worsened. I opened her up and found a bad rupture. First, I tried to save the uterus but failed. So I did a hysterectomy, patient was shifted to the ward. As the surgery was prolonged, there was a big backlog in the outdoor. The ward paramedic staff was providing me with the info continuously on vital parameters. All seemed to be going well. Suddenly the patient collapsed. The, the phone call tells, run, run, sir, bago. What must have happened? Can any one of the teachers tell me? Uh, Dr. Mudita yes. or uh, Dr. Yamini or anyone, please. Sir, uh, so, Yes, please. Uh, because of the some internal hemorrhage was there inside after in the post-operative case. But I, I have just finished it. Even I after finished it, I, I, I am reasonably experienced. I, I can considering the point that it was a prolonged. Sometimes the post-operative. One minute, one minute. Uh, Dr. Garima first and then Dr. Yamini. Yes. Please go ahead. So considering the clue here that it was a prolonged surgery, we'll think of uh, other uh, things like thromboembolic complications, but then again, that's a rare phenomenon. What is more common is the role of tumor necrosis factor and cytokines, which can cause systemic inflammatory response syndrome in such kind of situations. Yes, and that, 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 that is that's brilliant. We just come from Dr. Garima. Uh, Doctor, uh, all teachers are coming out very well. Thank you. And I would like to inform the audience that this is the precise reason I give the questions well in advance. This is not a quiz. Somebody did uh, uh, send me a message that, sir, I am very much worried. Don't be. This is not a quiz. This is not an exam. Actually, you are teaching us. And I have to give you an opportunity to come prepared so that the audience benefits. I am not, what am I trying to show off by cornering you? Nothing. I don't want to show off my knowledge. Your knowledge is helping us. And this is a brilliant one. After massive hemorrhage, or meticulous monitoring of patients, blood pressure is must. Recognizing shock in an early stage may be otherwise missed. Now, now comes the answer what Garima has beautifully explained. Prolonged surgery or surgery following massive hemorrhage will send the patient into shock. Why? Because after the hemorrhagic shock has been tackled, the obstetrician has to be vigilant because the vital parameters do may improve, but in such patients, there can be a severe sudden systemic inflammatory response. And don't underestimate inflammatory responses. Our doctor colleagues have died in corona because of this. All of you know this. I have lost my teacher. I have lost my, I have lost my colleagues. I have lost my students. I have lost my juniors. My tears well up in my eyes when I hear of the ferocious inflammatory response. And that causes it to fail. So be prepared. It can go off anytime. And this is what is the need of this panel discussion. We know how to manage PPH, don't we? We know that we have to take a venous line. We know we have to what we have to give. No, we don't want all this. We want something beyond. We want something which the audience learns more. And there comes a next crisis management point. I want other teachers also to join us. I have observed two paradoxical situations at times. Uh, in spite of excessive bleeding, many times the BP just remains fine. And in spite of clinical volume correction, BP doesn't respond fast enough. Why so? Yamini, can you tell us? 
Yes, sir. Uh, sir, we all know obstetrical hemorrhage or any hemorrhage per se, the shock has four stages. The first two stage wherein it is reversible. So if the patient is in those stages, our crystalloids, our blood, the patient responds. But once the patient has gone in the stage four, wherein the permeability has increased, whatever fluid we are putting in is going out the extravascular space, at that time, patient does not respond. So that may be the reason why the BP does not respond. Or maybe along with that, there are reasons like in the septic shock or some uh, cardiac problem in those patients also, there will be difficulty in getting the correct response that we are Okay, Dr. Preeti, would you like to add anything to this? Sir, the Dr. Yamini is uh, saying correct. You but, have uh, to add. Uh, I wonder, nothing is special, sir. Dr. Pitle? Sir, uh, as uh, it's written excessive bleeding, that uh, there is a, a vas vasoconstrictional uh, response which is there initially. So because of that, uh, many a times the blood pressure just, just remains fine. That is the stage one of shock. Yes. And to add to it, the second uh, condition where the blood pressure doesn't respond, there could be an ongoing third space loss which happens in cases of preeclampsia or in cases of any inflammatory res uh, response if it is already uh, existing in the body. So these can be the two things to which could be there which would not lead to blood pressure correction, sir. Uh, Excellent. Of volume correction. Excellent. Excellent. I had expected this. Uh, somebody wants to come in? So sometimes there is myocardial depression also. So okay. the heart may be uh, no, getting weak and yes. then they may require ionotropic support yeah. in some cases. All, and Garima, I'm coming to you. All in arterial blood pressure during shock states may be delayed. Severely reduced cardiac output for period of 40 minutes to 2 hours <coughs> can sometimes occur before a significant reduction in arterial pressure, especially in pregnancy, where the cardiac output, where the cardiac uh, machinery is activated more by 40%. Okay, and therefore, it takes time, and that is the attitude. On the other hand, if the fluids are used to restore blood pressure, the cardiac output and oxygen transport may still need to be corrected, even if the blood pressure is normal, and which if you have not done, collapse can occur. So, the, therefore, these paradoxical situations can arise. We are coming to the next crisis management question. And this, this is my observation and which I'm sure Garima will now, uh, Garima has to uh, give her, uh, I'm sure she will guide us. I have observed that patients of obstetric hemorrhage admitted to ICU with altered sensorium respond poorly I altered, uh, respond poorly to treatment compared to well-oriented patients. Can you tell me why this is happening? I, I always used to tell in my in, yes, in medical sir, college, uh, sir, the patient is not well-oriented. I used to ask pulse, blood pressure, that time shock, in, shock index concept was not there. Okay, pulse, blood pressure, sensorium. Yes. They would say, sir, sensor, everything else is, seems to be stable. Sensorium, not good. Dr. Garima, why not go? Why this is not good a feature? Yes, so, so there are two points in this one. Um, by the time patient has altered sensory impact. So Dr. Garima, if you are using earphones, we request you to kindly remove it. I think there is some noise. Some, some sound problem. Yeah. I'm not using No, your voice anything. is breaking. Uh, anyone else would like to answer? Are you using earphones, ma'am? You can remove it. No, no, I'm not using people's. Am I audible now? But your sound is somehow uh, getting... Uh, no problem. No problem. Anyone else would like to comment on this? Uh, Dr. Because of the uh, electrolyte imbalance? Dr. Mudita. Hello, sir. Ah, yes. It may be due to the electrolyte imbalance. The altered sensorium patient is not respond uh, better. Uh, then the bell oriented pa patient. But you're, you're in, I, 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 it may uh, be early onset cerebral uh, hypoxic encephalopathy, early onset. So, early, altered sensorium may be part of that. Part I think of Dr. Mudita has not joined. Okay, no problem. Uh, altered mental status. Now, do you agree to this, please? The altered mental status in a postpartum hemorrhage patient may indicate severe shock with a deficit of more than 40% of blood volume. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Therefore, there is a cerebral perfusion leading to this situation. Do you agree? Yes. 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 Okay. So, that is a bad sign. Okay, we, we go further in crisis management. A professor during my US, my UG surgical posting told me that respiration, though shown very prominently 
in films and now in serials of uh, uh, of a lady called ekta kapoor or someone uh, very prominently shown as very important parameter in clinical in clinical practice it is not helpful why did that great man say it so you are a brilliant teacher and a brilliant a very inspiring person he said respiration dr desai don't go much into this it is not very helpful do you agree no sir not completely okay yes, sir. partially yes sir partially why so why so why so the uh, respiration and uh, pulse both are actually two very vital parameters of normal physiology of a patient sir agree so, now, the, now, now please hold on therefore therefore i my question now now a good that you have uh, indulged in this uh, what he mentioned was that acute this respiration can increase in so many things yes sir. pulmonary embolism edema pneumonia atelectasis La condition of the lung, dyspnea may be caused by increased respiratory effort also, abdominal loading causing us because of ascites or pregnancy itself, massive hemoperitoneum, electrolyte abnormalities. All of these could be there or even one in the different combination, and it can mislead you. Yes. Do you agree now to this, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Doctor uh, Chitle? Ah, Doctor Peter, sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, there. Uh, these are the fallacies of uh, only uh, taking respiratory monitoring uh, to be the major parameter. We just cannot go on that. As you said, sir, these these are so many conditions. But definitely, sir, metabolic acidosis, alkalosis, uh, the increased demand for oxygen supply, which the patient faces, like when we have uh, a hypovolemic shock, and the respiratory rate definitely increases to uh, trying to compensate. for that so, so it should be taken comprehensively not, not alone that yes yeah. yeah, it should so not that, be that, taken that, alone it has to be taken comprehensively stars uh, film people take it alone uh, we will not take it alone okay fine thank yes, you very yes. message very well taken uh, my med my medicine teacher told me something very pithily and shallingly don't overload a patient a little hypo will not kill but a small hyperload can kill a little hypo will not kill but a even a small hyperload can kill and he also said your comments on both that if you don't know or you don't have elaborate setup to measure a cvp even pass a fine gauge tube in the anti cubital vein and it will give you a rough idea of the central venous monitoring as of 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 of, of a central venous pressure of the venous pressure how good was his teaching very good sir very accurate <laughs> very accurate yes, yes, sir back in form yes yes sir yes i told from my mobile Uh, it is a wonderful panel i have been, i have conducted panels uh, internationally i have conducted panels nationally state baroda everywhere but i enjoy when the panel has excellent teachers and the credit goes to dr jyoti bindal for picking up people uh, hand pick and bringing them here uh, yes uh, thank you so much uh, the teaching uh, if you don't have anything before you transfer at least pass a fine gauge tube and uh, that that will give you an idea more so in conditions like shock following preeclampsia and all mm-hmm. where where the, these are uh, states of hyperdynamic circulation we come to the last situation uh, uh, so that the chairman has not to tell me uh, uh, we have got only five, uh, five seven slides more and uh, we still have got eight minutes with us uh, the last situation it is a sequel just see this mrs i 26 years old g4 p1 three ntps was admitted with intermittent heavy vaginal bleeding for two weeks this time she was nearly lost she had her last ntp just seven months ago seven months ago at that time she was subjected to bilateral bilateral internal iliac ligation for a suspected cervical pregnancy for severe bleeding during an ntp procedure okay are you with this yes you understand Yes, yes. This is a old uh, case. Sequently, therefore, I have said bilateral internal leak was done because she had an MTB and she had severe bleeding. Now what happens? No histology records were available because immediately you start asking that, sir, this could be a, a, a gestational trophoblastic disease and this and blah blah blah. I know you are brilliant people, but then I am not as brilliant as you are. But I can I can know uh, that yes, these are the questions expected. I know Dr. Jyoti Karande for such a long time. she will come up with excellent solutions but i want to 
uh, I, this has this has quizzed people and therefore I'm going to quiz you. She remained asymptomatic for two cycles, two months passed. After this, she had irregular profuse bleeding bouts lasting for 10 to 15 days each. Clinically, she looked pale. Hemoglobin was only five. Her abdominal findings were normal. Her speculum showed a normal cervix with no congestion, erosion, growth, or ballooning of the portia. Rules out so many things. You're all brilliant people. You know what all has been ruled out. This case comes to us from Gauhati. Her vaginal examination showed a normal sized firm uterus. Biochemical profiles normal. Okay. Now, before we come to the ultrasound picture, can you tell me what might be happening here? So, sir, there is some uh, possible uh, lesions which um, which are undetected clinically. Biochemical profile, you told, is already normal. So, we are not looking at gestational trophoblastic disease, Absolutely. persistent gestational. So, we need to um, go further because uh, some lesion inside the cervix or uh, Cavity, something. is it some AV malformation? Something AV malformation. malformation. Because of internal. Internal life saving procedure. If you are you are ruling out bilge. Now you are telling not even an internal leg how to save the patient. Okay, let us yes, see. Yes, there are rare possibilities, but it is a case of arterial venous aneurysm. Yes, okay, sir. empty mm -hmm. normal uterus, no adrenal cell pathology, and cervix showed an irregular. Ecogenicity with a matrix measuring 1.5 by 1.5 centimeter. So do we have the Doppler report? Doppler. I, I'll get the Doppler report. A leash of vessels and yes. vascular AV malformation. AV malformation. probably as a result of altered collateral circulation, circulation. or bilateral internal circulation. And you can see the vascularity, and this can cause can cause this malformation. Yes. Internal iliac ligation caused, has caused, probably brought down this anatomical aberration, possibly iatrogenic in nature, but you have saved life. So please, yes. don't be afraid of bilinch. If required, do it. Don't be afraid of complications. Am I getting you correctly? Don't yes. be afraid of yes. complications of internal iliac. They save so many lives. Millions of lives. My, my, I am, I am very proud to tell that uh, my uh, people, uh, whom I, I am so proud of, Dr. Deepa, Dr. Purvi Patel, even probably Dr. Garima, they are all masters in internal ligation because they are seeing such cases. When I left the medical college, four thousand deliveries. Now they handle five thousand and six thousand. All abnormal cases are coming. They are masters. And we have added to that abnormality by, by invasive placenta and so many other things. So, don't be afraid of this. This is the message we are telling. We are getting from my teachers who have done an excellent job today. And I am really going home satisfied. I saw Dr. Uh, I saw Dr. Uh, um, uh, our um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jyoti Bindal uh, having some snacks there. Uh, I, I felt envious of her because uh, this is my tea time to follow uh, and I am about to finish. Uh, sir, excuse me, the one question, sir. Yes, please. So, what is the treatment of this? She landed up in a hysterectomy. She landed up, this patient landed up in a hysterectomy. Some people have uh, I even suggested an, uh, 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 an embolism. Uh, uh, for, for this, but then it is not. Uh, uh, see, the, whatever treatment is done is right. The reason being, there will not be a series of cases to standardize. Okay, we in the previous lecture by Dr. Hemant Despande, he took a stand on something, or probably uh, by the previous one on PPROM, uh, they took a stand and said that no, we cannot take a stand. We are not able to give you a clear message because there are not big series to take a stand. This case, they did a hysterectomy. And the patient was saved. It is okay. And that is that is fine. So, friends, obstetrics is risky. And we, we know that obstetrics is a risky business. But then, obstetricians are fearless people. Okay, this is what they are. These are typical obstetricians. My, my seven teachers were like this. Absolutely fearless. 
and guiding us correctly and it was not a it was not a bravado it was their confidence that yes the sound way in which they have tackled the cases in last 42 minutes and that is because they have balanced everything knowledge experience competence skills i know competence of nearly four five of these panelists and they would have a fine job now we as teachers will be going home now we as students sorry are going home thanks to the teachers now we are going to dance we are not afraid for sure thank you sir thank you sir thank you very much thank you very much thank you thank you jyoti nandal ma'am thank you the whole team thank you ma'am thank you ma'am amazing discussion thank you ma'am sir thank you sir as always <laughs> your blessings all as always thank you dr pankaj desai sir and esteemed panelist it was really wonderful listening all of you so much of clinical experience knowledge is shared and i'm sure that the audience have also learned a lot from it and they are going to apply it in their clinical uh, practice and with this now we move to our and scientific With this, we move to our scientific session to managing complications in yes, pregnancy. Yes, the chairpersons for this uh, session are Dr. Shashi uh, Shashi Bala Bhosle, ma'am, and Dr. Manisha Maheshwari, ma'am. And the speaker session will be on preeclampsia, recurrent abortions, and high risk pregnancies. They will be covered by Dr. Charmila, ma'am, Dr. Deepa Giri, and Dr. Lakshmi Shikhandi, ma'am. Now, I would like. Of Dr. Jyoti uh, Bindal and uh, all of you organizers, I will be taking your leave now. Thank you so much for your time, God sir. You. Thank, Thank you. With this, I, I would like to introduce Dr. Shashi Bala Bhosle, ma'am, who is president of Gwalior Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. Ma'am is consultant gynecologist in Public Health Department and Fem. In family welfare MP government, uh, in Madhya Pradesh government, she is uh, serving as a um, secretary at Gwalior Obstetrics and Gynecological Society in 2020-21. She is uh, also associated with various medical associations and worked as in charge at Mercy Home under Gwalior Mansi Man Man Arogya Shala for eight years with mentally challenged children. Our next chairperson is. Dr. Manisha Maheshwari. Dr. Manisha, ma'am, is president at Ratlam Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. She is working as a consultant at Maheshwari Hospital, Ratlam, and also at as an honorary consultant at Divisional Railway Hospital, Ratlam. Now, with this, I stop myself here and request the chairpersons to kindly take the stage and please welcome and introduce our speakers to move ahead with our scientific session two. Good evening and warm greetings from Ratlam. I thank Dr. Jyoti Mitnal, Madam, for making me a part of this prestigious uh, clinical session of managing complications in pregnancy. I would first invite and call upon Dr. Charmila Ayo, Madam, for her lecture on preeclampsia. Stop it before it happens. I would like. to say few words for dr charmila ayo madam she is vice president elect for c 2024 a great orator was chairperson clinical research committee for c 2016 to 18 she is icog governing council member 21 23 national coordinator for unicef foxy pca medha foxy pg program isar gurukul 2022 who Ciro MD SR India member she is past secretary trichy obgyn society was president menstrual hygiene management consortium 2018-20 and she is joint secretary gestosis india association now i would call upon dr uh, charmila madam to take over the platform for her deliberation uh, thank you thank you manisha ma'am thank you so much i hope my voice is audible Yes, okay? yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. After that passionate panel discussion, ours will be a little simple, uh, but something which all of us need to know uh, practically because uh, we need to uh, actually avoid this disease, which is which causes so much of morbidity and mortality. And I would like to thank Jyoti Bindal, ma'am, for the opportunity. 
the dear chairpersons, Dr. Manisha and Dr. Pam, and the coordinator, Dr. Mayuri. Thank you so much. This talk is going to be on how do you stop preeclampsia before it happens? Like, can you prevent this disease? And uh, why do you need to actually prevent this disease and stop this disease? It affects almost 8% of the pregnancies worldwide and is a major cause of maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. And it actually affects almost like 10 lakh pregnancies per year. And it can lead to so much of maternal deaths. And that's why this disease needs to be stopped. And how do you stop this disease? There's primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is you avoid pregnancy and that's not going to happen. And that you need to do that for women are going to be high risk for preeclampsia. You need to modify the lifestyle of the population. You need to improve the nutrient intake in the whole population because it's the undernourished and the overnourished who have this disease so much. And in essence, you need to remember that majority are unpreventable, whatever you do, because you cannot go and change the entire population in a single go. It will take lots of initiative politically and from every one of us before we can do that. And how, uh, what are the pregnancies which you need to actually avoid pregnancy in them in a high risk category? Suppose the lady is overweight and obese. She needs to lose weight before she conceives so that she does not have a risk of preeclampsia. A diabetic mother will need to control her sugars before she becomes pregnant. Chronic hypertensive. Uh, you never know, even if you control her blood pressure, sometimes they go for preeclampsia. Multiple births as it happens in assisted reproduction that we need to stop. And increasing maternal ages is contributing to an increased number of preeclamptic patients now. And these women, we need to avoid pregnancy until at least they change a little bit of their habits and their lifestyle. Secondary prevention is the one which we can actually do as gynecologists. And that is where you interrupt the pathophysiological mechanism before it gets established. And that's what you screen for the disease and treat and to prevent the disease becoming full blown. And for that, you need to select the high-risk women who will need those interventions. And the interventions need to be effective so that you can avoid the disease and its complications. And according to FIGO, the prevention of preeclampsia will be with public health focus. That's a primary point in FIGO, uh, FIGO recommendations. Universal screening of all pregnant women for preeclampsia and prophylactic measures appropriately for women who are considered as high-risk. This is what FIGO has said. Uh, you need to remember that Preeclampsia is actually a syndrome. It has got so many presentations and that's why there's no one ideal predictive test which can tell you that this lady is going to have this problem during a pregnancy. And the pathophysiology of preeclampsia is due to its abnormal presentation and the vascular supply. Hence, that's why any mother who's got a subclinical endothelial dysfunction earlier will have an exacerbation during pregnancy. And that's why those high-risk mothers need to be identified. And uh, many studies have focused on the maternal vasculature for identifying the disease. And for that, they combine the maternal history with the measurement of blood pressure, the uterine artery Doppler and serum biomarkers for predicting preeclampsia. And that's why FIGO has said all pregnant women, it's universal screening for preterm preeclampsia, which needs to be done for every patient who walks into your OP. And that needs to be done in early pregnancy by a first trimester combined test and it needs to be a one-step procedure. You should not ask her to come again and again. And the screening has to be done with maternal risk factors and biomarkers. So what does the combined test entail? Actually, it means mean arterial pressure has to be measured. The serum placental growth factor has to be measured. And the uterine artery pulse literally in the index, all these three factors have to be measured. Suppose you don't have the facility to measure the placental growth factor and the uterine artery PI, then probably at least a mean arterial pressure with the maternal risk factor should be taken into consideration for assessing the risk for the lady. But suppose you've done a PAPE for, as a screening tool for fetal aneuploidies, this result also can be included for your preeclampsia risk assessment. And combined test is where uh, it is calculated using the base based method. And when the risk is uh, more than one in 100, it is based on the combined test with the maternal risk factors, mean arterial pressure, placental growth factor, and UTPI, then you consider as high risk and then you manage it accordingly. The first trimester combined is actually more predictive for preterm uh, PI, preeclampsia, but not for term preeclampsia. It is more, uh, it can identify a, a higher degree of persons who are going for preterm preeclampsia. And placental growth factor, the first trimester screening when it's done, it's one of the best biochemical markers for, the, uh, for predicting preeclampsia. And many studies have shown that ladies who got a lower maternal placental growth factor in the first trimester, uh, will go on to have more uh, chances of preeclampsia compared to normal pregnancies. 
and the uterine artery PI is a resistance to the blood flow in the uterine artery, which is measured by the Dopplers, and it correlates well with histological studies and clinical severity. And so th this is actually the evidence of poor placentation when you have a high impedance to flow in the uterine arteries. And it will tell you like whether these ladies will go for preeclampsia later on. And it uh, manifests in the form of abnormal placental flow velocity waveforms. What does the FOXI guideline says regarding the prediction for preeclampsia? They, they also say you have to do a universal screening for every lady who walks inside the OP. But there's no single one test which can screen them for preeclampsia. And none of the bio, bio, biomarker tests which have been said till, time, till this time can predict uh, at-risk population. And that's why it cannot qualify to be done for the general population. And that's why FOXI guidelines are still for only clinical risk factors. And for that, they're asking us to utilize the HTP just as a score. And this is the score, score one, score two, and score three. And when the score is uh, equal to or more than four, then this patient is a high risk patient for uh, hypertensive diseases later on. And uh, the score three is where the mother is a diabetic, chronic hypertensive, has got mental disorders, has got thrombophilia, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune disease, or the pregnancy is uh, out of uh, OM donation or surrogacy. That's got the highest score in the gestation score. But uh, even though FIGO says that you need, you need to do the maternal risk factors and biomarkers, FOXI is saying only risk factors. The American College Task, task Force is actually saying you can identify these risk factors only with maternal risk factors. You need not go for a biochemical testing or the Doppler test for the uterine arteries. And there's something new technology which is being used now in many places. Artificial intelligence is, is being utilized with meta machine learning, which can identify the subtypes of this disorder and the molecular targets for intervention. And uh, the multiomics is also being utilized for identification of this disease. It utilizes genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. And these will un they, are, they say it uncovers insights into the disease pathophysiology and it will highlight the heterogeneity of this disease. For example, there's one modality called as a genome-wide association studies, which have identified the variations in the maternal and the fetal joint genome, which is, which is associated with an increased risk of preeclampsia. And other than the risk factors which have been mentioned in the gestose score and in the FIGO scoring, mental health disorders and sleep disordered breathing is also being uh, considered as a risk factor for preeclampsia. There's one study called as a heart health for, for mom study. And they found out with women who have preeclampsia again and again, 15% of the participants had depression, 23% had more than four post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms specific to the pregnancy. So even that's, uh, this is one of the uh, newer uh, risk factors which is being identified now. So what you have predicted that a lady is, for, is going to have preeclampsia later on, what are the interventions you have? And the first and foremost is aspirin prophylaxis. And FIGO has said you started around 11 to 14 weeks of gestation. The dose is 150 milligram can be taken every night and you continue till 36 weeks of pregnancy or until delivery or when preeclampsia is diagnosed. And the ASPER trial was the one which actually uh, made us come up with this 150 milligram because they tested the hypothesis that aspirin at a dose of 150 milligram when compared to a placebo could result in halving the incidence of preterm preeclampsia. And it provided evidence that effective screening tools like with the combined test when it's when it is uh, uh, actually add, aspirin is added on once you do a combined test and identify the risk factors they say it significantly reduce the risk of developing preterm preeclampsia and then at the dose of 150 it reduced the preterm preeclampsia of almost 62 percent in the asper trial suppose the lady is allergic to aspirin what can you do you you can have the patient should be un, uh, under close vigil and expected management should be appropriate but the patient should be undergoing cl frequent clinic blood pressure monitoring as well as home blood pressure monitoring to identify early the disease. And other, other than aspirin, you have calcium. And that is, it needs to be given for women who do not take an adequate uh, levels of calcium because we know that the blood pressure reducing effect uh, due to calcium is because of the alterations, the plasma renin activity and parathyroid hormone. And that's why calcium needs to be added if the mo mother is taking it in a deficient manner. And the third modality which they uh, say to prevent this disease is exercising of the pregnant woman. And she needs to exercise at least three days per week for an average of 50 minutes. And it needs to be a combination of aerobic exercise, strength and flexibility training. And it has been associated with less weight gain and a reduced incidence of hypertensive disorders. And there's been no significant adverse effects because the mother is exercising during pregnancy. What does uh, uh, the FOXI guidelines, ICOG guidelines of 2019 say regarding aspirin? 
for us uh, they still consider 75 mg to be quite adequate for the indian population uh, because the safety of the prevention based on 150 mg aspirin is still not been confirmed and we have known that 75 to 80 mg aspirin has got a very good maternal and fetal safety profile because we have been using for decades now and uh, according to the gcpr guidelines of uh, gcpr of uh, foxi icog in 2019 aspirin needs to be started even earlier than 12 weeks than whatever figo is saying because defective placentation is considered as a cause to factor of preeclampsia so when you start aspirin early it will balance the levels of thromboxane a2 and prostacyclin which will maintain adequate uh, utero placenta blood flow and improve the placentation without in increasing the risk of adverse outcomes in the mother and the baby and that's why still foxy uh, advises low dose aspirin at the dose of 75 mg as a prophylaxis to prevent pre preeclampsia and they say you can continue it until 2 days prior to delivery or cesarean section you need not stop it at 36 weeks the international society for hypertension uh, is quite ambiguous it, it's between figo and foxy it says you can take it at dose of she can take it at dose of 75 to 150 started preferably before 16 weeks and they're not saying when and taken at night is the best time and continued until delivery that is the international society for hypertension guidelines regarding aspirin and what about tertiary pre prevention once the disease has started uh, what is the treatment you use to avoid the complications of preeclampsia one example is magnesium sulfate but remember 71 women have to be treated to prevent one case of eclampsia and that's why tertiary prevention is quite difficult to achieve without exposing exposing the mother to possible unnecessary risk and that's why secondary prevention is much much better and important compared to tertiary prevention and these are of no use at all primary interventions or bed rest restriction of activity in the mother nutritional measures such as reduced salt intake antioxidant use in the form of vitamin c e garlic marin oil none of them are of any use secondary interventions like use of diuretics progesterone nitric oxide metformin statins esmeprazole heparin all are not of any use for the prevention of preeclampsia so i would like to conclude with the smf guidelines of 2021 and they've said these factors need to be done to improve outcomes in preeclampsia the general measures is ensure access to quality care address the community factors and the systemic factors which are impacting the health outcomes go in for innovative care delivery models so that women take it up much better adapt the guidelines to be context appropriate and the specific interventions which i some have advises is uh, there needs to be an access and training in the appropriate utilization of magnesium sulfate anti hypertensive drugs urine dipstick test and functional blood pressure machines so the conclusion is this disease of unknown etiology there, there's a very low predictive value for the current screening test and the disease has got several presentations and all this complicate the prevention of preeclampsia cases and interventions which we have help in only a small reduction in risk and it means that a large number of women need to be treated to prevent a single case for now the definitive treatment remains delivery and removal of the placenta only and there's no effective pre prophylaxis of preeclampsia which is being formally advised currently thank you so much for the patient hearing thank you jyoti ma'am for the opportunity thank you thank you dr charmila for a very nice lucid deliberation you have covered the topic very well and uh, emphasizing on importance of prevention of uh, preeclampsia along with selection of high risk patient universal screening of every pregnant patient what are the predictive factors which can help us to predict the uh, preeclampsia and use of aspirin calcium you have uh, deliberated very nicely so thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you so much so is dr shashibala there Now for second lecture uh, I request Dr uh, Deepa Giri consultant Apollo Hospital Navi Mumbai to present her talk on recurrent abortions how to prevent and to introduce Dr uh, Deepa she is a laparoscopic gynec surgeon manages high risk obstetric cases and have interest in infertility she has many awards and achievements to her credit awarded Dr Winfred Fernandez prize for best paper presentation on painless labor right of all women at central asia regional conference mumbai she is member of obsgyni societies of navi mumbai and foxi i call upon dr deepa to please come on the floor for presentation 
Thank you, Manisha, madam. At the outset, I would like to thank Jyoti Jindal, madam, for providing me with this opportunity in our prestigious scientific session. My topic today is on recurrent. Am I being audible? Yes, yes. Yes, Dr. Yes. Uh -huh. My topic today is on recurrent pregnancy loss. As we all know that recurrent miscarriage, which is defined as spontaneous loss of three or more consecutive pregnancies before uh, the fetus you're, reaches... You're its... not sharing your screen, Dr. Deepa. Oh, I'm so sorry. One minute, madam. Am I seen now, madam? Uh, the screen is not visible yet. No, ma'am. Uh, 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 ma'am, you have to uh, click the share. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it better? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, if make it a uh, slideshow. Yeah. Slideshow, slideshow. I'm so sorry for this one. Yeah, perfect. Yes. So today's topic is on recurrent pregnancy loss and prevention. Recurrent miscarriage, as we all know, is defined as the spontaneous loss of three or more consecutive pregnancies before the fetus reaches viability. It affects one to three percent of couple who are trying to conceive. From this diagram, as we all can see, that the major cause of recurrent pregnancy loss is actually unexplained. The other factors being genetic, anatomic, autoimmune, infection, and endocrine factors. So when should we actually start investigating to prevent a loss? After two consecutive spontaneous abortions, especially when the fetal heart rate activity has been identified in the prior pregnancy losses, when the woman is older than 35 years of age, and when the couple has had difficulty in conceiving. It has been seen that maternal age and number of previous miscarriages are two independent risk factors for further miscarriage. And the risk of miscarriage is highest among couples where the woman is above 35 years of age and her husband above 40 years of age. Other environmental factors like cigarette smoking, caffeine, alcohol consumption in dose dependent manner and obesity increases the risk for both sporadic and recurrent consumptions. And so couples should be counseled with respect to lifestyle behavior modification. Genetic factors should be actually screened when there is repetitive first trimester losses, when there are anembryonic pregnancy losses, history of malformation or mental retardation mental in the previous pregnancy or in family and advanced maternal age. So genetic factors could either be parental chromosomal anomaly or an embryonic anomaly. Amongst the parents, if one of the partner, more commonly in women, if carries a balanced reciprocal or Robertsonian structural chromosomal anomaly, the fetus can have an unbalanced translocation, which could lead a loss. Embryonic abnormalities can be due to abnormalities in the sperm or the egg or both. And the most common is trisomy 16 and monosomy, but they are more responsible more for sporadic miscarriages. So fetal cytogenetic analysis, especially with array-based comparative genomic hybridization technique, which is supposed to be better as it has reduced multiple maternal contamination, along with paternal karyotyping is being advised. However, there is no clear effect of genetic testing of the pregnancy tissue in the future prognosis. So couple should be advised for genetic counseling. They should be sent to a geneticist. Information should be provided to couple, which will aid them to decide whether they need to continue trying for pregnancy or they require prenatal invasive tests like uh, pre-implantation genetic testing or prenatal diagnosis. The use of either donor oocyte or sperm can be advised depending on the affected partner. So acquired thrombophilias like APLA is seen in 15% of women with recurrent pregnancy loss. The prevalence is higher when the patient also has SLE. The prognosis of pregnancy is poor in such situations. So these patients basically have recurrent pregnancy loss because of thrombosis in the utero-placental circulation. So for women with RPL, Screening should be performed after two pregnancy losses if APLA is suspected. So to diagnose an APLA, it is mandatory that women should have two positive tests at least 12 weeks apart for either lupus anticoagulant or anti-cardiolipid antibody IgG IgM with medium or high titer over 40 grams. Generally, a time interval of six weeks after the loss is considered ap ap appropriate. Routine ANA testing in the absence of any autoimmune system is unwarranted. So in such patients, it is best to treat them with low-dose aspirin plus heparin to prevent further miscarriages. There are several studies which also suggest administration of low-dose aspirin starting before conception with a prophylactic dose of heparin starting at the date of post-pregnancy test. 
However, there are studies which show that neither corticosteroids or intravenous immunoglobulin therapy can improve the birth rate in women with APLA and RPL. Inherited thrombophilias like prothrombin gene mutation, antithrombin 3 deficiency, factor V laden mutations, deficiencies of protein CNS, and hypohomocysteinemia also cause RPL by causing thrombosis in the uteroplacental circulation. They should be, patients should be screened when they have recurrent second trimester pregnancy loss or when the family members have history of hereditary thrombophilia or there's a previous episode of venous thromboembolism. So it is recommended to postpone screening of hereditary thrombophilia until six weeks after the pregnancy loss because there can be, due to physiological pregnancy changes, thrombophilia markers may increase or decrease, especially protein C, protein S, and antithrombin 3. So such patients who, are, uh, uh, who have inherited thrombophilia, heparin therapy may help to improve the live birth rate. In patients with hypohomocysteinemia, treatment with L-methylfolate, vitamin B6 and B12 can help. Based on a high prevalence of studies, subclinical hypothyroidism and thyroid autoimmunity in women with RPL has been seen and hence thyroid screening, TSH and TPO antibodies is recommended in women as per the ASHRAE guidelines. So overt women with overt hypothyroidism, which arise before starting of conception or during early gestations are to be treated with levothyroxine. Women with subclinical hypothyroidism or women with positive thyro thyroid antibodies and RPL who are pregnant again, thyroid levels should be checked in the early gestation and hypothyroidism should be treated with levothyroxine. There is insufficient evidence to support the treatment of levothyroxine in new thyroid women with thyroid antibodies and RPL. In cases of PCOS, there is an uncertainty for association between PCOS and pregnancy loss, and so fasting insulin and fasting glucose is not recommended. However, there are studies which suggest treatment with metformin to increase the chance of live birth in women with recurrent losses. Again, prolactin testing is not recommended routinely unless and until there is any symptoms of hyperprolactinemia. Dopamine agonist therapy can be considered in such women. Luteal phase insufficiency testing is not recommended as there's no clear value for it in prognosis and further treatment. Anatomic causes could be because of congenital causes and acquired congenital uterine anomalies are seen six to seven percent more in women with RPL versus two percent in normal women. The pathology could be reduced intrauterine volume and poor vascular supply. Septate uterus has seen to show more of first trimester abortion and arcuate uterus more in second. The acquired uh, anomalies could be uterine, leomyomas, polyp, or Asherman and incompetent cervix. So sono uh, transvaginal 3D ultrasound is the suggested or the preferred technique to uh, in identifying a uterine anatomy. And every woman with RPL should undergo an assessment of uterine ana anatomy. In setups where transvaginal 3D ultrasound is not available, sonohistrography is more accurate than histosalpingography. If there is a Mullerian uterine anomaly also diagnosed, uh, suggested investigations for kidney and urinary tract abnormalities should also be considered. Ultrasound presence and location of uterine myomas should be diagnosed and MRI can be used as an assessment where 3D ultrasound is not available. So women with septate uterus, uh, in them histosopic septum resection has shown beneficial effects. There is no strong evidence to recommend metroplasty in bicornate uterus or in diadelphi uterus. In unicornate uterus, pregnancy is best managed expectantly with cervical circulage. Uh, especially reserved for those women with previous second uh, trimester losses or evidence of progressive cervical shortening. In event of an irreparable anatomic uterine anomaly, surrogacy can be opted for. There is a fair evidence that hysteroscopic myomectomy for cavity distorting myomas improve the clinical pregnancy rate, but insufficient evidence regarding the impact of this procedure on the live birth rate. However, women with asymptomatic cavity distorting myomas, myomectomy may be considered to optimize pregnancy. Intrauterine adhesions or Asherman syndrome can be treated with hostro, uh, operative hysteroscopy and adhesiolysis. There is advocation of insertion of intrauterine balloon for 7 to 10 days after this adhesiolysis. High dose exogenous estrogen after surgery encourages rapid endometrial reapatalization and proliferation in the final week. However, the recurrence rate is around 20 to 60%. In case of cervical incompetence, in case of cervical incompetence, uh, Shirotka's oh, procedure or oh, McDonald's oh, procedure oh, can be indicated oh, in history indicated uh, circulage. 
in women who have had more than previous to previous preterm labor and or, or two trimester losses. A choice of prophylactic cervical cerclage can be provided to women where the transvaginal ultrasound between 16 to 24 weeks reveal a length of less than 2.5 centimeter with either a previous uh, pre-rupture membrane, preterm pre-rupture membrane in previous pregnancy or a history of cervical trauma. It has been seen that there are inconclusive studies indicating immune response to placental and fetal antigen as a cause of RPL and so routine tests for human and glucosar antigen typing and anti-paternal cytotoxic antibody NK cell, uh, NK cell testing or blocking antibodies is questionable. The use of immunotherapy is not beneficial. In the role of infection like chlamydia, trachomatis, uroplasma, uh, urolyticum, mycoplasma, and listeria is actually unclear in recurrent losses. However, severe infection leading to bacteremia or viremia can cause sporadic miscarriage. Tort screening, as we all know, should be abandoned. There can be the presence of bacterial vaginosis in the first trimester of pregnancy has been reported as a risk factor for second trimester miscarriage and preterm labor. And so vaginal spots should be collected and patients should be treated with antibiotics. There are some studies which suggest that sperm DNA fragmentation is seen to be increased with patients in RPL, especially in in vitro fertilization setting. However, as per the ASRM and ASHRAE guidelines, routine sperm DNA fragmentation testing is not indicated. Antioxidants, as per some studies, have in some in subfertile uh, fertile men have shown to improve the chance of live pregnancy, but has not significantly decreased the chance of pregnancy loss. There is no role of sperm selection. So women with recurrent pregnancy loss are prone to anger, depression, anxiety, and grief. And so sensitivity is required in assessing and counseling couple. We should acknowledge their grief and provide them with realistic assessment of reproductive success, even if the cause of RPL is unknown. There, there, there are some times when necessary, when we when it is necessary to refer to support groups, marriage, and family uh, therapy. Unexplained uh, cause of recurrent pregnancy loss, though, is the largest cause, these patients, if they are encouraged to continue attempting uh, pregnancy, women with even advanced age have seen to have show good rate of live birth with subs in their subsequent pregnancy. So women, there has been a study where women with, uh, who have been receiving tender loving care have actually shown a live birth rate of more than 85%. So in, in patients with unexplained pregnancy, unexplained uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, tender loving care, lifestyle modification may help in improving the live birth rate. Aspirin, heparin, HCG, HMG, intralipid uh, therapy, endometrial scratching, uh, use of corticosteroids, leukocyte immune uh, uh, therapy. There are, there are inadequate or inconclusive studies showing their benefit in RPL. Treatment with progesterone, especially didrogesterone. Uh, has shown to act, which actually acts as an immunoblodulator, especially given during the luteal phase of pregnancy is effective in increasing the live birth rate. However, when started uh, post-pregnancy, doesn't uh, help in uh, 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 preventing recurrent pregnancy loss. There are good quality uh, randomized controlled trials, which have shown that granulocyte macrophages uh, colony stimulating factor and granulocyte colony stimulating factors benefit uh, uh, in recurrent pregnancy loss. But however, further more trials are needed in different populations to confirm this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deepa, for exploratory and elaborative talk on recurrent pregnancy loss. Widely covered Thank the causes you. of pregnancy loss, the screening tests, diagnostic modalities, and uh, various treatment modalities depending upon the cause of RPL. Thank you so much. Thank now you, for the third lecture, I would uh, like to request and call upon Dr. Lakshmi Shrikhande, Madam from Nagpur. Welcome, Madam. She is chairperson elect ICOG and she will be delivering her talk on high risk pregnancy do's and don'ts. Dr. Uh, Lakshmi is national corresponding editor of Journal of OBGYN India, Jogi, National Corresponding Secretary of Association of Medical Women India, Founder, Patron and President ISOPAB Vidarbh Chapter 2019-21, Chairperson IMS Education Committee 2021-23, President of Association of Medical Women Nagpur 2021-24, Menopause Society Nagpur 2016-18, Nagpur OBGYN Society President from 2005 to 6, 
she was senior vice president foxy 2012 delivered many orations and guest lectures has 30 national 11 international publications many awards and achievements to her credit namely nagpur ratan award at the hands of union minister shri nitin gadkari ji bharat bharat excellence award of women's health received mehru dahra hansotia best committee award for her work as chairperson of hiv aids committee foxy 2007 to 2009 she received appreciation letter from maharashtra government of her, for her work in field of save the girl child so madam the floor is yours welcome dr lakshmi thank you thank you dr manisha am i audible yes ma'am yes yeah i cannot screen share while the other participant is sharing please uh, yeah thank you so much so congratulations dr jyoti bindal for organizing such an informative webinar and after listening to all the experts on the technical aspects of high risk pregnancy here i am coming with the basics of high risk pregnancy so are my slides visible yes yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah. so what do we exactly mean by high risk pregnancy we all know that every pregnancy has some levels of danger but a high risk pregnancy is one where the mother or the fetus or both they have some excess health risk and 6 to 8% of the pregnancies can turn into high risk pregnancy so why we are bothered so much about high risk pregnancy because they need special attention to optimize the best possible maternal and neonatal outcome and this special care will definitely minimize the hassles associated with taking care of these high risk pregnancy but remember when you are telling your patient that this is a high risk pregnancy please tell her that she should not panic and this does not mean that she will not have any complications or she will have n number of complications which she has already gone on the google so in short what are the do's for us as a treating obstetrician which you have to tell to your patient and first and foremost is tell her to have adequate sleep you all know that out of your experience that majority of these patients they have problem of insomnia more so if she is a high risk pregnancy because of her anxiety apprehension she is prone for insomnia i am sure you all know the general rules and regulations for the insomnia but you can just brief her to shorten her the afternoon nap time to decrease her caffeine intake and she should sleep as much as possible on the left side it is our duty to teach her the correct posture where she has to avoid the problems with the baby so you can tell her the do's and don'ts as far as the good night sleep is concerned work out many patients many obstetricians they still believe that if it's a high risk pregnancy they should be confined to bed i know it all depends on the exact condition of what this lady is having the high risk component but having a consistent routine workout throughout pregnancy is good for both mother and baby it will relieve her insomnia it will relieve her muscle pain but of course it is you who will be giving her green signal which workout she should do how much workout she should do but if bed rest is not advisable encourage her to do some workout encourage her to do some yogas because they are very very helpful this helps in stretching the muscles and it strengthens her body seek out the prenatal or gentle yoga classes that are designed for mothers to be in my place there are many garbh sanskar classes which are being conducted so you can tell your antenatal mother to attend these classes but yes of course you are obstetrician so first you should tell her which yogas she can practice and which she should avoid now the crux of this high risk pregnancy or for that matter any pregnancy is eat healthy 
i know you have to tell her that she does not have to eat for two but she definitely has to eat for two but it doesn't mean that she has to eat twice as much as whatever she was eating before her pregnancy because healthy balanced diet definitely affects the outcome of pregnancy if she is non vegetarian do encourage her to eat seafood but caution her that she should not eat undercooked or raw seafood because that might cause some problems for her again raw fish should be avoided and also those fish which contains high levels of mercury should be avoided in general she should not eat more than 12 ounces of fish per week so she has to eat smartly because you all know that in high risk pregnancy you all are strictly monitoring her weight gain during pregnancy and this weight gain requires not only calories but she also need the essential nutrients minerals and vitamins iron folic acid protein calcium and you have to supplement her in adequate amount it is very very essential that you motivate her to follow a diet chart and she should eat healthy there are many apps on google i will not name any particular app but she can take help of those apps to have a calorie count so daily calorie count becomes very easy with the help of those apps and tell her that she should not give in to her cravings because moderation is the key as far as healthy pregnancy outcome is concerned now coming to the vitamin and minerals yes they are very much needed more so in high risk pregnancy but i am seeing many patients especially post covid where they have just popped up so many vitamins multivitamins and they are coming with hypervitaminosis so you have to tell them that excess is also not good so whatever a doctor is prescribing they should adhere to that dose and that uh, the dose and the required period of time now as an obstetrician if you get a chance to see her before pregnancy or whenever you are seeing her you have to manage her pre existing health conditions like some women they might be having essential hypertension some heart problems diabetes sexually transmitted infections hiv i hope you all know that this testing is we all are supposed to do hiv test on all pregnant women including vdrl testing and tell her that this management of health condition she has to cooperate and she has to comply with all the instructions given by a doctor flu shot covid shots everything she has to take as per the doctor's instructions as an obstetrician you should also not hesitate against these flu shots and covid shots this is my favorite slide because most of the obstetricians also they discourage patients to, to go to a dentist when they are pregnant on the contrary they should have regular dental care regular dental checkups they have to pay attention to their oral hygiene the american college of obstetricians and gynecologists recommends that expected mothers they should have a routine oral health assessment when they are pregnant and when they are pregnant if they require any dental treatment please tell them they can go ahead but they should inform the dentist that she is pregnant then what about sex many of the gynecologists they tell them to have abstinence friends it is practically impossible to have abstinence for 9 months so it's a misconception that once she is pregnant she should avoid sex sex has got many benefits when done under good hygienic conditions uh, with doctors uh, with doctors guidance so don't tell them blanketly to avoid sex communicate with them guide them and encourage them to have sex what about maternal age you all know that 
we are seeing more and more first pregnancies when they are already 35 years of age. So when they are coming to you and they are already 30 plus, do emphasize that she is prone to have certain complications uh, more as compared to the younger woman. So she should comply with the regular antenatal checkups because the regular appointments are very, very critical to monitor her health and as well as the health of the baby. I know this is an era of Google doctor. They are well informed, rather they are over informed, but tell them that they should stick to the correct informations. If they are logging on the websites, then there are creditable sources which they can go on like Centers for Disease Control, the Maternal Fetal Medicine, and various sites they can get authentic information. Encourage them that they should know their risk. I know after counseling them, after telling them all the risks, the mother and the relatives, they will ask, Acha doctor, sab normal hai na? Isko koi problem to nahi hai na? So again, we emphasize that yes, she is having problems and she has to come to you for sure, regular checkup. Now, support system is very, very important. If you have got the support system of your own practice, high-risk patients, you can. Otherwise, on net, there are many associations, the maternal fetal medicine website. They have a list of support groups where you can encourage them to join these support groups. Create a plan with roadmap for these patients. And remember, most hospitals, I know you all have a premature baby unit, you have a baby warmer. But these high-risk pregnancies, they should be delivered in a facility where there is a neonatal intensive care unit that is level 3. There only, because transferring baby from your setup to a tertiary NICU, again, it affects the outcome for the baby. So these high-risk pregnancy patients should be delivered in a setup where is a, there is an ICU for the mother and there is an NICU level 3 care for the baby. Encourage her to take her care first. I know they are all are working, but they have to learn to give priority to her pregnancy. She has to listen to her body and she has to listen to her mental health as well. Because as an obstetrician, sometimes we also tend to overlook the mental health associated with pregnancy. And these high-risk pregnancies, there are more chances of depression, anxiety, and we have to address these uh, situations also. If you feel that at your level, you are not able to counsel them, don't hesitate to refer them to counselor or take help of, of your psychiatric friends because they have to accept that she is a high risk condition. And this is a very, very known problem, the trust issues, but she has to trust her doctor because the key to handling a high risk pregnancy is trusting your doctor. So encourage her to stop reading unnecessary information online and she should stop confusing herself and her mind. You have to be consistent with your management plan and encourage her to be consistent with her medicine, with her supplements, with her diet chart and whatever care plan you have given her, consistency matters. Vigilance on your part and on her part, both matters because she should understand that what are the side effects or what are the symptoms she should have to monitor at home and what are the danger signs which she has to report to you. So keep her uh, well informed so that she can be vigilant at home. Now you have to tell her that she should be ready at any time in case of emergency, if she has to go to the hospital and get admitted, then she has to keep her bag ready. Last minute, she should not hassle about what to pack, what not to pack. So tell her about this situation also. The last do is the teamwork. Don't take on you alone to manage that high-risk pregnancy. Involve neonatologists, fetal medicine specialists, physician, intensivists, anesthetists, everyone which you feel, psychiatrist, 
in some cases involve them from day one in taking care of these high risk pregnancies so after knowing these do's of course there are certain don'ts and these women we all are witnessing more and more women they are into smoking or into some kind of nicotine or in kind of some drug uh, use so you have to tell them point blank that smoking is very very injurious as far as baby is concerned because this baby is more prone to have premature birth low birth weight and the children who are born to women who smoke are more likely to try smoking at a younger age so tell all this blankly to her alcohol friends there is no safe amount of alcohol like you can have one pack per day or you can have three packs per week nothing like that you should tell her to avoid alcohol consumption if she is pregnant what about caffeine yes she can take in moderation but the intake should not exceed 300 and remember the current research suggests that women can safely consume a cup or two but you can't have those triple shot latte and extra uh, heavy coffee or extra strong coffees mental health i have already said that she should also pay attention and as a treating doctor you should also pay attention to her mental health discourage her from eating raw meat or undercooked meat or uh, these hot dogs sausages smoked salmon because all these can have adverse outcomes in india we all are bound to have pet dogs but i have seen many women they have cat as their pet so you have to give her instructions about not cleaning the cat's litter box because toxoplasmosis do not common in india but she can suffer from toxoplasmosis what about milk products there is nowadays i am seeing a recent fad that you should not go for pasteurized milk you should go and have a direct milk from the milk supplier friends tell this pregnant woman that raw milk is not recommended in pregnancy because it is unpasteurized especially raw milk can also contain the bacteria called as listeria this can also lead to illness miscarriages or even life threatening consequences so tell her to have the pasteurized milk and milk products she should avoid sitting in saunas or taking two hot water baths if she wants 5 to 10 minutes is enough but she should limit her exposure to hot water bath and sauna i know it is very easy to say don't panic but you have to on one hand you have to reassure her on other hand you have to be very realistic and you have to give her realistic expectations what she has to expect as far as the outcome is concerned so tell her to pay attention to her mental health have support system and of course your staff can also play a big role in soothing her mindset can you really prevent a high risk pregnancy because she is going to ask you doctor what next yes certain points you can definitely tell her that you should avoid drugs alcohol if she has got any personal or family history she has to tell the doctor but on our part we should also not forget to ask the family history and the past history encourage her to have a healthy body weight inquire her about pre existing health conditions and manage them ask her the drug history what exactly she is taking and see if they have got any side effects on this current pregnancy she has to quit smoking she has to quit her alcohol consumption and the ideal age for pregnancy you all know that by the age of 30 she should have one child and safe sex practices should be encouraged so friends the take home message as far as do's and don'ts of high risk pregnancy is concerned given the current lifestyle and work culture many women they are prone to have high risk pregnancies if she is the one who is having a high risk pregnancy then the roller coaster ride is a part of this package although anxiety and stress they are inevitable there is really no dire need to get too worked up as far as high risk pregnancy is concerned 
with the advent of amazing medical facilities and regular prenatal care you can assure her that she can have a healthy baby with a safe outcome despite having a high risk pregnancy what about the stand alone hospitals again i am emphasizing that do not deliver these high risk patients in a stand alone hospital deliver them where there is icu for mother and nicu level 3 care for the baby so thank you friends for your patient hearing if there are any questions i am happy to answer all your questions thank you so much i thank you dr lakshmi for a very illustrative presentation on do's and don'ts in high risk pregnancy you have very rightly impressed upon many lifestyle changes in high risk pregnant patients like having good sleep exercise yoga eat healthy gain healthy weight and uh, to manage her pre existing health conditions well uh, now dr shashibala have also joined if she wants she can comment dr shashibala is she there can't see her so once again i thank ah uh, yeah i once again thank dr jyoti bindal madam for such a nice academic fees for Hello. all of us and i hand over the session to dr mayuri for further proceedings dr shashibala is there yes yes uh, i joined from preeti's phone my phone was going uh, hey wires i heard madam sri lakshmi shikhande's lecture and thank you and it was really very uh, so to the point and pertinent for all our anc patients ma'am and uh, uh, that you said about uh, eating fish and that too that they taking care that it is not uncooked or something that that is very important and carbo or uh, carbos and this fiber diet is very important uh, thank you uh, manisha for uh, helping me because ma'am jyoti didi i am very sorry i couldn't join and i was going out i was joining and i was going out i couldn't be there for the whole time and priti oh, was oh, there yeah. with me hello so, good evening ma'am no issue with uh, no issue uh, dr bhosle will yeah, move on now yes, to our next speaker yes thank, thank you thank you lakshmi it was very good thank you dr jyoti bindal for the wonderful opportunity thank you so much mayuri will move on now yes ma'am So with this, I would like to thank the esteemed chairpersons for the session too, and the speakers to share their knowledge with us. Now, uh, without taking much time, I move uh, to our uh, session three, which is at uh, recent advances in management of infertility. The chairpersons for this session are Dr. Priya Bhave Chitterwar, ma'am, Dr. Asha Bakshi, and Dr. Kalpana. Uh, Dr. Asha, ma'am, is not able to join because of some emergencies. Uh, the speakers for this session are Dr. Arjuna Verma, Dr. Shilpa Bhandari, and Dr. Pa, uh, Dr. Parun Potata Bala sir. So uh, the topics which will be covered are PCOS, a myth or enigma, endometriosis, and office hysteroscopy. Uh, as uh, initially Dr. Archana Verma ma'am joined, but she is traveling, so uh, that's why we have got her session recorded. And with your due permission, I will just start sharing her uh, lecture. In, in just allow me. thank you very good morning to each and everyone and myself dr archana verma and my topic is pcos a myth or enigma so dear friends now today we will be talking about how the pcos affects and what are the myths so uh, regarding the uh, uh, this pcos uh, uh, facts we must know that the common it is the commonest endocrinopathy and when uh, uh, almost five and the, it is one of the most common cause of anovulatory infertility and generally most women are obese but 20 to 30 percent are of lean type also and this pcos you know dear friends it is not a disease it's an uh, mostly very uh, less understood uh, phenomena and it's always causes dilemma even in diagnosis and uh, seeing the symptoms and uh, the most common question which comes to our mind is who, who are the women who gets pcos actually it's a disease of reproductive uh, age group 
and uh, it mainly the it it's, uh, affects five to ten percent of the females. And uh, but the uh, most important thing to remember is that it can happen at any age after puberty. And to know the symptoms, we know you know there are lot many symptoms, and uh, especially the all the symptoms of uh, hirsutism, acne, and menstrual irregularity, infertility, and some excessive hair loss is to be noted. Sometimes we only keep looking at excessive hair, but hair, ex, this excess hair loss is one of the things. And mood changes in females may also represent PCOS. So the PCOS actually affects many areas of a woman's life, including the most important one is the uh, the psychological, we should not forget it. And this dermatological in the adolescent, all the uh, women, the main and most important thing to, uh, they are always bothered about is their external beauty. So, and because of the presence of acne and hysteticism and the, uh, this obesity, they are much worried and metabolic. It's not to be forgotten because this is when the patient is uh, going to advance here in her life this metabolic syndrome develops and insulin resistance is leading to the type 2 of diabetes and the sleeps are also disturbed and there's many episodes of sleep apnea also and reproductive of course the, it causes infertility and once the patient gets pregnant there are more chances of miscarriage and preeclampsia and uh, this nationwide PCOS survey was done and the facts are 25% of the Indian women don't know about PCOS or the PCOD and 35% of the women have never spoken about PCOS to anyone and of 65% of the women are not aware of the PCOS system, uh, symptom. They only come to a doctor when they have a, a report of ultrasound in their hand and it is written polycystic ovaries and then they start bothering about the PCOS. And more than 60% of the male partners also don't know about the PCOS. And the almost 15% of the women, they just don't want to talk about PCOS. And 48% of the women finds it uncomfortable talking about it. And more than 4.5% consider talking about PCOS a taboo. And so most important uh, to remember uh, are to think about the cause. And actually, the exact cause of PCOS is not known as such. There are many theories going on. And to here, it is not uh, less time. We just, I don't want to discuss it. And just remember that genetics do play a role. And the main causes are because of, main effects are only because of the high levels of androgens moving in uh, just, and the uh, hormonal milieu is a change and the high level of insulin. This insulin resistance is something very important. It uh, works uh, on uh, in obesity and uh, this lean PCOS also. And because of this, they keep on eating. And when they eat uh, the carbohydrate imbalance and this, this as a, they don't get enough uh, physical activity because of the their work style or their study and all they are, uh, don't have because the sedentary lifestyle and this this insulin resistance is one of the important leading factor for all the symptoms and dear friend there is no single test which can diagnose PCOS so we have to be very careful in looking for the diagnostic criteria of PCOS. We all know that many societies, including NIH, Rotterdam, Androgen Access Society, and this ASHRAE or ASRM, this made the Rotterdam criteria, and this is latest and, uh, and new, and this is, it says, the oligomenorrhea or the amenorrhea for two years after menarche, and primary amenorrhea at age of 16 should be taken into consideration, and all the symptoms of clinical hyper androgenism also should be taken into account and biochemical hyperandrogenism or the elevated total or free testosterone and or DHEAS should be taken into consideration for diagnosis and some, there may be a ovarian volume increased more than 10 centimeters uh, in one ovary this to be taken. Now it is not necessary to all the uh, ovaries to have polycysts in their uh, 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 appearances. And so this is something all, this is all three. This to remember is requires three of the three to be present. And previously there were only uh, like uh, uh, the, either the clinical androgenism or the oligomenorrhea and or polycystic disease were there. So two out of the three were important. Nowadays, three out of the three is included. So this is again, uh, this about the Rotterdam criteria. 
and uh, you know the most problem in the menstrual irregularity is that no one can say that this is having this problem so this she must be have a case of pcos a woman with a regular periods could also be still be having pcos a woman with normal ultrasound can also be having pcos and woman who is not even obese could also be having pcos and so to just i want to enumerate before going jumping into the uh, to the myths so that is the small effects of weight loss we all must remember and must put it in our clinic that even the 5% of the uh, body weight is um, very beneficial and should not be uh, too much vigorous exercises doesn't help a lot but it should be a total all in all life style modification it decreases insulin level it improves menstrual function and it reduces hirsutism and lowers testosterone level also so myth number 1 is we we can always see the uh, 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 with the pathologies pcos causes infertility in women yes it is one of the cause but it is not there that they are infertile uh, infertile for always because with proper referral to and proper management with the ovulation induction because the base is al always the inovulatory especially and so if the patient should be referred timely and they can get pregnant very well taken care and myth number 2 is the only overweight women get pcos so all those lean they should not feel very happy that we cannot have pcos pcos can be both in obese and in the lean also and the again in the ultrasound the women with pcos they often have these polycystic ovary it's not necessary they all they will always have it and this myth number 4 is symptoms in lean pcos are different from obese pcos actually the only symptom is that they are they are uh, they have got that they are not overweight otherwise all symptoms are almost same they also have acne they also have fatigue they also have all those variances and what not and they are almost are the same they are not very different only thing is when they are uh, uh, taken for the infertility induction the uh, sometimes the uh, clinician forget that she may be a case of and there's always chances of hyper and the myth number 5 is insulin sensitizers should be prescribed to only obese uh, uh, pcos uh, dear friends uh, when there is a pcos in lean uh, or this uh, pcos so we need to give the combination to uh, this or to lean pcos also and the, in the lean pcos actually the insulin resistance it causes reactive hypoglycemia just too many carbohydrate uh, are taken by the patient and it causes the blood sugar level to rise and pancreas releases too much of insulin and then blood sugar drops and the patient feels fatigue and uh, dizzy also and again they take uh, in uh, this glucose uh, or uh, this uh, uh, more eating uh, because they feel hungry so they eat and they eat so the excess of the energy and the, this uh, fat is transformed and they they also this uh, this cycle keeps on roaming and so they also can go into the obese they can develop the obesity later on and the type 2 diabetes and this myth number 6 is lifestyle modification should only be for the obese nowadays actually lifestyle modification for everyone but we should take a time to do all the our healthy lifestyle because kon banega karodpati is not all that important who will be the most healthy and happy person is more important in nowadays life and myth number 7 is pcos is only about menstrual cycle and nothing else dear friends of course all the females are much worried about their menstrual um, uh, fitness because every, when they are having the periods at regular time they are all time happy and when there is any uh, oligomenorrhea or anything then they especially hide and they just don't want to tell because they know there something bad has happened but no the pcos is about all the three factors which uh, we discuss later on it is not only the menstrual irregularity because menstrual irregularity we have to rule out other causes also and this pcos drilling sometimes whenever they they have a uh, they see polycystic ovary sometimes in the older days the, uh, the uh, very enthusiastic uh, lapro surgeon they uh, want to say that drilling will help and uh, yes uh, they uh, do the drilling but it is really nowadays considered as not needed and we must be careful to just uh, pull uh, put the laparoscope is no longer uh, with that gold standard for it and then the myth number 9 is a pcos affect women only who are less than 30 years or for, uh, sometimes because we are already discussed it is a disease of uh, even the adolescent and uh, uh, this uh, the productive age group i mean even in the postmenopausal we should take care 
of PCOS, uh, mainly uh, the people think to, um, uh, to conclude, it happens in young women and irregular periods have PCOS. Acne are always due to PCOS and all women with PCOS have difficulty in conceiving and losing weight can be completely cure the PCOS. So these are especially because uh, um, uh, when you tell that this you are obese and you are having PCOS, then they uh, conclude that uh, once we are, uh, are, are getting off with the weight, we will be better and there will be no PCOS. So the one common question again that that they are, uh, which we discussed in the myth was, can a woman still get pregnant if having PCOS? Yes, she can very well because they can. It is to be tackled, tackled as I said, that it is mainly that we have to send the patient to infertility clinics and to take in care. And, and once the patient is uh, pregnant, don't forget that now you don't need her to look for PCOS. Uh, the, all the PCOS patients, they are much more prone to miscarriage, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia. Cesarean, I will not discuss. I'm very sorry to say right here because of, but, uh, because of the hyperglycemia and all the patient may get neck, uh, uh, big babies and the fetal distress chances may be more. So the, all the uh, delivery chances may be less, but not, it's not so. A good uh, enough take care. So how to prevent problems from PCOS during pregnancy is definitely preconceptional counseling is very, very important. If we counsel the patient nicely uh, uh, before conceiving, then it will help her a lot. So thank you very much today uh, because the PCOS is growing a lot. And nowadays um, there are a lot many problems. So uh, it should be, we should be uh, well aware that how and what will help and how much we need to counsel. It is a mainly a disease of uh, uh, this hormonal imbalance and we are yeah, thank you organizers and uh, especially Dr. Jyoti Bindal and you gave me a chance and uh, I'm really, really thankful. I would like, like thank to you Archana. Despite you. your travel, you joined us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti, madam. We are, uh, we are so uh, fond of you and so thankful. And you are the most respected senior we have seen. And uh, Kavita is with me and uh, we both, both are traveling. And such a, after Dr. Pankaj Desai, Dr. Lakshmi Shrikhande, what a great uh, uh, talks and topics you and speakers you have taken. Really, really very good. It's honor and my proud privilege to uh, be invited by you. Thank you, madam. And uh, thank you, Mayuri, for helping me. Thank you, Dr. Ashna, ma'am. So I would like to uh, uh, introduce our chairpersons for the session, Dr. Priya Bhave. Dr. Priya Bhave is a consultant and head at Department of uh, Reproductive Medicine at Bansal Hospital. She uh, is also a FNB reproductive teacher and ex-faculty for D, uh, DM Repro Reproductive Medicines. She is Foxy recognized trainer in basic and advanced infertility management courses. And uh, uh, we welcome you, ma'am. And I also want to welcome, uh, so uh, we also had uh, Dr. Asha Bakshi with us, but she is not able to join because of some emergencies. Dr. Asha Bakshi is Vice President at uh, ELECT for 2022 West Foxy, and she is Lead Consultant at uh, in, uh, Lead Consultant at uh, Dr. Asha Bakshi Fertility Center in association with Motherhood Hospital in Dhar. With this, I uh, introduce our third chairperson for the session, Dr. Kalpana Ma'am. Dr. Kalpana Ma'am is gynecologist and infertility consultant. Uh, she handles uh, several responsibilities, like she is secretary for MOGS, founder secretary of Madurai chapter uh, of Tapisar, national coordinator infertility committee, and former elect uh, EC member of infertility committee, South Zone coordinator for endometriosis, and organizing secretary for MOGS Silver Jubilee Conference. She is also co-director for postdoctoral uh, fellowship in endoscopic gynecology. Dr. Kalpana has received several awards. With this, I would request Dr. Kalpana if, he, if she can uh, speak few words about Dr. Archana and can comment on the session which was covered by Dr. Archana. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kalpana, ma'am. Uh, I think she has dropped off. Dr. Priya, ma'am, if you can take the with us ahead. So, after yeah. uh, it is really a proud privilege to talk about Dr. Archana Verma. She is uh, the chairperson of Public uh, Awareness Committee of Foxy from 2016 to 18. 
and she is on the executive board for the neonatology foundation for india she is an executive member of the endocrinology committee of cefog and uh, a winner of the india book of awards she has received several awards and it was really an eye opener to listen to her discussion because she has covered all the important myths that we have about pcos and uh, uh, i congratulate you madam on this wonderful presentation and uh, if mayuri allows i think uh, i could introduce the next speaker uh, it is i i feel really proud to introduce one of the best students that i have ever taught dr shilpa bandari she is currently the associate professor at the department of reproductive medicine and surgery at the uh, shri aurobindo medical college she has done her uh, md and dm in reproductive medicine and has more than 15 publications in indexed national and international journals so i welcome shilpa for her talk on endometriosis uh hello madam nice to see you after a long time uh thank you jyoti madam for giving me this opportunity to talk and talk to, uh, thank you dr mayuri for yesterday teaching me how to share my screen so i'll start my presentation uh i am to talk about uh, whether endometriosis and infertility are associated and the short answer is that they are because uh, we have limited time so i'll be a little faster with this uh in fact if you uh, ask any fertility specialist they will say that probably they have looked at endometriosis more than any other thing because most of the patients that we have today are either having subtle tubal disease or por or unexplained infertility and at the root of it many a times we find endometriosis to be associated though there is no causal relationship but we do know that there is definite evidence between endometriosis and infertility uh, in a brief i will try to cover why it is associated and what we can do to reduce uh, the impact of endometriosis on infertility so uh, we all know endometriosis is a multifactorial disease most of the causes we don't know and probably we need another webinar to understand why it causes why endometriosis happens but uh, it causes infertility again by a lot of ways so uh, the most obvious is of course it causes extraordinary anatomical distortion and tubal disease but this is what we see uh, when we do laparoscopy in patients we know have endometriosis you know we can start seeing in ultrasonographies as well but in many cases the uh, cause of infertility may not be visible on a simple ultrasound or you may not be able to elucidate the cause by just talking to the patient it may cause uh, infertility by anovulation sometimes you have you know what you called as lap, rap, uh, uh, luteinized unruptured follicle uh, many a times a lot of immunological factors are also associated why immunological because we know that endometriosis is essentially an inflammatory disease it causes inflammation of the peritoneum it's a systemic inflammation that happens it alters the tubal function it also alters the endometrial receptivity the uterine uh, uh, factors and also the embryo and oocyte quality uh, in fact um, uh, what we have started doing in our lab is uh, we have started to keep you know oocyte separate from if we have a unilateral endometrioma and we see that blastulation rates are different from the oocytes that have been recovered from the site where we have had an endometrioma we don't have too many of such cases but for whatever number of cases that is a very significant finding we have seen so uh, we all know this that it causes uh, you know an increased t cell activity uh, it uh, and macrophage dysfunction and there are a lot of cytokines and all that so uh, it also affects oocyte uh, many a times we find a very good antral count in patient even the amh is good but there is definite endometriosis you find lot of small small endometriomas and when we take out these oocytes they are uh, the blastulation rate is low there even fertilization rate is low probably again because of some kind of a mechanical distortion that endometriosis is creating or as i said because of the inflammatory mediation that happens so uh, as i said many a times this endometriosis may not be um, something that uh, is visible on an ultrasound or by just talking to the patient so what should we do uh, laparoscopy remains the gold standard of endometriosis though with a good scan uh, even small endometriomas you can see and uh, uh, in an infertility patient therefore laparoscopy 
is one of a very big uh, investigative mechanism. So uh, most of the uh, people who are dealing with endometriosis and infertility will say that their threshold for uh, laparoscopy is very low in these setups. I cannot say much for the gynecologist how willing you are to do laparoscopy in unexplained infertility or fit in patients who are not, you know, uh, too infertile with a very long uh, married life. But yes, in infertility, you have to have a very low threshold for uh, laparoscopy to diagnose early endometriosis a little earlier. So, uh, sorry, I don't know, it has stopped, I think. Yes, so uh, we see that if you find endometriosis on laparoscopy and if you do a cystectomy for a larger cyst, it may actually improve uh, fertility uh, reasons. So what do you do when you know that a patient has endometriosis and how do you uh, reduce the association of endometriosis and how do you improve the fertility of this patient? So uh, the first thing that I want to bring out very clearly is that uh, you do not uh, uh, suppress the ovarian function. You do not focus on just removing the endometrioma without thinking about the fertility as well. If you have to be very clear why the patient with this endometriosis has come to you. Because my talk is associated with infertility. So I'm presuming the patient who has come to me has infertility associated with endometrioma. So my entire management outlook will be how to make her pregnant as early as possible with or without this endometrioma. So that would mean that there would be scenarios when I would like to ignore the endometrioma and treat her fertility. There will be scenarios when I would like to treat her endometrioma and thereby increase her fertility. So you cannot have one standardized approach for all kinds of endometriosis, for all kinds of infertility patients, and for all kinds of symptoms that the patient has with you. So sometimes you use laparoscopy, sometimes you don't use laparoscopy. But what you don't do is simple ovarian suppression in hopes that it will go away in itself and she will conceive on herself. You have to be active in the role of endometriosis. So um, first, because it's active, uh, do not advocate uh, just, you know, patients to have a fertile period. If required, stimulate the patient because we know that there is a def uh, definite alteration in oocyte function. There is a definite alteration in ovulation. So give uh, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation, preferably with gonadotropins. So uh, especially in mild to moderate cases where, of course, the tubal function is all right and preferably associated with IUI so as to improve the Prognosis. This is what uh, really happens in unexplained infertility because uh, this is where it helps because we are increasing the number of oocytes that we are forming by controlled ovarian stimulation. Again, like laparoscopy, the threshold for IVF is very low in cases of endometriosis because it is a recurrent and a progressive disease. And maybe by the time you decide for a fertile period or you do a lot of things, her ovarian reserve will go down and uh, she will... Uh, lose that window of opportunity for having a child of her own or um, um, uh, the uh, chances or a prognosis with her own oocytes may drop down. So uh, the threshold for uh, stimulation should also be very low. Preferably, uh, as a part of this plan, uh, you may like to do a long down regulation, especially if you have already made up her embryos and there is also an associated adenomyosis with it. So you may consider down-regulating it a bit so as to reduce her pain and symptoms. Uh, when you are treating a patient with endometriosis, it is very important that we also communicate with the patient about the reduced prognosis rates. Of course, that doesn't mean that every time you have to consider an egg donation cycle. But yes, if you compare it with other causes of infertility, she may have a reduced oocyte quality for the same age group uh, control patients kind of thing. So um, again, uh, there is no specific protocol of an infertility treatment which will benefit a patient of endometriosis. Every center, every doctor will have their own experience and whatever you do is good depending on your setup and your experience. But of course, uh, uh, if you have to do an aspiration of an endometrioma, uh, expect that a recurrence will be higher. Uh, now... Uh, to cut short my lecture, to uh, summarize it, one is endometriosis is an important cause of infertility. 
uh, in Indian females, uh, though dysmenorrhea and uh, though dysperiunia are very important associated factors of uh, symptoms, but rarely you find patients coming forth with having, uh, you know, uh, the entire history of sexual dysfunction and everything. They will presume that, yes, it happens. So uh, sometimes uh, it is easy to miss the history of endometriosis in history alone. So uh, you have to understand that it is present in a lot of patients of endometriosis. You may not be always able to see it on scans because there can be very subtle evidence. And these patients have a reduced fertility window. So you have to be very aggressive in your treatment. And you cannot just linger on. If you think that uh, uh, probably this is a case of grade 4 endometriosis, Probably this will, uh, there are a lot of other associated factors like a male factor also, probably a very long history of infertility. Probably the age of the female is also 37, 38. It is better at that point that you decide that she will be benefited more if you refer her directly to a fertility specialist rather than trying your hand at the patient with surgery and with gonadotropin stimulation or something or the other. Because it's a progressive disease, it will grow. So uh, best option is an aggressive treatment and uh, you have to consider fertility, not just an endometriosis alone. You have to consider it as a whole picture. And uh, I don't know, it was a short lecture. <laughs> uh, unlike other speakers who are so experienced in their uh, topics and everything. So I do hope that I have uh, covered the salient features that yes, infertility and endometriosis are associated, not just associated, probably distant cousins as well. So uh, thank you, Jyoti, madam, for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Mayuri, for uh, this opportunity. And I hope uh, I have done justice to the topic that was given to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shilpa. And uh, as uh, Shilpa has rightly mentioned, it is not just uh, the disease or the diagnosis, but the entire couple that we are treating. So we should never make a mistake of only looking at endometriosis, but we should look, step back, take a look at the whole picture and then decide to treat. Of course, while treatment, the presence of endometriosis and the fact that it is a progressive condition definitely makes it one of the very important factors that has to be in our decision matrix in order to treat. Uh, if uh, Dr. Kalpana is there, uh, are we taking the... Uh, Chairperson's comments now, or shall we? Uh, shall I introduce Dr. Parul? Uh, Ma'am, you can uh, move ahead. Uh, Dr. Uh, so, uh, very good evening, uh, uh, Parul sir. It is really a pleasure to see you, although virtually. And he is uh, an icon in himself, and he has inspired me and countless other uh, junior gynecologists to, you know follow subspecialities and uh, become better in their fields. At present, sir is the vice president of uh, ISOPAR. He is the chairman of education committee of CEFOG and in the Indian coordinator of New European Surgical Academy and the International Edition Society. He was the vice president of FOXI in 2008, president of SOGOG in 2009 and AOGS president from 2007 to 2008. He's also a managing committee member of ISAR from 2014 to 2018 and IAG. I welcome you, sir, and we are really looking forward to hearing your deliberations. Uh, you are on mute, sir. Kindly unmute yourself. Okay, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Priya, for those words. Uh, well, I... Uh, compliment Dr. Jyoti Bindal for organizing such a nice uh, program and thank you for roping me in also for this. Uh, as the time is uh, running on, I'll start with my presentation right away. I hope this is seen. Arun, can you put it on presentation mode, please? Yeah. Is it That's okay? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Now it's perfect. Well, uh, I can say that in this particular technology, I am eternally in love with. Uh, hysteroscopy is something really special for us gynecologists. 
because one thing is that it is an area where surgeons do not venture into and secondly we make a quality difference to our patients by offering them hysteroscopy and more so the office hysteroscope and today i shall be discussing the role of office hysteroscope in infertility well if you look back although people have tried hysteroscopy uh, since more than a century but uh, real regular hysteroscope came into being in our armamentarium in late 1970s and in 1997 johnson and johnson for the first time brought in an office hysteroscope although the office word is not uh, very appropriate i would uh, rather use the word ambulatory hysteroscopy because we may not perform the procedure inside an operation theater but i mean outside an operation theater but otherwise patient is mobile she walks out of the hospital within half an hour we do not use any anesthetic agents and that is the beauty of it well i am just showing you the differences what was before we had only hsg in before 1985 or 90 this was the picture people would suspect a polyp with a hysteroscope this would be seen uh endometrial hyperplasia direct vision and this is the picture on uh, hsg submucous fibroid this is how it is seen and all around the fibroid when the dye is there you may not find this kind of a picture Asherman syndrome we do suspect but sometimes even an air bubble also would show you this kind of picture well hysteroscope is an eye inside the uterus previously uterus was accessed by indirect methods like rubin's test hysterosalpingography ultrasound and dnc we had to perform an operate uh, laparotomy to operate inside the uterus cut the uterus to reach inside for a septum or submucous fibroid hysteroscopy changed all that in late 80s and it is an excellent equipment what are we doing uh, for infertility <coughs> we assess the cavity shape whether it is t shape a unicornute septate cavity dimensions long cavity versus short cavity because these have Uh, relevance to fertility filling defects like additions septum endometrium thickness color inflammation internal os assessment and cervical canal tortuosity and dimensions which will help us in et and iui the limitations of hysteroscopy were we needed to dilate the cervix and in infertile women the cervix used to be very fibrous and we used to traumatize the cervix a lot false passage was another issue we required general anesthesia which was another issue in perimenopausal age when uh, aub cases come up post operative pain and long term cervical fibrosis incompetence or false passage is all due to dilatation so the concept of office hysteroscope came up where we avoid the dilatation of cervix we avoid the anesthesia we negotiate the cervix under vision entire length of the cervix the beauty is patient herself can watch the procedure that really excites them and we can additionally use it in virgin patients where we do not put a speculum or hold the cervix incompetent cervix can be detected even uh, hysteroscopy guided et has been tried now this is just to give you a comparison this is the regular hysteroscope and this is the micro hysteroscope 2 mm this is 4 mm diameter and this is the sheath and here i have put a ball point pen refill just to show the comparison you can see the sheath diagnostic sheath is of the same dimension as that of a refill so this negotiates the cervical canal very easily without any pain to the patient this is just a video to show you you look at the cervix guide your scope through we are not holding the cervix neither are we dilating it is like playing the computer game you guide it across you turn it move it around get inside so there is no damage to the endometrium if you can look very closely you find pink color with white dots speckled dots and this is what my friend from pune has mentioned as a deer spot sign for the spotted deer sign for 
probable PCOS. Now here you can see those gland openings which are white and the pinkish color is of endometrium. You can see the cornu on one side, cornu on the other side. And there you can see a serpentine polyp lurking inside. So you can see almost proximal one centimeter of the uh, cornu. And then I generally do it in the uh, late proliferative phase to see a groove to see that the endometrium is growing well. And that will give me an idea about goodness of the endometrium. And while you are coming out, again, look at the internal os, look at the curve of the cervical canal that will help us in further instrumentation inside and get out. You can see a polyp, polyps do contribute to infertility. Here there is one on the posterior wall, another one on the interior wall. Many times people uh, tend to pull at the polyp, try and grasp it. Don't do that because you will only get a part of it. So you'll have to take it multiple times and still some tissue will be left behind hanging. So you cut it away from the base, flush with the uh, surrounding endometrium. It may take two minutes extra, but you will take out the entire polyp. Otherwise, a piecemeal polyp with partial remnant inside may happen. Here you can see we are slowly cutting it away. And then at the end of the procedure, we will pull it out. There is one limitation though that we have not dilated the cervix. And so when we are trying to negotiate the internal loss, sometimes polyp of larger size cannot be pulled through that. So sometimes it may break and you may bring it out piecemeal. Here you can see both the polyps have been cut and now we will catch hold of it. At this point of time, you have to stop the fluid in inflow so that you can easily pull it out. Otherwise it keeps on floating. And that is how, as you can see only partial polyp it, uh, we could bring out. So now the rest of it uh, is being pulled out. Submucous fibroid, you can detect them, but you cannot actually uh, operate on them with an office scope, but here, as you can see, the smaller polyps, I mean fibroid polyps, we can lift it. This is now the regular hysteroscope. And we try to avoid the current inside the uterine cavity as far as possible. And here we are manually lifting it and pulling it out. Escherman syndrome is one of the biggest uh, problem for us. Here you can see the cervix was a little bit fibrous, so we had to open the internal os. You can see there is a translucent area through which we will push the scissors, reach the cavity, and then guide our scope through that. You have to, sometimes you may have to cut at the internal os of this fibrosis to get an excess. This is under vision. If you pass, you can see the cornu well. If you try and pass a dilator through this, Pushing through sometimes may cause a false passage. Tubal cannulation has made a great change to our patients. Previously, we used to do corneal implantation and we used to feel sorry for our patients that she won't have much chance of uh, pregnancy, especially when I was a student, we didn't have IVF and we really used to feel sorry. Now with cannulation, it has become a daycare procedure can be repeated if needed and has a very good uh, carry home baby rate. And it is almost painless kind of a situation. With Here you can see there is arcuate type of uterus. So what we do is first we place the uh, catheter at the cornu and what we call that procedure is selective salpingography. So we are checking each tube individually. Here I am putting the tube on the right cornu and then pushing the dye. And then if this dye comes out through the femoral end, that means that this tube is patent. So it is in one tube at a time. We are not pushing the dye under pressure, which may sometimes traumatize the endometrium and endothelium of the tube if there is a block. Here you can see this tube is patent, although on HSG it was bilateral tubal block. 
so it was some debris there which caused the block because when we push uh, in hsg what happens uh, hsg or even in laparoscopic uh, tubal testing we put the cannula in the cervix and then distend the entire uterine cavity so only little bit of pressure see here the dye is coming back so the tube is blocked then we cannulate we pass a guide wire terumo guide wire and as you can see here the guide wire is inside the tube it has gone up to half of the tube generally 1 inch is enough once you take it out then push the dye and it is coming out freely so this kind of procedure sorry uh, even cervical incompetence when you do not dilate the cervix is not traumatized so when you are looking inside the cavity you are coming out and watching the internal os this is a very old video quality is poor but it can show what i want to convey as you can see here at 8 o'clock there is a definite trauma to the cervix and this will tell us about rpl for this patient possibility and this patient will require an internal os tightening when she is pregnant this is completely atrophic endometrium completely blanch this will also tell us that she has very poor chance of having a good pregnancy cervical stenosis is a very distressing uh, you can see here it is a laterally placed cervix we are guiding the scope inside and then as we saw in the previous video same thing will happen we may have to cut through the cervix Uh, internal loss to gain an access these are the right cases for hysteroscopy here my assistant was telling me sir this is a cornu i said no no we have seen the hysteroscope uh, ultrasound and she has good endometrium and so i was sure that we are not inside the cavity and i don't know why this is uh, again uh, repulled it seems anyway but basically under vision when you open the cervix it is better than blind dilator otherwise dilator might have gone in this area and damaged and made a false passage so on under vision you go right at the uh, internal os open it up you pass the scissors through and through bring it out in an open way to increase the dimension you may have to cut through also and get out tuberculosis is a very big problem in india and we can now with reasonable accuracy diagnose tuberculosis you can see multiple micro polyps this is very pathognomonic of cox endometrium as you can see small little polyps are there all around the endometrium you should do a tb pcr and make your diagnosis confirmed offer akt and only then treat her for the fertility all you can see such my brush border we can call it this is just to show you that even in unmarried girl a hysteroscopy can be a boon in this girl she had consulted four or five doctors she had intermenstrual bleeding and because she was unmarried nobody uh, tried to put in i mean uh, put in a speculum or anything they gave her various uh, hormones i suspected there might be intrauterine infection so i put in a hysteroscope and what i found was the cavity was normal but when i pulled it out i could see a large erosion on the cervix then through the hysteroscope only uh, i cauterized that cervix and she was fine as you can see i am coming out of the cervix and there is a very large erosion there and this was the cause of her intermenstrual spotting she was very distressed as a young girl and then it was a very simple job of just cauterizing that cervix here you can see this is a big problem of using dilators in infertility here you can see one would easily consider this as a cervix internal os but actual internal os is here as you can guide because this patient had undergone a hysteroscopic uh, surgery of eschermann syndrome the doctor had thought that this is all fibrosis but actual internal os was here 
and once we could do this even without anesthesia whereas the previous surgery was done under gi as you can see the good cavity is there endometrium is fine and that was the false passage because of the dilatation so this one has to be very conscious and i would suggest that if you do not find free passage of dilator use an ultrasound to pass your dilator otherwise you may traumatize now with increasing number of cesarean section we are getting more and more cases of isthmosis and isthmosis also contributes to infertility almost 40% of isthmosis lead to infertility here this is the internal os the cavity is seen and when we come out at you can see the groove at the level of internal os this is the cornu on the right side cavity is absolutely normal cornu on the left side and when we are withdrawing the scope on the anterior wall we will see the groove and that uh, gives us a diagnosis of isthmosis in this area we find that there is a groove inside and history of cesarean section makes us diagnose this is the isthmosis this is the internal loss so various uterine pathologies internal uh, cavity issues are diagnosed by hysteroscopy this is a new advance company has brought in recently this is truly in the office you do not need a camera or light source or anything it is in all inbuilt a simple procedure like this although the quality of picture may not be as good to show it in a conference but it gives you a functional uh, uh, picture so i would uh, end with one more issue and that is the role of hysteroscopy before ivf and bostils a uh, very prominent colleague from brussels has uh, performed a large systematic review and what he found one thing important was that hysteroscopy is in cycle just before third ivf attempt doubles the pregnancy rate in patients with at least two failed ivf attempts compared with starting ivf third ivf immediately and al tukhi in a large review of more than 1600 patients found that meta analysis demonstrated evidence of benefit from hysteroscopy in increasing the chance of pregnancy in subsequent ivf cycle and how hysteroscopy helps introduction of hysteroscope through the cervix facilitates future uh, et because the cervix has now opened up a little bit. it assesses the uterine cavity for subtle shape malformation such as arcuate or subarcuate uterus and measurement of uterine cavity length the knowledge of cavity shape and length could ease the embryo deposit at an optimal depth within the cavity and uterine instrumentation may cause some endometrial injury and provoke immunological reaction with release of cytokines and growth factors and influence the likelihood of implantation although there are some papers which do not agree with this but many papers are there which suggest that some inflammatory reaction in the cavity is helping in increasing the uh, success following uh, hysteroscopy so friends office hysteroscopy is a big deal you are avoiding the anesthesia you are avoiding the hospitalization patient can see the procedure herself it improves the accuracy sorry for cancer pick up also but which is not relevant today accurate diagnosis new diagnosis and procedures possible and it is very cost effective because you are saving the anesthesia and hospital stay so that significantly helps in cost efficacy thank you very much for patient listening even before you are a chairperson jump uh, let me jump in parul such a pleasure to hear you i'm hearing you after a long time and as always very crisp very up to date amazing thank you so much for agreeing to be here thank you madam yeah uh, i'm really fortunate to join in this conference at the uh, even uh, at the last minute 
because uh, I couldn't join. I was stuck in some emergency. I really enjoyed your uh, videos, uh, Parul sir. It was uh, really, really amazing. And uh, you have uh, clearly uh, informed us the benefits of office hysteroscopy, even uh, doing hysteroscopy before IVF, even though it is debatable. You have brought out some literature evidence that it can induce in plantation rate is increased. Thank you so much. It's my privilege to be a part of this conference. I should thank Jyoti Bindal, ma'am, who had given me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now with this, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our chairpersons and speakers for the scientific session three to share their time, knowledge, and uh, experiences with us. With this, I move to our next session for a scientific session four on recent advances in surgeries, enhancing safe practices. The scientific, uh, the chairpersons for this scientific session are Dr. Veera Lohia, ma'am, and Dr. Jagrati Nagar, ma'am. The topics which will be covered are newer energy device, uh, newer energy sources in gynec endoscopic surgeries by Dr. Manisha Shivasto, ma'am. Uh, pelvic organ prolapse is surgery the way with or without stress urine in uh, urinary incontinence by Dr. Girija Vag, ma'am. And safe operation theater protocols for obstetrics and gynecologic surgeons by Dr. Bindu K. S. ma'am. With this, I would first uh, introduce uh, Dr. Veera Lohia, who is Secretary of AMPOGS Association, Association of Madhya Pradesh Obstetric Society. She is also working as a director at Janak Hospital and executive member of IAEC Committee 2020-2022. She is associated with several associations like uh, in Gawalier Obstetric Clinic Society. Mayuri, Mayuri, we are already late, so let's... Uh, mm, uh, sure, ma'am. Oh, as as uh, for your ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So our uh, next chairperson is Dr. Chagriti Nagar, man, uh, ma'am, who is designate associate professor, and she is also associated with various associations and serving as a secretary at Sagar Obstetrics and Gynecology Society. And with this, I would request our uh, chairpersons to kindly introduce and welcome our speakers for the session. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. I think Dr. Jagrati wants the, wanted to introduce the first speaker. Is she there? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, first, first of all, I congratulate Dr. Jyoti Vindal, madam, for organizing this huge national conference. Madam is teachers of teachers with great vision. Thank you so much, madam, for giving me this opportunity to participate in this prestigious platform. And now I welcome Dr. Manisha Shivasto. She is gem of Gandhi Medical College. She is my senior, and it's my proud privilege to introduce her. She is pioneer, renowned laparoscopic surgeon of Madhya Pradesh. She is a great surgeon as well as very uh, humble and kind-hearted, to uh, always ready to teach. And she performed many live laparoscopic workshops in various medical colleges of all over Madhya Pradesh. So now I welcome Dr. Manisha Sivasto. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, Hello. Thank you, Dr. Jagrati, for a very kind introduction and uh, my sharing the screen. Dr. Mayuri? Yes, ma'am. So, ma'am, uh, if you can see, share screen below. Yeah, I, I did share the screen, I think. Yeah, you tried it yeah, uh, like today morning also. So same way. Share screen, entire screen, and yeah. then share. Uh, is it seen now? I no, ma'am. No. no. I, I just not sure. Yeah, now? it has started sharing screen. Yes, ma'am, we can see it perfectly. Okay. Please go. Let's see it. Uh, so Mayuri at the very outset had told me, Madam, it has to be crisp 12 minute lecture. Uh, so I would start with the uh, energy sources, which has revolutionized the whole concept of uh, laparoscopic surgery. And uh, to begin with, Say something bariatric surgery coming. 
So we've come a long way from. Uh, I don't know. Need any help, ma'am? As uh, so some issue, there's something something else started play, playing. Is it? Are you are you all able to see it? No, you have stopped sharing, ma'am. If you can email now, or WhatsApp me so I can present it from my. No, we are not able to see it. Not yet. Start. Yeah, now, it has started sharing. It has started sharing okay. from thermal cautery to radio frequency yeah. generators. So uh, we've if come a long way from thermal cautery to radio frequency generators. And uh, I can. You Can want to make it slide show? Minute. I'm Nietzsche and a slide show. Honey, won't you? Now I think we should be good. Is that, am I now? Now it's better? Uh, two Maybe prime sources. Just... No, ma'am. It is still not in slideshow, but we can move ahead. Uh, it's clearly seen. You can yeah. see it now. Right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. So we have two prime sources, right? We'll be discussing one regular cautery machine, which we all say now, but we no longer deal with cautery machines. We now speak, we now we have our radio frequency generators, which essentially means the current which comes on the wall, which is essentially around 10 megahertz is transformed into something like 50 to 150,000 cycles per second high frequency, which is supersonic frequency that makes the current very precise. That is what is meant by this modern electrosurgical generators or radio frequency energy. The second energy source which we will talk on is about ultrasonic energy, very commonly spoken to as harmonic or uh, the ultrascale, etc. So let us understand this whole concept of radio frequency generators. Our normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. At 37, nothing happens to the tissues. When we use radio frequency in the tissue contact, the, the thermal, the temperature starts rising. This, once it attains around 60 to 90 degrees, starts the process of desiccation or coagulation at the level of cells. By desiccation, we means the cellular water has to dry up. By coagulation, we means that the protein has to turn into a coagulum. Only then we attain something like a seed, which is what we achieve, want to achieve, which is hemostasis. So this process starts between 60 and 90 degrees Celsius. Beyond which further, once we have sealed, we want to cut. Cutting means we need vaporization. That means now we will be having a very precise current, which is going to cut this dried on tissue. And this, this effect or this tissue effect is achieved at somewhere around 100 degrees Celsius. Beyond this, if we continue to activate the tissue temperature further rises and this is attaining, now this leaves the tissue to actually slightly brown color. We often see it during, during our electrosurgeries. This is not a desirable effect. We should be avoiding it. Beyond that, also we tend to continue the application. It leads to carbonization or SR formation and blackening of the tissue. This is a very high impedance tissue actually, SR. And if we continue to desiccate it further, what happens is excessive thermal strain. So by and large, if we have to understand one thing, we should stop our electrosurgery at the level of vaporization. Continuing beyond that causes tissue damage. And continuing beyond that is only damage. There is no thermal, there is no desirable clinical effect in that. Next, we have to understand our generator. Now, usually these cautery people come and they will tell us, Madam, is me effect hai, say cut ho jata hai, harmonic jasa and all that stuff. But we let us not get carried away what the sales representatives say, but let us understand the basic principle of electrosurgery. Now, here we know that we have a yellow thing which is cut and a blue thing which is quad. Never should never it happens that the current comes in a continuous wave. It is always in pulses. Now it is these pulses which determine the tissue effect. And in one pulse, how much frequency is involved 
determines the precision of your current. So we actually decide we need two things, precision and the thermal effect. Now the modern electrosurgical generators or radio frequency generators have, have achieved this effect of packing very high frequency and widespread pulses. This is what is called as current modulation. And therefore, now we are able to even cut with those bipolar graspers. If you see these radio frequency lab bisect or lab bipolar graspers, which are used sometimes called as vessel sealers or cutters, etc. All this is a play of blending your pulses and frequency in blend one, two, three, four, whatever you want. Now, whenever you want a balance between very high precise current which will require a lot of pulses, very high frequency pulses, but spaced widely. This is very commonly used in hysteroscopic myomectomies or hysteroscopic resection where your electrode is very small. You want very precise and very high voltage current. That means a very high modulated current in a very precise form. Secondly, sometimes when you want to seal a tissue only, you want a very high voltage, but you don't want a very high pulsed current because you don't desire the effect of vaporization and cutting more, but you require a slow cooking of the vessel. Then it is usually 40, 60 or 25, 75, which means that 25% very high voltage current, but the off time is more. Off time actually helps us in coagulating. Too much frequency, very high frequency packed current will give you cutting effect more than coagulation. So this is what is meant by blends and we need to understand our generators very well so as to use them efficaciously for the desired tissue effect. Now suppose I'm going to do a fimbriolysis or a salpingo ovariolysis. I cannot use the same effect and the same program as when I'm doing a total laparoscopic hysterectomy. Whatever is the program set by the company is irrelevant. Let me go to the generator. Let me decide what effect I want, what kind of tissue I am going to handle. After chromoperturbation or after some high hysteroscopy, the tissue may be wet. The kind of current it will need will be very different. And therefore, I will actually decide on a current which is very, which is like 50-50. Which is like very high frequency, very precise current with huge modulation and big pulses wide apart. This will give me a very desired and good effect when I'm doing any salpingo variolysis or a adhesiolysis. Whereas when I'm going a, doing a TLH, I would be happy with blend 3. 25% of the coagulation and rest is off. So this is what is meant by current modulation, which modern electrosurgical generators have achieved. Now, the art of electrosurgery is basically four factors. The type of electrode, that means the type of your grasper, whether you're using a fenestrated grasper or an electrode which is tipped, or you're using a solid grasper, that is very important. Second is what tissue we are using. We are using vessels, we are going on ligaments, we are going on some kind of fat or momentum. This tissue factor is equally important. And then comes what is the power setting for the desired, uh, for the desired uh, surgery. And most important is the dwell time or the application time. We'll understand all this with the help of an example. You know, we are doing a TLH as a beginner on a very thin patient. This thin patient has nothing. When the moment I manipulate the uterus, I see the ureter traversing back and the ligament, the uterosacral going down. It's a clean cut, simple hysterectomy. I use harmonic zip zap, the hysterectomy is finished. But patient comes to me with a leaking urine at day 14, which is delayed thermal damage, usually a ureteric injury. Now, in a very thin patient, you know, there is hardly any tissue impedance. The application time is very important. The direction where your probe is pointing is extremely important. And what power have you used is important. But what has played the maximum role in such a patient is the kind of tissue. Obese patient on the infant, in, on the contrary, are less prone for thermal, less prone for thermal damage because fat is a tissue of very high impedance. So these are four factors which are extremely important, and one factor that enhances the safety of uh, electrosurgery is dwell time, shorter tissue bites and shorter delt application time, irrespective of the grasper, will will be a safe surgery or a safe electrosurgery. Like even if I 
touch the ureter with bipolar grasper. But if it's for a fraction of a second, it will not cause any problem or any injury. Whereas one centimeter from the ureter, if I have held on the uterine with less traction and given a bipolar zap for almost 30 seconds till the auto stop is uh, auto stop starts from the generator, then this is liable to cause thermal damage. So one factor amongst all these two, all these four, which is most important is the application time. If the application time is minimum, the surgery is very, electrosurgery is very safe. Now, what can seal what? Basically, what is the aim of a vessel sealer or harmonic or ultrasonic scalpel? The aim is actually to form a coagulum or an SR that seals the blood vessel beyond the supra-physiological bursting pressures. By bursting pressure, it is mean by, meant that our normal blood pressure systolic is 120, double the systolic, that is 240. At 240 pressures also, none of these coagulum or SR should open up. That is what is the desired effect. And that is what companies standardize all electrosurgical sources to. But then there is one famous thing. No? This particular vessel will uh, vessel sealer or bipolar grasper or bi clamp will seal 7 millimeter dia vessel. And that's a myth. It's not like that. Essentially, because, you know, not all 7 mm tissues or uh, blood vessels will have same kind of tissue characteristics. Suppose there is a patient with a 7 mm or 4 mm blood vessel, there is no problem. But she is 72 years old, atherosclerotic patient, has thrombosed and very hard calcific blood vessels. You do a bipolar desiccation, you see this very thin artery going on. There is no protein in it, there is no tunica media, therefore no collagen. Everything is hard and calcified. This vessel will bleed with bipolar also at times. Tissue of what kind of tissue the vessel is composed of is extremely important. Now let us come to another patient who is around 40-45 years old, having huge fibroids. She has got a blood vessel of around 5 to 6 millimeter uterine artery. This is a tortuous blood vessel, very thin, kind of gelatinized, right? You, this is what is called as arterialization of veins also when they are up supplying a huge tumor belt for a very long time. So these are low impedance blood vessels. Now you try and desiccate it with a bipolar grasper or a vessel sealer or a radio frequency generator. It sticks. These have very less collagen in their tunica media. So therefore, we have to understand the tissue characteristic more importantly rather than a diameter of vessel that because this particular sealer will uh, des uh, desiccate or coagulate this side vessel, uh, this size vessels, and not beyond that, and not less lesser than that. I've should I've told you two examples where all these vessel sealers will fail. You essentially have to suture these vessels. However, all these come with a tissue feedback mechanism. Now, tissue feedback mechanism means the generator actually auto adjusts the current output depending on what kind of tissue is left. So when it starts, it is essentially a lot of vapor uh, desiccation happens. Once it dries up, it turns the protein into a coagulum. And moment the coagulum is formed, the tissue generator senses that this tissue is not apt for further electrosurgery and it stops. That is what is meant by uh, auto, auto stop mechanism, which actually senses the tissue. However, it is, it is okay for smaller blood vessels or simple tissues, but we need to understand the kind of tissue that the blood vessel is composed of before using any kind of energy source, be it harmonic, be it electros radio frequency generator. So this is what is meant by the tissue feedback mechanisms. Never go by simply the sealer effects, but always understand the tissues and your electrode well. This is what is the take home message from this particular slide. Now we come to ultrasonic energy. Basically, ultrasonic energy is electrical energy, stimulating the piezoelectric crystal in the handpiece, generating ultrasonic energy. This ultrasonic energy actually makes your prongs or uh, probe vibrate at a very high frequency, generating mechanical energy. That mechanical energy, like 1 lakh 50,000 seconds cycles per second or 50,000 cycles per second, again, supersonic basically leads to thermal energy, which eventually gives us the desired tissue effect. 
Now, what is the difference or an advantage of ultrasonic energy over the rest? It gives us a desired tissue effect at a low, lower temperature. Now, the sealing effect or the cutting effect for radio frequency generators, which is achieved, modern radio frequency generators, which is achieved at around 100 degrees Celsius, ultrasonic scalpel will give it us to at, give, a, give it to us at 70 degrees Celsius. Therefore, there is less tissue damage, certainly but definitely not beyond the application time. Just because it's a harmonic, it will go on and on and on and you will not have any thermal damage. It is not like that. It will still cause thermal damage. However, we cannot form SR in ultrasonic energy. It stops at the level of carbonization, uh, caramelization itself. So when you use an ultrasonic energy for a very long time, once it browns up, you know, it does not lead you it does not allow you to operate further smoothly. You are bound to stop it. It's like that. The drawback with ultrasonic energy is that it has highest residual heat. Now, if you're using an ultrasonic shearer or a scalpel, it is warm even after the application is over for a very long time. That is also very important. And uh, so if you touch the bowel or a bladder surface or anything, you're bound to have thermal injuries later on. But then again, it's also dependent on the application time. So there is highest multiplicity of the use. That means it can, there are uh, there is a lot of uh, multiplicity means you can use it as a dissector or a bisector also, and with judicious use you can use it on vessels also. But it demands high level of caution in movements. You have to be very careful about the movement because it's vibrating very high and it can damage anywhere else if your economy if your movements are not precise. Now, this is a video, small video. There are only two minutes left, which actually tells us how efficaciously we can use a harmonic. Now, this is an unedited video of a bladder dissection. If you see, no energy source is efficacious if whether it is ultrasonic, whether it is laser or whether it is radio frequency, if you have not given the right traction. So a loose hanging tissue is never going to take a precise current, however precise our generator is. Secondly, if we are not giving enough traction, the current delivery is also not efficacious. Now, if you see these bubbles or champagne effect, which we all call, this is something very, very basic. This actually and pneumoperitoneum aids into the dissection. If you see this, Another thing that we have to take care is when if this is the, the shearer prong, we should never have any, any tissue in the hinge, whether it is a bipolar grasper, whether it is a radio frequency grasper or any grasper or a hysteroscopic scissors. The hinge should never have any tissue. If the hinge has the tissue, it does not get desiccated, it bleeds and the instruments also get spoiled very easily. So this is actually a densely adherent bladder, which is not appearing. It's appearing very smooth precisely because you see the amount of tissue that is taken in the grasper, hardly any, very little tissue, very fine, very fast. Now, this is again the same a gross tissue being handled by ultrasonic scalpel. And this is what is caramelization. Beyond this, you should never operate causes more necrosis and the desert. Now, this is a bipolar. You have, we need to stop. We need to stop the moment we see the white thing and the moment bubbles stop. That's it. Rest we will cut. So, key to the success of uh, a good electrosurgery is not just the device, but also the traction. So if you see everything is going well, precisely because there is good traction and very small bites of tissues. So this is the right way to take the tissue not like this. You should never take it like this. Always like this. Never like this. Always like this. This is the right way to create, take the tissue in your grasper. And this is the way 
to use the instrument with huge amount of safety. Now, this is a precise cutting where I've actually modulated the current tremendously. This is a hysteroscopic myomectomy. The probe is totally different. We cannot use the same setting as we use in TLH in this patient. We'll have to have, because the electrode is different, the kind of tissue that I'm going to cut is different. It is not a polyp, it's a fibroid. So I need good coagulation. That means very high voltage, very high modulation because the electrode is very small and the current has to be very precise. Therefore, I will use a very high effect also. Therefore, the pulses will increase. So if you see in these electrosurgical units, modern ones, you will always have, there is one, effect, there is one function called as effect. So the, if, if the moment you increase the effect, we actually increase the pulses packed in a particular time, small, very high pulses. So this is what is called as current, um, current modulation and that gives a very precise cut. So if you see this precise cuts in hysteroscopic myomectomy, a very clean thing. So... If we have to conclude, we have to see this, understand that magic is in the hand and it's not in the van. So again, I would emphasize that whatever electrosurgical unit we are using, it is most important that we use it with maximum amount of uh, care, tissue respect and the kind of electrode that we are using and power settings. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'm ready to take that. Jagrati, ma'am, would you like to uh, speak with uh, Dr. Manisha? Dr. Veera, ma'am, I think Jagrati, ma'am, has dropped off. My okay. Thank you, Dr. Manisha. You have rightly said that the no energy source is safe. Uh, without judicious use and very elaborately you have uh, spoken. Thank you so much. I think uh, we'll take the questions later on. We are running short of time. Is it uh, right, Dr. Bayuri? Yes, ma'am. We are I, running half an hour. I'm thankful to Dr. Bindal uh, for organizing such a uh, nice uh, this uh, webinar. And um, I'm happy to introduce the next speaker. Uh, she is a very fine doctor and teacher uh, and a very, um, I have whom I have come to know recently in one or two years. So, um, I welcome Dr. Girjava, and she's professor um, uh, in Bharti Vidya Peet and senior consultant also in Cloud Nine. Faculty Professor Ogash, which is an international expert committee general, uh, 2018, chairman of medical disorder committee in uh, of Foxy 2012 to. 16. Vice President, India Chapter, Justices, uh, 2014. Also, ma Member of Governing Council, ICOG, 2011-14. Joint Nas National Secretary, FOXI, 2010. Assistant Coordinator, National Eclampsia Registry, 2006. I think that is 8 or 6. Regional Director, Study, MEDIC. And uh, she has received award of Anandi Bal Joshi Award for Excellence in Medical Services. And she is really a good teacher at par. Welcome, Dr. Girjavak. She is, will be taking uh, pelvic organ prolapse. Is surgery uh, necessary or not with or without stress it continues? Welcome, ma'am. Hello, Dr. Veera. Thank you for that Hi. very, very kind introduction. And uh, I have been given a task of uh, talking about um, uh, pelvic organ prolapse and its preferences. I don't know what's happened here. Any help yeah. you need, ma'am, from my end? No, no, no. I have just done the unlocking. It was asking for a lock. Okay. And uh, uh, I just wanted to know whether my uh, screen is seen. Not yet. No. Not, Not yet. yet. Not yet. So I just uh, entire screen share I can do, I guess. And ma'am, share screen, then entire screen, and then share. Like in that entire screen I have tapped. And then share are out, and then blue color. Haan, share out, yeah. Haan. And then select your phone. I'm going to make it zoom. Ma'am, it's zoom. Ma'am, it's zoom. 
जूम का नहीं है रे इतना ये वेबिनार है ना मैम तो कैन यू सी द स्क्रीन नाउ नॉट यट नो नो नॉट यट तो फिर क्या करना है अभी आई डन ऑल द थिंग्स दैट यू टोल्ड मी आपने स्क्रीन पे क्लिक करके शेयर पे क्लिक कर दिया ओ या आ सो योर पीपीटी हां इट हैज नो नो इट्स इट हैज नॉट इट कैन यू प्लीज स्टॉप शेयर एंड रीशेयर मैम समटाइम्स द नेटवर्क इश्यूज how do i stop share there is nothing like stop share here because it's not shared so there will be no stop share to aapko niche fir se share screen ka button dikh raha hai green color ha dabaya na maine abhi dusra share bhi dala ha abhi usko uske baad mein screen ko leke share kijiye not nothing is happening it's saying please grant browser access to screen recording uh, sora if you can interfere uh, ma'am so aap uh, uh, laptop wahan pe jo aa raha hai settings open karne ke liye सेटिंग्स ओपन करने का इस जस्ट सेइंग लर्न मोर हम्म ये संकली कर लर्न मोर तो इस सेइंग मैक्सिमम पार्टिसिपेंट्स डिस्प्लेड ओके सो मैम यू हैव टू गो ऑन सेटिंग्स सिस्टम सेटिंग्स वो किया ना मैंने मैंने अनलॉक किया वो मैम इफ यू कैन ईमेल मी और व्हाट्सएप में द पीपीटी आई कैन प्रेजेंट इट फ्रॉम माय व्हाट्सएप आई कांट बिकॉज़ इट्स नॉट ईमेल 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 आई कैन लेट मी चेक I, I think just... I'll just get out of this meeting and reconnect again. No, ma'am. Actually, you have to grant the access of sharing a screen. You are using my Mac laptop. Yeah, it's Mac. Yes. So you have to uh, go on access settings. No, well, sub. Uh, see, this is not the first time I am using Mac only all my life. Okay, ma'am. So just share the PPT on me. Ma'am, I have just WhatsApp you my email ID. If you can email me, please. Me not uh, WhatsApp please. No no email email I have emailed मतलब I have emailed you uh, because WhatsApp right you my email ID हाँ. No I have not got any email ID from you yet. Uh, in WhatsApp okay I will email you hi okay. You said email now you are saying WhatsApp. नहीं I have WhatsApp you my email ID so I will just do it right. You WhatsApp. WhatsApp को access नहीं है मेरे इसके ऊपर लेना पड़ेगा जानी that's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay okay. email has just sent me no there is no email as yet you please dictate me your uh, thing mayuri.keskar kya hai tumhara ha ha mayuri.keskar at tc4a.com tc4a c for tiger c for cat for numerical a for app yes जस्ट चेक मयूरी आया क्या आपके पास नहीं मैं रिफ्रेश करती हूँ I'm so sorry for this. Ah, uh, doesn't matter. It's just little hiccup. The audience has to bear this. <laughs> just refreshing so that I can see. Yes, ma'am. Received. I'm downloading it. So, 
Dr. Gerja, you can start uh, speaking something so that uh, while she is loading. So by the time uh, the today's uh, talk is basically we are speaking about the you know the approach for pelvic organ prolapse with or without SUI, whether surgery is already always needed. And if you see that with the increasing lifespan of women and increase in obesity, a lot of women are today suffering from this illness where they don't want to undergo a surgery essentially. And therefore, we have to now start looking at our practices in a different way where we'll be able to offer women a better lifestyle, a better quality of life without offering them surgery all the time. Now, for this, it's very important to always, you know, uh, uh, if you look at the pelvic organ prolapse, it's not only the gynecologists who are in place. We also have the urologist. And now a special branch of urogynecology is coming up where there is a lot of awareness about this understanding of women. And therefore, we as OBGY, as gynae specialists, we should be aware of these issues a little more. Because as much as we understand the pelvic floor, I feel many do not. And taking this as an advantage, our advices also have to the patient have to be correct because it's not always that surgery is an answer. There can be so many non-surgical approaches that are now going to be useful for women. And that awareness is there. And that is what I'm going to be speaking in the next 12 minutes when my presentation gets projected by my dear Mayuri. So till that time, uh, things have come up like, you know, uh, various methods are there for scoring these things as to really what are you looking at? whether uh, the patient really has symptoms or not. Sometimes they, by fear, that somebody who is instilling fear in their minds that, you know, this is happening because, and this may later turn into such a problem. And as we understand, when we speak to all kinds of experienced, proficient urogynecologists, they'll always say that this is not an emergency disorder. You can always give some time and give some proper, uh, you know, attention to these women and then take. So the question is, is surgery the way with or without SUI? So next question, please. Next slide. So we all know that pop and stress urinary incontinence are common problems that impact millions of women globally. Next slide. And we also have to understand to classify it properly. Next slide. We have been shown the pop -Q system for quite some time and all of us found it very, very difficult. But there are now ways in which we can approach this particular classification quantitatively because that will give us a targeted approach for the therapies that we can use in these patients. Next slide, please. And there are, you know, usually there is a wonderful form which you can just download from the net and do this classification in a grid-wise format. And next slide, please. There are also instructions which are very, very easy. And this is how the pelvic organ prolapse is notified and mentioned and quantified with the, uh, this particular classification. Next slide. Where we use the specific points such as A, B, P and so on. And they, we take it from the context of the hymen. And that's how it tells us about even the perineal floor and the vaginal length and what exactly we can be doing. Next slide. And this is a wonderful algorithm. And this is something which I think that we all should have at, in our armamentarium, which very specifically tells us how to go and measure this POPQ and how to apply it in the POPQ system. Next slide. And there is a simplified POPQ, which has now been available and proposed, especially by our urogynecology clinics, which talks about stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. And believe me, friends, all these stages of uh, this um, uh, POP as well as SU absence or presence can be targeted or can be dealt with non-surgical approach. Next slide. So this is how you would do an initial management of a urinary continence in women where a proper history is taken. Many times we all have experience of diagnosing diabetes because women had a lot of urinary incontinence and may sometimes it can be a urinary tract infection do a proper clinical assessment of the patient to find out whether she's suffering from atrophy, menopausal transition, what is her quality of life, whether she is doing physical activity or not, and how much this particular problem is affecting her day-to-day -day life. And then make your diagnosis, whether it's a stress incontinence, mean six incontinence, or whether it is an overactive bladder with or without urgency incontinence. And then you look at management where 
the mainstay comes from lifestyle management pelvic flow muscle training for suir oab bladder retain uh, retraining for oab and you can consider using duralexithin especially if there is sui or maybe anti muscarinic agents and these can act as adjuncts and there are so many other ways also in which you can uh, deal with this and then consider doing some special tests if necessary and do a specialized management in accordance next slide please so efficacy of treatment can be assessed and that is very important by examining the incontinence episode frequency each week so you can quantify it incontinence quality of life questionnaire is there it is val validated questionnaire present on the google patient global impression of improvement is important that will tell us that there is satisfaction and mean time between voids is also important to identify so whenever like even in my practice i see simple thing like hyperemesis gravidarum if you put them through a puke score many of the times you are able to deal with it because today patients demand a little more quantitative assessment of their problems otherwise it is a lot of times covered by a lot of anxiety and fear so the moment you put them through these quantifications and analyze it then you are also able to offer them proper care and then they are also satisfied that there is some improvement next slide so what are the various non surgical treatment options that we have we have pelvic floor exercises we have behavioral modifications we can consider continuous support devices and there can be urethral inserts next slide please so what is very important is we must do a thorough pre treatment evaluation lack of urethral sphincter function is known as intrinsic sphincter deficiency that is isd which may be present with a hypermobile or a fixed or a non mobile urethra and it may be caused by neuromuscular damage or trauma including a prior surgery sometimes she the patient must have undergone a surgery for pop or sui or even at the time of delivery this can happen and the sphincter can no longer coapt and incontinence therefore may be severe in these patients next slide please and isd it's very important to do a urodynamic evaluation typically demonstrates either low maximal urethral closure pressure or low leak point pressures and initial treatment of sui should include a review of comorbidities and medications that may be aggravating such a condition use of diuretics many times patients may be taking for anti hypertensive medicines narcotics anti histaminics and anti cholinergic medications which are known to exaggerate these symptoms next slide please so when we look at the basis of treatment of sui it involves increasing the urethral closure pressure by correcting the hypermobility lengthening and strengthening the urethral support to enhance the intrinsic urethral closure mechanism and the hypothesis that elevated serotonin and noradrenal levels in onof's nucleus you can see it in the picture here on the end here the onof's nucleus which would uh, stimulate the urethral sphincter has been confirmed by experimental understanding next slide please and therefore the use of duralexithin has been proposed where noradrenaline and serotonin reuptake inhibitor it increases the synaptic concentrations of both mediators at the onof's nucleus and conversely it minimally affects postsynaptic dopaminergic receptors it causes pudendal nerve stimulation and improves the tone of the sphincter urethra effects that significantly increase the urethral pressure in women with sui and therefore this can be one of those treatments when you are finding that sui seems to be because of an isd next slide please another important thing is lifestyle modifications it's something which can also be documented and categorized where we are talking of weight loss because it is known to help decrease the symptoms reducing consumption of beverage that contain alcohol caffeine and carbonation as well as limiting consumption of excess amounts of fluid that is more than 64 ounces of liquids daily managing constipation because that can contribute and quitting smoking can help alleviate or reduce symptoms and remember indian women may not smoke but they may be using a lot of smokeless tobacco which also needs to be investigated and improvised upon next slide please and kegels exercise much has been spoken about it but this is to be practiced diligently so these are voluntary contractions of the pelvic floor muscles done regularly and with a proper technique say have been shown to give a successful man uh, management to sui and this can be taken as a supervised pelvic physical therapy with the use of biofeedback or the use of vaginal weighted cones which are placed in the vagina 
and held in place while contacting the pelvic floor can also improve the symptoms and most importantly they can be done in any location like while you're sitting in your chair while you're working at the kitchen while you're doing anything you can continue doing the kegels exercises and then on an average ideally they should be performed at least for 100 to 150 times in a day to be able to give her good results so just doing it arbitrarily doesn't help it has to be done in a quantified way next slide please <coughs> so these are the kegels exercise and they are important not for the woman only but even for a man because as you can see here in the picture what happens is the sphincter muscle doesn't contract adequately nor does the strong pelvic floor muscles they are all weakened up and therefore the woman will have these leakages so if you are able to you know sort of start off this earlier or even when the symptoms arise they can be remarkable results and you can encourage women from pregnancy itself when there is laxity or especially after birth women should be encouraged to start taking this kegels exercise because they'll prevent or control urinary continence and also it would be of great use even in men next slide please now pessaries has been shown to be successful about 50 percent of the time and this is one thing which is not very readily accessible in our community this is because we as gynecologists are not promoting it readily and therefore it's not very easily available now it's been found through evidence that 50 percent of the time you can restore the pelvic floor architecture and functionality by using the appropriate pessaries now this success with pessaries tend to be in patients whose sui is related to specific activities who can use a pessary to resume the activities without leaking urine there are various ones which are available and you can see here the various kinds of pessaries that have been kept in most of them the commonest one which is available in india is unfortunately only the ring pessary but we can always order these pessaries and guide our patients to use them next slide so these are how the pessaries are usually of help because they support now you can see that is even in the first and the second degree uterovaginal prolapses a pessary can be of help or especially there are some specific ones which can be called as the gehren pessary which will be especially of help for cystocele which can be used or when patients have a mild cystocele we can consider using the hodge pessary this was the most you know the basic first pessary which had come into being you can consider using a space occupying pessary which will dilate the vagina and hold the entire organs up or you can consider using a donut pessary around the cervix or there can be the gelhorn pessary which would act not only to prevent stress urinary incontinence but also the pelvic organ prolapse and you can also see that third degree uterovaginal prolapse as can also be corrected by using these non-surgical approaches. Next slide, please. Now, atrophy is one of the important things that you must see and rule out in this patient because when SUI is associated with general atrophy, local estrogen treatment has been shown to improve symptoms and it may take up to 12 weeks for patients to notice a benefit. So we as doctors and patients, as patients have to be patient till the action comes in. While several other medications have been evaluated for specific treatment of SUI, there are currently no FDA approved drugs for this particular purpose. Next slide, please. So how can we use this estrogen? Conjugated equine estrogen, the primarine cream can be used uh, one gram vaginally three times in a, a week or estradiol valerate that is the estress cream two milligrams per gram one gram vaginally thrice in a week or estradiol vaginal rings can be used. These are not very easily available in our country or vaginal cream of estradiol twice in a week or estradiol vaginal tablets, another thing, Vagifame, which is, you know, very sparingly available, can be used. So these are the various, and this have been recommended from 2004, but probably the availability in our country is not up to the mark. Next slide, please. And then there are other ways, like injection. There can be bulking agents, which can be put in the proximal periurethral tissue, either transurethrally or periurethrally. You can see here in the picture that a needle has been passed through the urethra through a small little scope wherein you can just inject it and it can also be used in genuine stress urinary incontinence in women in whom operative interventions may be hazardous or this can be second line therapy after surgery has failed or when incontinence persists with a non-mobile bladder neck so cure rates would vary depending on the indication differences in injection techniques 
types of material used, length of follow-up, and type of incontinence treated. Next slide, please. And this is how it is used. How do they act? The mechanism of action for bulking agents in the treatment of recurrent stress SUI is following. The failure of MUS has been shown here. Injection of polyacrylamide hydrogel into three sites in the urethral wall results in coaptation. And the ultrasound scan is showing two or three depots, as well as you can see the position of the original MUS, which has been left in place. So even after the surgery has failed, we still can restore her, in, her continence by giving this PAG injections. Next slide, please. So these are the typical algorithms which you have to follow. So you should ask the patient whether she really has a bothersome leakage. Because I had recently, you know, there's a lot of advertisement that we do about pelvic floor and rejuvenation. Sometimes patients come scared asking, doctor, am I suffering from this? Am I really going to go into problems? We should be carefully telling them about lifestyle advice. Then we should give them pelvic floor muscle training, medical treatments, vaginal devices. And if none of these are going to be effective or not going to work for her, then of course we can consider doing surgery. Now, there are various kinds of surgical approaches that we can consider. This is not the type of my talk, but what is important is whenever we are talking to the patient, you should ask her to take a calculated decision. That's one. Secondly, you must also tell her that since your pelvic floor is into a dynamic atrophy and it is going into a degenerative phase, your results will depend entirely on how your body is going to respond. And therefore, there can be a need of a revision surgery maybe after five or 10 years. And that assurance always has to be given for even medical line of management. Next slide, please. And despite this, if the patient still continue to have other symptoms, then surgery is an answer. Thank you so much for a patient hearing and this wonderful opportunity. And I'm sorry that my connectivity was an issue. If there are any uh -huh. questions, you can answer. Thank you, Dr. Girja. We'll uh, wait for the questions in, in the end. But uh, this was quite insightful into the topic. And uh, there's a uh, uh, what difference do urogynic uh, make? Uh, uh, what uh, I mean, how different they are from the gynec? But, uh, where do we stop and where they uh, come in to operate? See, actually, you no, know, I would suggest that unless and until there is a, uh, you know, something like a fistula or something like an injury, or maybe, you know, your primary treatments have failed, then only a urogynecology should come in. And that too, it should be in tandem. You can't, because prolapses and all, if it is an associated POP, then you would be a better person to repair them. Yeah, yeah. But with the stress incontinence, they are doing colpo suspension, laparoscopic and all abdominal also. So do you think they must go to the urogynec person or uh, the... Uh, we should uh, continue doing joint care yeah joint okay thank you so much uh, very elaborate talk and uh, the, so many logarithms we have to go through uh, thank you so much so now, uh, now Dr. Jagriti is there to call the third uh, speaker Mayuri I'm just checking ma'am uh -huh. no, ma okay, okay yeah. then I'll introduce Dr. Bindu KS and uh, she is a consultant at Apollo Hospital, Navi Mumbai. Also is member of Foxy, Amogs and IMS Society. She has served as clinical uh, secretary and honorary treasurer Amogs. Long list of awards and uh, silver medal for best paper presentation in 22nd Kerala Conference. Third prize for case presentation in 11th Amogs Annual Conference. <laughs> Mank Parihar Award for Best Committee Member 2011 to 15, WHO Certified Trainer for Adolescent Health Services, Guinea's Record Holder also for participating in long, largest cervical screening held at Fortis, first prize in power presentation in Adolescent Storm and Stress in Foxy National Adolescent Conference, and has been faculty in various national, and zonal, and regional conferences. So I, I invite Dr. Bindu. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for the kind introduction. So, uh, is uh, are my slides visible? Yeah, it's yeah, not. yeah. So, if you can make it in the reading. yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, actually, I'm the last uh, batsman batting, but sometimes last batsman do, uh, does wonders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. All know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
also uh, this is a very important topic uh, where we like everybody wants to be a safe surgeon isn't it so we should follow certain theater protocols which can be i am just giving a brief outline of what protocols can be followed to make our surgery safe to make ourselves safe and also the patient safe so coming to the introduction the institute of medicine report to err is human uh, building a safer health system notes that errors in healthcare are a significant cause of health death and injury and the canadian adverse event study found 185000 admissions to acute care hospitals were associated with an adverse event and up to 70000 were potentially preventable almost 1 in 10 patients admitted to hospital experience an adverse event with surgeries accounting for the 40% so we as obstetricians and gynecologists should adopt and develop safe practices that reduce the likelihood of system failures and co that cause adverse outcomes now coming to the patient safety objectives what is the culture which we can adopt we should develop a commitment to encourage a culture of patient safety implement recommended safe medication practices we should be able to reduce the likelihood of surgical errors i'll be coming in detail how to do that and improve the communication with among ourselves with the healthcare providers that is the staff our co consultants co surgeons and the nursing staff and you should improve the communication with patients because communication errors are the most commonest cause for surgical errors you should be able to establish a partnership with patients to improve the safety so when we talk to a patient in opd or outpatient department or after admission in the ward about the surgery describe to her the details of the surgery what are the risk the benefits the complications associated with the surgery what are the alternatives which are available and let the patient choose the uh, the best now coming to the patient safety in the surgical environment the we know that the potentially preventable surgical errors have increased in the recent years but compared to the medical errors they are relatively infrequent and the jci in 1995 ranks wrong side surgery the most frequent for obstetricians the site marking is not relevant but in some cases in like uh, wrong procedures have been conducted with especially when the tubal ligation has been done without the consent now coming to certain definitions what is wrong side surgery wrong side surgery is used to refer to any surgical procedure performed on the wrong patient the wrong body part the wrong side of the body or at the wrong level of the correctly identified anatomic site wrong patient surgery we are all know this is surgery is per, uh, performed on a different patient than the one intended to receive the operation wrong side surgery indicates a surgical procedure which is performed on the wrong extremity or the side of the patient's body example the left ovary rather than the right ovary the wrong level surgery and the wrong part surgery are used to indicate surgical procedures that are performed at the correct operative site but at the wrong level or the part of the operative field of patient's anatomy now the jci has identified the following factors that contribute to increased risk of wrong side surgery if there are multiple surgeons involved in the case and multiple procedures during a single surgical visit suppose a patient is coming to us for a tlh and we uh, we find gallstones along with it or an uh, if she has some other we remove that uh, we go for a lap polycystectomy also along with so if a multiple procedures are there then the complications are more and safety uh, keeps and there is an error on the part of the safety unusual time pressures to start to complete the procedure unusual physical characteristics including the morbid obesity or the physical deformity now wrong side surgery was mainly due to the failed communication between the surgeon the members of the healthcare team and the patient so communication is a crucial part during any surgery so the a proper pre operative assessment during the procedures and we should be able to verify the operative site effective pre operative patient assessment includes seeing her medical record or imaging studies before the surgery and a checklist should be available in the operating room and rechecked by the entire surgical team before the surgery 
and there should be briefing for assigning essential roles among ourselves. Introduction of each person in the operating room by name and role, even if familiar, is recommended. Patient involvement is very important in identifying the correct surgical site both during the informed consent and marking. Timeout should be done with the participation of all members of the team. Timeout includes not only verification of the patient and the surgical site, but also we should see the relevant history, allergies, administration of antibiotics, and DVT prophylaxis. Now, let us see how we can improve the patient safety in the surgical environment. The JCI published the universal protocol for preventing the wrong site, wrong procedure, and wrong person surgery. They identified three principal components before surgery. One is a pre-procedure verification process. That is all relevant documents and information are available, correctly identified, labeled, matched and reviewed for the patient. Marking the operative site. Correct site marking. An X or no, never on the wrong site. And timeout before the procedure. WHO has developed the surgical safety checklist in 2008. A study in eight hospitals in eight cities around the world showed that with the checklist, surgery complications were reduced from 11 to 7 percent and deaths could be reduced from 1.5 to 0.8 percent. Now we all know and many of us perform the surgical safety checklist in our hospitals. We do a sign in or the briefing. This is the period before the induction of the anesthesia. The checklist coordinator confirms the patient's identity procedure and consent. He or she reviews with the anesthetist the patient's risk of blood loss, the airway difficulty and allergies. The surgeon's presence is highly recommended though it's not essential during this period of the checklist but if she or he is present he may be better able to anticipate blood loss and potential complications. Now comes the timeout. Timeout starts with the entire surgical team it occurs before the start of the operation. Each member of the team introduces him or herself by name and role. So if you have multiple surgeries with the same team members, you can skip it, but ideally it should be repeated. The correct patient and the procedure will be identified by reading the consent form aloud. Confirm pre-operative antibiotics and DVT prophylaxis. Finally, any team member can bring up any concerns before the start of the surgery. Here patient involvement is also there. So we ask the patient when the, during the sign-in uh, that her name is correct, her identity is correct and what surgery he, he she is for. Now coming to the sign-out or debriefing. It occurs as soon as the operation is over before any cleanup or patient transfer begins. We review the operation that was performed, the completion of the sponges and uh, instrument counts, labeling the surgical specimens, any equipment malfunction or other issues that need to be addressed and any concerns on the post-operative management. So we have all seen this. This is a surgical safety checklist by the WHO and many of the hospitals follow this. This is not intended to be comprehensive. We can do additions or modifications according to the local practice. Now some aspects on the patient involvement. We should be ideally educating the patient during the pre-operative evaluation process as I told earlier, the name of the surgery, the risks, the benefits, the alternatives, the complications, all should be explained to the patient before taking the consent. Patient has the greatest stake in avoiding errors. And the patient is integrally helped, involved in helping to avoid errors. Now coming to the privileges for new procedures. So if suppose a new procedure uh, or a new uh, equipment is there in the hospital. So this represents the sources of potential surgical error. So a proctoring or a supervision by an experienced colleague until the surgeon reaches competency is advisable. If innovative, then the reciprocal proctoring can be done at another hospital or the hospital can grant temporary privileges to someone from other hospital to supervise the applicant. Especially in our branch, the robotics, uh, in obstetrics and uh, in gynecology department needs this kind of supervision. All members trained on and practice with the new equipment should be aware of all safety features, warnings and alarms. And the biomedical engineering 
should inspect the equipment and verify that it is functioning properly. And it is, mind this, it is never appropriate for non-medical, non-credential individuals such as the industry representatives to perform the actual surgery. Now coming to other aspects which can lead to patient safety error. Stress and fatigue. The surgeon and the surgical team should be alert and well rested before the major surgical procedures. Emergency situations are the environment for errors, especially when the surgery, surgical team is stressed and fatigued. A recent study showed that complications in the nighttime procedures when the physicians had slept less than six hours were more. Of course, adequate backup personnel to relieve the fatigue may reduce the surgical errors. This, there comes the importance of One minute shared ago. practice, shared practice. Medication errors. Medication errors, here the verbal orders during the surgery, so vulnerable, uh, they are, are vulnerable to misinterpretation or misapplication. Increased stress or confusion during urgency may increase the possibility of error. So a proper protocol should be implemented for commonly used medications or treatments. As I stressed earlier, timely and effective communication between the surgeon and anesthesia teams, including readbacks as necessary, should be practiced during the entire procedure. Coming to the retained foreign objects, how can we how we can prevent this? Consistent application and adherence to standard counting procedures and documentation of the counts, instruments, or items and actions can be taken if count discrepancy can occur. We can write, keep a whiteboard and write the counts, the mops, uh, the instruments, everything, the count can be checked and the circulatory nurse can do that. Sponges, needles, and sharp instruments are counted before and after surgery and vaginal delivery. Only the radiopaque sponges and soft goods are placed on surgical trays or the delivery feeds. If we find that the counts at the end of the case are incorrect, then an abdominal or vaginal examination is performed. Still, if discrepancy is noted, radiographic imaging need to be obtained. Now comes the importance of teaching. We, many of the teaching hospitals have trainees which are, we, who supervise and assist in surgery. So, in, to prevent errors during that and to improve the patient's safety, the trainee and the supervisor should be alert, well-rested and well-prepared. And the trainees should be conversant in the pertinent terminology. So they should understand what, what we communicate to them. Observers in the operating room or delivery room may be a distraction. Virtual surgery training techniques can be practiced for skill enhancement. Now coming to the obstetric surgery. When two, two patients are involved simultaneously, the women and the fetus, the possibility of error, of course, happens if we don't adhere to the protocols and the standardized procedures. Particular attention to the administration of the different medications which are appropriate for the pregnant patient or the fetus should be done. And we should communicate with the pediatric team about the patient details to reduce the errors in the neonatal care. And of course, when there is an issue of massive transfusion in obstetrics, then again, it's an avenue for error because the call for blood products under stressful conditions uh, can happen. So we need a checklist and a protocol for massive transfusion. Now, in uh, Canada, the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Canada, they have implemented a surgical safety checklist in obstetrics also. So I'll, I'll show you an uh, image of that. So it can this can be implemented in all OPS and gynae surgical procedures. And there should be a team briefing with the obs, uh, obstetricians, anesthetists, physicians, nurses, midwives, and pediatricians. This kind of implementation of the surgical safety checklist in obstetrics help in cases of placenta previa and placenta accreta. And because there is a chance of, it's a critical condition and these uh, chances of error because of the heightened patient acuity and the time pressure. It can be modified and adapted for use in surgical obstetrics. So this is the birthing unit surgical safety checklist where before the induction of the anesthesia, the obstetrician, the nurse reviews, the anesthesiology reviews are there. Then time out before the surgical incision, the obstetrician leads, the nurse reviews, anesthesiologist and the obstetrician is a, a leader. Then the nurse confirms at the end of the surgery. 
sign out the nurse confirms the name of the procedure the instrument sponges and all this can be practiced so in case of urgent cesarean section do we, does anyone have concerns that is the question the leader or the surgeon asks now coming to the safety in freestanding units see freestanding surgical units may not be subject to the same level of scrutiny so proper training of the personnel the proper equipments and instruments have to be used to reduce the safety uh, to, to reduce the components which can cause which can compromise the patient's safety and here also patients have the right to expect the same level of safety so we should be having proper practices and protocols even in freestanding surgical units and accreditation of these office centers will improve the quality and the safety of care now we all use mobiles telephone calls distractions are very common in the or so beepers radios telephone calls should be kept to a minimum and we should be able to postpone non essential conversation until the surgery is finished and the people who are not wanted in the inside the operating room should be remaining outside now covid pandemic has taught us uh, many we are things running out of time. yeah last of our slide ma'am okay, yeah thank you covid pandemic has uh, taught all of us about the proper ad uh, adherence to the sops so uh, we have to amend we, we have amended also the, with new information as the pandemic evolved now coming to uh, after speaking all this we have to monitor the healthcare safety measurement so we should of course build uh, we should do a proper monitoring audit and a risk management activity to record the safety errors and do a proper auditing so that these things do not repeat so coming to the conclusion using the surgical safety checklist will reduce the errors in the operating room and improve the patient safety it is readily available inexpensive and easy to use and it very importantly it fosters the communication among the team members and as i said continuous monitoring and meeting among all stakeholders incident reporting and patient safety audit is essential thank you thank you dr bindu uh, you have uh, very um, Uh, elaborately you have told about the protocols that have to be followed in ot and uh, yes we have to keep in mind otherwise uh, we we'll end up with the medico legal persons and uh, very rightly all the things have been uh, said and we should uh, post uh, we should uh, paste them in our ot's in our uh, labor rooms so that we follow the same protocols thank you so much any thank questions you, maybe thank no ma'am questions so, so okay thank this, you everybody uh, thank you so much so with this we move to conclude our conference for today first of all i would like to take the opportunity to thank dr jyoti bindal ma'am for tirelessly giving her uh, time and resources throughout the preparation and execution uh, of this conference we would have not been able to accomplish this without her uh, guidance and patient men mentorship we also would like to thank apollo hospitals navi mumbai and ampogs to co hosting this event with us now i would like to take the opportunity to thank our esteemed chairpersons reputed speakers panelists and moderator of the patrish desai sir for uh, sharing their time and knowledge with us we also extend our heartfelt gratitude towards our all the participants for supporting us in this conference by attending it and uh, contributing towards this conference we hope you have gained a lot of uh, information from this and which will be helpful in your clinical practice thank you so much we are have recorded this session and we will be notifying you soon on monday uh, and we request you to kindly share your valuable feedback with us thank you so much if you want to stay tuned with medical learning hub with the upcoming cmes in oncology tuberculosis and many more we request you to please like our uh, and subscribe our channels of facebook telegrams instagrams and many thank you so much take care stay safe